Uh, I'm Charles Davidson, uh, the co-chair with Raymond Baker of this event. And um, I could step up on the stage, but we have a relatively small, small room here. Uh, and um, uh, this was put together by Raymond, myself, Jack Blum, and Tom Cardamone. And uh, we're, uh, this has been delayed because of COVID. I mean, this, this event could have happened earlier, uh, but it didn't. So here we are. Uh, welcome, everybody. We're going to start um, with a short video by Senator Whitehouse, who couldn't be here. There's some retreat. We would have had Senator Cardin, too. This wasn't uh, happening. So we're getting a lot of support, it would appear, for these ideas from uh, the Hill. So. Uh, I may have forgotten uh, one or two things, but we're going to roll uh, right now with uh, Senator Whitehouse. Hello, everyone. I'm Senator Whitehouse, and it is great to be here, at least electronically, uh, with all of you today. First, I want to congratulate Raymond Baker on the release of your book, Invisible Trillions. You shine much needed light on how the hidden wealth of kleptocrats, criminals, and the ultra-rich is stored in rule of law jurisdictions. You've done great work parsing the economic, political, and social dangers of such secrecy. I'd also like to thank Charles Davidson, Jack Bloom, Tom Cardamone, and Global Financial Integrity for partnering with Raymond to launch the DC Forum. Right now, America is engaged in a clash of civilizations. It's a growing clash between rule of law and democracy on one side versus kleptocracy and criminality on the other. In this clash, we allow our adversaries to exploit our own laws and financial system, and we allow our institutions and professions to aid and abet them. Wrongdoers can hide their loot and hide their identities behind rule of law while they're out there degrading rule of law elsewhere. We must prevent foreign adversaries from hiding their loot within America's borders. And around the world, we need to tighten up laws that allow host nations to prop up kleptocratic regimes like Vladimir Putin's. I am with you in this fight, banging steadily away. My asset seizure for Ukraine Reconstruction Act, co-led by Senators Graham Blumenthal and Bennett, was included in the FY23 omnibus. That amendment allows the United States to send proceeds from the sale of assets forfeited from people sanctioned for Russia's invasion of Ukraine to foreign assistance to the people of Ukraine. This passed as an omnibus amendment on the floor of the Senate by voice vote on a completely bipartisan basis. We will work with European allies to adopt similar legislation to help their justice ministries move quickly against ill-gotten assets and plug sanctions loopholes. Our legislation can help serve as a model. The Treasury Department recently issued a new rule based on my earlier bipartisan legislation requiring reporting of the true beneficial owner behind shell companies. Starting next year, when that rule goes into effect, law enforcement will have a new window into the webs of shell companies that facilitate corruption and hide the bad guy's loot. Treasury is also working on an important proposal to shine much needed light on the $60 trillion U.S. real estate market, and we are urging them on. On funding, last May I secured $67 million for the Department of Justice's new Klepto Capture Task Force and $22 million for FinCEN in the second Ukraine supplemental package. They now have added resources to meet these new challenges on top of a baseline increase Senator Grace Grassley and I led to boost FinCEN's annual budget by $29 million. Relatedly, Congress provided the IRS new funding to crack down on offshore tax cheats and large multinational corporations that play the line between legal avoidance and tax evasion. While we are making progress, there is much more work to be done. Here are my priorities. First, my Enablers Act, introduced with Senator Wicker, which would strengthen federal due diligence and transparency requirements so that American professionals, such as investment advisors, attorneys, and accountants, cannot secretly hide illicit money or facilitate financial crimes. 
We already require this level of diligence in other industries, like banking, so this measure would help level an existing playing field. We must work with nations across the globe to stamp out global tax avoidance and evasion and fulfill the promise of the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act to help partner nations combat tax haven abuse aided by the U.S. financial system. Tax cheating is at the heart of the global dark economy. We must also honor the historic Global Minimum Tax Agreement negotiated by Secretary Yellen. My No Tax Breaks for Outsourcing Act would bring us into compliance, and it would end the incentive for multinational corporations to hide money in tax havens and ship jobs overseas. Last month, I met with President Zelensky in Ukraine. The people of Ukraine have endured so much in Putin's brutal invasion, and they stand as brave reminders of the importance of victory in the clash of civilizations we face with international corruption and kleptocracy. So thank you for your partnership in this fight and keep up this important work. Thank you, Senator Whitehouse, and thank you all for um, coming and joining us uh, today. We've been looking forward to this gathering and I hope that it will be a, um, a, an impetus to address the kinds of issues that we're talking about. Let me begin by being quite clear what drives me. When I graduated from Harvard Business School in 1960, I had no idea, not in the furthest reaches, furthest reaches of my imagination, that capitalism might someday undermine democracy. The preceding 15 years, at least in the United States, had been um, perhaps the highest level of responsible capitalism ever achieved. Uh, veterans retrained, uh, investment uh, soared, relations between labor and management were generally good. Banks and corporations promoted balanced growth and consumption rose. Every indication was that these favorable trends uh, would continue. But then something happened. Over the last half century, something utterly fundamental has happened in the democratic capitalist system. The original pillars of democracy have not fundamentally changed since their formulation in the late uh, uh, 1700s. Popular vote, rule of law, um, representative legislatures, uh, protection to minority rights still guide our democratic aspirations. However, the original pillars of capitalism are now radically altered. These pillars also developed in the late 1700s were originally formulated around making profits, spreading wealth, and generating public goods. But in recent decades, capitalism has taken on the ulterior motive of masking income, disguising income in the trillions of dollars annually, and wealth in the tens of trillions of dollars cumulatively. Secrecy has become as important as profitability. Generating, moving, and sheltering money in ways that are beyond the oversight of the organs of democracy, that is, beyond the oversight of regulators and legislators, is a recent phenomenon in capitalist operations. In pursuit of this new motivation within capitalism, we have created a financial secrecy system that now facilitates perhaps half of global economic operations. What are the components of this system? Uh, there are uh, several. First of all, tax havens and secrecy jurisdictions. Um, these are places where lawyers and bankers and accountants can handle your affairs without identifying you. No one outside this circle can see what is going on. Second uh, component is disguised corporations. In these, no record is kept of who owns um, uh, these uh, shell companies, and they are in the tens of millions around the world, more of them having been created in the United States than in any other country. A 
third component is anonymous trust accounts. Uh, these let you conduct business without anyone knowing uh, with whom they are doing business. A fourth component is fake foundations. You can donate money to your charitable foundation. You can designate yourself as the beneficiary of the charity of your foundation, and you can avoid paying taxes and avoid accountability every step of the way. A fifth component is a broad range of money laundering techniques, as John Kassar has written about for years, um, that handle particular types of uh, financial transactions. Sitting in the middle of this financial secrecy system is the practice of falsified trade. This is trade conducted where invoice prices and real values differ. I have never known a multinational, multi-billion dollar, multi-product corporation that did not use falsified trade in some part of its business around the world. And finally, as part of this system, governments intentionally leave holes uh, in their laws to enable money to move through this financial secrecy system and into our economies. The United States of America is the biggest user of the financial secrecy system. And the best data that we have indicates that more money, uh, more dirty money flowing around the world ends up finally in our economy as compared to any other. Now, many people think uh, in, the, in the richer countries that we are the innocent victims of the, the, the terrible practices of these kleptocrats and drug dealers and human traffickers and counterfeiters and money launderers and terrorist financiers. That is not correct. Every single element of the modern financial secrecy system has been created by us in the richer Western countries. Not a single element of this system was thought up by the people that we like to blame. The reality of this system um, and its operations um, means that we face extreme difficulty fighting kleptocracy and crime and corruption and terrorism and more. The, 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 the reality is that this system and the harms it causes is not something that has been done to us. It is something that has been done by us. We Bluntly speaking, we cannot succeed in the fight against these ills while we at the same time move and shelter the money generated by the bad guys. Even with all these ills, the greatest impact of the financial secrecy system is on inequality, on economic inequality. Without question, this is a huge problem uh, in the 21st century going forward. When I got my MBA in 1960, the ratio of executive pay to workers' wages was 20 to 1. Today, this ratio is more than 350 to 1. Today, we live in a world where the richest 1% have wealth accumulation equal to the remaining 99%. Much of this soaring inequality, not all of it, but much of it, um, is enabled by the financial secrecy system. This system is designed to help rich uh, make, move, and shelter uh, their money through mechanisms that are just simply not available to or visible to the middle class and the poor. Let's take that 20 to 1 ratio that existed in 1960. Had that ratio been maintained through to today, the middle class in America would be better off by $50 trillion. That's trillion with a T. Research shows that tens of millions of Americans um, are, are, believe that they will not be as well off uh, as their parents, not uh, able to enjoy the standard of living up to the level of their parents. This is disheartening for tens of millions of Americans and people in other countries as well. 
In other words, the angst that exists uh, in the middle class in America and elsewhere has factual roots, has realities that contribute in a major way to political discontent. Which brings me to the central point of the DC Forum. That's D for democracy and C for capitalism. Democratic capitalism is at risk. Severe imbalance now characterizes the way that democracy and capitalism are functioning. For decades, even centuries, uh, we've taken it more or less for granted that these two pillars should generally work um, in support of each other. These two systems should be working in sync to spread liberty and prosperity. Democracy is expected to offer equal political rights to its citizens. Capitalism is expected to offer fair economic uh, opportunities uh, to its participants. Instead, these two guiding tenets are becoming decoupled, no longer operating in sync. The capitalist side of the equation is running out of control, eroding the social contract, empowering kleptocracy, facilitating crime, fostering corruption, evading obligations, and maximizing income and wealth inequalities. And in these realities, thus jeopardizing democracy. The onus for these outcomes needs to be placed on underperforming capitalism rather than upon a collection of other societal problems. Rebalancing capitalism and democracy is one of the most difficult challenges ahead. As currently practiced, our two systems are not uh, working well together and will not get us satisfactorily through the 21st century. The DC Forum seeks to drive an understanding of this risk into the political consciousness, into the Overton window, if you will. Um, many of us in this room have been uh, fighting particular aspects of these problems for years. Many of us here and many of us in other organizations. And many of us feel that we are not making the progress um, uh, that is needed, not getting the traction that is appropriate uh, to the issue. The DC Forum seeks to elevate our particularistic approaches, our particular concerns to a higher level, to an understanding that instead of dealing with a collection of individual problems, we're dealing with a systemic issue, an issue that literally cuts to the heart of the democratic capitalist system. The rationale for the DC Forum draws upon the experience of trying to get the climate change issue into the global consciousness. Scientists and scholars knew in the 1970s and 80s and 90s that global warming was a reality, but they were not successful in getting it into people's thinking. It took Al Gore with his presentations and films and uh, speeches to focus repeated attention uh, on these issues. And he, with the support of others, succeeded. Cap uh, climate change is now widely accepted as a looming threat to prosperity and even peace. We hope that the DC Forum can contribute in a similar way to securing into people's consciousness an understanding that our cherished democratic capitalist system is at risk. Let me again be clear in closing. I believe that democratic capitalism is the, is the best invention within political economy um, that we have yet devised. But I believe that it is being damaged, terribly damaged, if not destroyed, by ill motivations and ill dealings in one of its components, capitalism, far more so than within its companion component, democracy. Change must come if the, if the hinge of political economy is to pivot toward strengthening both equality and justice. We're dealing with a systemic threat um, uh, to the continuation of our system. 
Um, I hope that you will join us in the DC Forum, join us in this key issue, in this very key opportunity to bring about change. Thank you. My name is Jared Rao, and I'm the director of the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. Over the past 10 years, we've done some of the biggest journalism collaborations in history, the Panama Papers, the Paradise Papers, and the Pandora Papers. And these projects are really aimed at bringing out a secrecy in the offshore world, because we think that the issue of secrecy is one of the biggest issues that the world is facing today. Um, Raymond Baker, of course, has been a pioneer in this, in this work for before we even started doing it for many years. And he was one of the first people that I went to when I started investigating this. Um, I'm a real supporter of um, Raymond's new book, Invisible Trillions. Um, it does go to the heart of one of the biggest issues here, which is that this is attacking democracy. And I think democracy is under threat because of it. Um, I'm also a big supporter of this conference. I'm sorry I can't be there in person, but I hope it goes well. Good morning, everyone. Great to see you all. Welcome to the folks uh, watching at home. Uh, I'm going to start my presentation off with a very brief quiz. And if you listened intently to Raymond's remarks, you'll probably get the answer without too much difficulty. Uh, and that is, what is uh, the common denominator of uh, corrupt government officials, uh, tax evaders, and transnational criminal organizations? Well, they all launder their money the same exact way. Uh, they all use the same spaces that are littered throughout the global economy. Uh, anonymous shell companies, real estate, private investment vehicles, free trade zones, and on and on and on. Uh, Raymond gave a very good list of what those are, are like. Uh, of course, we are sitting in the epicenter of global money laundering. Uh, according to Janet Yellen, this is the best country in the world to launder money. Uh, certainly a dubious distinction, to be sure. But we do have a long history with this sort of thing. We were one of the first countries to offer a tax dodge with a bill in 1921 that allowed uh, uh, shielded foreign-held uh, wealth from taxes here in the U.S. And we continue to do so today, whether it's secret trusts in South Dakota, uh, non-charitable foundations in New Hampshire, and of course, high-value real estate from coast to coast. But we're not the only ones who do this, of course. Switzerland, Cayman Islands come immediately to mind. But the globe offers a cornucopia of auctions to any fraudster, cocaine cartel, corrupt government, government official, uh, human trafficker, shady businessman who want to move, hide, and launder their money. Uh, there are no fewer than 141 jurisdictions that offer some sort of vehicle that enables the laundering of money and the evasion of taxes. Indeed, for the discerning criminal, uh, they have a wide variety of time zones, languages, cuisines, and vacation spots they can pick from uh, if they choose to do so. If they fancy warm water and palm trees, uh, BVI is probably the place for golf, beaches, and anonymous shell companies. If they prefer uh, Singapore, uh, excellent food and nightlife, and an almost opaque uh, financial system. Uh, the options are almost endless. And what I want to do now is just take a brief minute or two to introduce you to a new component of our website, which is a map of secrecy jurisdictions where you can search on all 141 uh, jurisdictions that offer this type of service for their clients. Uh, you can zoom in, um, uh, and I'm just gonna pick a couple just to give you an example of what we're looking at. Um, uh, well, that one didn't work. <laughs> I might have lost my uh, internet connection. Let's try that again. There we go. So each, uh, each one of these uh, 141 countries has about a 100-word blurb or so. Gives you a little bit of history behind uh, some of the activity that took place 
in each jurisdiction, uh, clickable links so you can uh, find out more about some of the specifics uh, and have some idea on what's actually happening in these jurisdictions. A lot of them have been highlighted by ICIJ's excellent work um, uh, and it gives you an idea of what they offer to their clients. We also have a drop down menu uh, that can be used uh, for any particular country. Let's just pick one at random here. Uh, Dominican Republic, let's say. Uh, you can go to any one of these and click on a link. Let's see if we get that, there we go. So uh, one of the things the Dominican Republic advertises is their free trade zones and they're very proud of the secrecy that they offer through those. So I encourage you to go to our website, it's gfintegrity.org, take a look, works on your mobile phone as well. Um, uh, and this is, the last thing I wanna say is this is a very sort of dynamic thing. We're gonna be updating, updating it regularly. You see something you think should be added in there, definitely send us a note, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, and now I'm gonna turn it over to Jim Henry. Thanks very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, delighted to be here, and I'm uh, amazed at the uh, uh, the, uh, the the uh, uh, group of extraordinary people who are in the audience. Start starting with Raymond, with Jack Blum. Uh, many of you are longtime contributors to this area uh, that I've known for literally two decades. Um, I'm reminded of. Uh, Johnny Carson interviewing uh, Howard Hilton on his uh, television show and asking him, well, you know, Howard, is there something that you, you know, very successful, uh, distinguished uh, businessman, worldwide experience, would like to say to the American people? And he thought, and he paused for a minute, and he said, he turned to the, audi to the uh, audience, and he said, yes, there is one thing I would like to say to the American people put the shower curtain in the bathtub. Um, I have uh, thought long and hard about how to talk about uh, the history of the work that I've done in this area. Um, and uh, when I first started out, uh, I would say, uh, studying the underground economy in the 1970s as a graduate student at Harvard, um, you know, there were only a handful of economists and activists who were uh, any, come anywhere close to analyzing this. Uh, developmental economics was still the rage. Uh, there was a general assumption that capital would be flowing from first world countries to developing countries. Uh, we had concepts like illicit financial flows, the demand for big bills, uh, the underground economy itself, uh, global capital flight, uh, the stock of offshore wealth, these were all to be developed. And it was only by a kind of handful of in misfits, really, who were kind of uh, in various positions in the world to, to notice this going on, um, that we started out to, to launch this measurement exercise, which has turned into a, you know, a, a really uh, fascinating kind of approach. Raymond's book uh, has a whole lot of numbers in it. I won't uh, try to do battle with that but uh, we have different approaches. I've emphasized more the fact that when all of these flows leave uh, uh, where they're coming from, from the source countries, and go elsewhere, capital flight and illicit flows that are through the trade system, uh, they actually have to go somewhere. Someone has to be involved in managing them. A lot of them get invested offshore and don't come back. They accumulate earnings offshore. And so you have to take into account the stock of value. And you have to understand who's doing it, because it's not just a passive activity. It's an activity that's mediated and is profited from by some of the largest financial institutions in the world, some of the most prominent law firms, accounting firms, corporate registries. Uh, and it's not just third world uh, tropical islands. Uh, as Raymond pointed out a lot of the industry is based here. We have some of the, have had some of the most important financial secrecy uh, laws in the world. We've seen tremendous inflows of capital from countries like China and Russia into the United States. And so uh, 
you know, point number one is I think this is a man-made problem and it can be unmade. And all we have to have is the political will to do that. And that's the important lesson of all of this work beyond all of the particular estimates. Um, it's large, it's growing. My numbers now are about 60 trillion worldwide, 10 to 15 percent of worldwide wealth. Uh, McKinsey's latest estimate for net worth uh, for households, 90, 95 percent of, of, of uh, world wealth is owned ultimately by households, uh, is, uh, is about 510 trillion, so it's about 10 to 15 percent of that total. Um, and uh, you know, the, this has uh, been growing at an explosive rate. Um, that doesn't include the trade flow, uh, trade discrepancies that Raymond has, has pointed to and is, is really the authority on. Um, I've seen a lot of the trade uh, abuses that he's described. In South Africa, we found uh, one of the largest investments, uh, investors in South Africa was a Kazakhstani company uh, that basically acquired possession of the entire chromite industry. It's the largest chromite industry in the world. It's essential to producing stainless steel. Parking all of its profits uh, in Malta. The miners union was upset. We sued, we got, did the analysis, and there's a big uh, contest going on in South African courts right now uh, to take that company uh, to task. Zambia. If you look at Zambia's copper exports, uh, they, uh, they report no copper exports uh, to Switzerland. One of the biggest investors in, in, in Zambia uh, the last 20 years was Glencore, a Swiss trading company. Switzerland reported no, no uh, copper imports. Uh, where were they? Well, they were parked in the BVI. Uh, no copper ever physically ran, ran to, to uh, the BVI, but uh, it all ended up being booked there as a book entry. <coughs> so um, I have, uh, being an ex-McKinsey uh, consultant, I've naturally come up with a, a lot of slides, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this as much as I have time for it. But um, the uh, topic is the global haven industry. We did notice outside Washington today a, a spy balloon. Um, uh, we're kind of concerned, but it looks like it's from Germany. Um, so it may be secure. We also noticed some spies. And this one in particular uh, came up last week. It's a concern to me because in 2018, I'd done some work on uh, President Trump's financing. And now who financed Donald Trump? First of all, why was there uh, Vladimir Putin to begin with? What happened to Russia in the 90s? That's a whole subject. Uh, but secondly, who was actually lending to this guy at a time when he had six bankruptcies in the 1990s and no bank, U.S. bank would lend to him? Uh, well, it turned out that you know there were several answers to that question, but uh, a lot of them had to do with Russian and uh, former Soviet Union oligarchs and a particular bank called Deutsche Bank. This fellow in the middle was the guy I talked to about my information. I had identified Rudy, Rudy Giuliani and a guy named Felix Sater uh, laundering money into Kazakhstan, in, from Kazakhstan into the Netherlands, setting up an elaborate network of shell companies. And I, I innocently gave this information to the New York FBI office. And I was surprised nothing happened. Uh, now we know. So the global haven industry um, needs a framework, I think. We need to think carefully what, about what we mean by offshore if we're going to measure it. And then we can get into the various components and try to, to estimate those. Panama Papers, is uh, uh, ICIJ has done outstanding work, um, you know, led us to believe that uh, it was kind of an archipelago of individual jurisdictions. Secrecy jurisdictions have individual properties, almost as if they're isolated from each other. Uh, but you know, there was, we saw when the network uh, of jurisdictions we found in that one law firm in Panama, and there are hundreds of law firms in Panama, 
uh, about 215,000 companies, much which were located in the BVI. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. We've had a lot of leaks, and this kind of leak journalism, I think, is one uh, very, uh, uh, well, it has pluses and minuses. I mean, I guess I enjoy it when journalists actually go out to the front lines and investigate things and find out the facts themselves, and they're not reliant on whistleblowers or leaks or a lot of data dumps. The data dumps are helpful, uh, but they encourage us to believe that havens are these individual entities, many of which are remote. And here's an example. The EU's list, blacklists of havens it refers to places like Palau uh, and uh, the uh, Vanuatu. Uh, they leave off the list the largest havens in the world. Switzerland, the United States, the UK spider net, um, and that's simply for political reasons. That's where the money is ending up. Nobody wants to invest in Palau. Those are conduits to the, uh, to the major locations. So this is not a new problem. These are not just tax havens. It's not just an archipelago of distant, the kind of unrelated, disconnected secrecy jurisdictions. It certainly isn't, uh, you know, a term that some lawyers will use as well, it's all legal. Uh, Dennis Healy, the British chancellor, once said the difference between legal and illegal in the tax area is the width of the prison wall. You have KPMG saying that any audit practice that they pass, uh, that they believe will pass with 25% probability uh, is legal for them to advise on. So it's kind of a probability distribution. And it's certainly not of modest size. Here's what I saw when I went to Iceland in 2016 in the wake of the Panama Papers. I was invited to participate in this uh, study group that looked at offshore assets. Uh, and it was literally unauditable, this cross-holdings network. It was a network, not an individual haven. And they were everywhere. And the volumes for the 330,000 people who live in Iceland were extraordinary. Uh, here's what we found when we looked at, Chir uh, at Chiquita, banana, you know, setting up this elaborate network of interrelated companies, all of which are uh, subsidiaries, uh, to basically pay no taxes on their exports of bananas. The bananas starting in Ecuador, uh, 20 cents a pound, and the Cayman Islands network charges 12 cents a pound for the purchasing network. The Luxembourg subsidiary charges 12 cents a pound. The uh, Ireland subsidiary charges 6 cents for the use of the brand. The Isle of Man subsidiary, 6 cents for the insurance. Uh, the Isle of Jersey charges 6p for management services. Bermuda charges 26 cents a pound for the use of distribution. That finally ends up in the UK, and the only taxes they paid are in Ecuador. Uh, on the export tax. So, you know, this is uh, another example of the network nature of this uh, 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 problem that we're facing here. The third idea, as Raymond has emphasized, is just that there is uh, no bright line between offshore and onshore anymore. There's anonymous assets in the United States, and so what we really need to be measuring is anonymous wealth. Uh, we have no idea who the owners are, uh, who the beneficiaries are. Um, and this domain, I wanted to mention four heroes of mine, just in passing, who have helped me understand this industry. One is Robert Levinson, who is a, became an authority not only on Panama and Latin America uh, and Russia, uh, but also disappeared in Iran in 2007. To this day, I have no good story for why Robert Levinson was not brought back by his government. He was a great friend of mine, and we worked together on many investigations. Uh, David Dirk, uh, Lieutenant David Dirk, Serpico's partner in New York City Police Department, uh, and uh, Sam Jaffe, who was, uh, Richard Jaffe, who was the guy who did the Castle Bank and Trust case uh, back in the, late, uh, in the late 60s, early 70s. Uh, one of the first offshore banks of any significance for the United States was the Castle Bank and Trust. 
and it got shut down. Um, in that case, we found a list of 300 depositors. Norman Casper uh, provided me with that list. Uh, it included uh, all kinds of, of, of folks, but uh, the Pritzker family, uh, the uh, you know, Gucciani <laughs> penthouse, um, quite a cast of characters. Uh, they were never prosecuted for tax dodging. These were arguably quite illegal trusts. Um, and to show you the long uh, line of historical research, the kind of the, the long tail that it has, just this last October, I finally got the treasurer of the Castle Bank and Trust, which was based in Nassau, uh, which we now know has uh, been a haven to FTX and uh, has been a haven ever since. The, well, Jack will tell you about the history of Nassau going back to the Civil War. Um, but this fellow had two offshore accounts uh, at the Castle Bank and Trust. Uh, and so we're looking into now on the anniversary of Watergate uh, what Richard Nixon did with those accounts and uh, what his brothers did with those accounts. But that's an incredibly disturbing phenomenon because here's a second U.S. president we found deeply involved in the offshore industry. Um, uh, the other big theme that we discovered was when looking at this industry was that the, uh, the banks were deeply involved. This is a case involving Morgan Stanley in South Africa. You may have heard of Morgan Stanley. They're the, one of its largest investment banks. Well, they respect the laws in the United States, but when they go to South Africa, they help the wealthiest investor in South Africa evade taxes. And this is a scheme involving 13 uh, offshore companies, uh, four in Namibia, one in the Cayman Islands, one in Delaware, two in Mauritius, et cetera, et cetera. So complicated that South African revenue authorities could not audit it. Uh, and to this day, it's gone unprosecuted, involving, you know, a billion dollars of tax dodging. That's outrageous. Here's the case of HSBC. Well, I'm not connected to the internet. Let's go back. I'll just uh, uh, tell you about the data. HSBC in South Africa, deeply involved in laundering money for the Guptas and uh, uh, President Zuma. Uh, so. You know, this is a disturbing pattern, I think, that, that we turn up here and we repeat it time and again. I've been investigating kleptocrats in more than 50 countries, auditing their debt. Uh, in every case, we found banking involved, irresponsible banking. This is a case of Ferdinand Marcos parking uh, $7 trillion that he stole from the Philippine Central Bank uh, in, in Switzerland. Um, this is a case involving Angola, where KPMG and a bunch of Swiss uh, financial advisors uh, helped the son of the former president of Angola uh, manage his $5 billion sovereign wealth fund. This is the case involving e Equatorial Guinea. Patterns go on and on uh, involving offshore institutions. In the case of Russia, we saw 150 uh, uh, state-owned companies being sold to the private sector and some banking institutions for a grand total of $9.7 billion uh, in 1995-96, uh, with, I might add, this, the uh, support of some U.S. government institutions. Um, the Lord helps those who help themselves. Let me get to the estimates. Um, well, first of all, the pattern, in other words, is one of impunity for banks. So if you want to explain why we have the system that we do, you have to take into account the fact that this is one of the most powerful lobbies in the world and that these institutions are not losing their licenses when they commit crimes. Uh, the top 22 global banks committed more than 650 felony scale offenses across 14 different categories from 1998 to 2015. Um, they received a total of about $300 billion of fines, ultimately, but all of those fines came at the end of the process. And so the profits were realized up front on a net present value basis. This was a profitable activity. 
for these financial institutions. Nobody went to jail in the 2000s, except a few low, lower level traders. Um, no one lost their licenses. Right now at the Department of Labor, we're dealing with Credit Suisse's uh, ability to uh, advise U.S. pension funds and to have a status as a qualified pension fund manager. Um, the Department of Labor has the power uh, to say that someone who's been convicted serially of a U.S. felony, a uh, corporation has, that's engaged in that, uh, uh, can be kicked out of the QFAN system. Uh, make a long story short, uh, in 2014, they, uh, they were convicted. Uh, $2.6 billion fine, didn't lose their license, nobody went to jail, and the DOL gave them a waiver for their QPAM status. The waiver again in 2019. Just this year, they finally decided, because of Credit Suisse getting convicted again uh, with respect to loans to Mozambique, that they would be uh, uh, pushed out of the program. But there are dozens of other banks that have been, been engaged in similar activities around the world that are not uh, losing their status. So this is the global haven industry. It has many parts, and it's like the Star Wars bar scene. You have all of these various actors, uh, the crooks, the uh, kleptocrats, the tax dodgers, uh, the money launders, uh, you know, the people who are stealing trade rights are using these places uh, and the common facilities that they share, the financial secrecy, the weak regulation, uh, the low taxation, but also the enablers, the sophisticated enablers uh, to to continue this. Now, the estimates that we've got, um, I mean, I'll, I'm just going to jump to the chase here. Uh, the, I started estimating stuff back in 76 with an article on why we have so many $100 bills in the U.S. economy. Nobody could explain why there were four outstanding per capita. Um, well, you know, the answer was most of it was offshore. And today it's about 2.5 uh, a trillion dollars of big bills that are floating around. In addition, we have another, you know, depending on the day of the week, uh, 500 million to a, a trillion dollars of crypto. Uh, all of that is potentially regulated by uh, central banks, especially our central bank, uh, but it has chosen not to do so. I proposed a currency recall back then. Um, and uh, Larry Summers, my friend from Harvard, was uh, uh, finally agreed with that after he was Treasury Secretary in 2014. It was a little late, but he came up, you know, he came to the, to the party at that point uh, adopting this idea. Um, the estimates that we've had for offshore wealth have gotten a lot of attention. We first identified the U.S. as a tax haven in 1989. Uh, and uh, the price of offshore revisited for TJN was 2012. Uh, missing 20 trillion as of 2010 has since, you know, using our, our estimates, uh, estimate me methods, uh, has now increased to more than 50 trillion dollars, 50 to 65 trillion. Um, again, the traditional capital flight estimation process looked at flows. The trade flows analysis does something similar. Uh, I'm suggesting that we need to get at stocks, and there are three different methods to do so. Um, I don't know how much you want to know about penguins, but I will, uh, I'll be happy to, tell, to answer any detailed questions about this. But just to give you a very broad overview, first of all, one source of the data are the private banks themselves. They actually publish assets under management every year, m much of which, most, almost all of which are owned by offshore wealthy individuals. And so, you know, we find uh, them fessing up uh, to a grand total of, uh, you know, at least uh, $12 trillion, top 50, as of 2010. Secondly, you can look at cross-border deposits that are uh, tracked by the Bank for International Settlements. Uh, and you can assume that those are a fraction, a reasonable fraction, based on surveys that we've done of uh, private investor portfolios, and you can scale up those actual numbers to get an estimate of private cross-border financial wealth, and that's the second basic methodology. Um, 
By the way, the numbers that we, real, that we use for that, uh, the OECD in 2020 decided, you know, you, TJN, you were actually kind of right. You know, there was, they were underestimated because they only included 40 countries. They didn't include uh, domestic deposits between asset managers. Uh, the final method was to capitalize capital flight. And there's elaborate models country by country that do that. Uh, when you do that, you find that the offshore retained earnings that are not brought back are a huge fraction of the total uh, investment. So it's very important to look at the earnings on the offshore flows. But you, can, you can disaggregate using this method for the developing world and for key countries like China and Russia. Uh, you can get uh, quite interesting results. There are all kinds of measurement problems. You have to figure out how much is being repatriated to like Hong Kong back into China, but we can do that. We can actually go to the field and interview people on f and find out what's going on. So when we add all that up, we get an interesting list of key players, source countries in the developing world uh, that are contributing to this global uh, sourcing of capital. And uh, it, it shows that you know, countries like non-democratic non countries are basically parasitic on our financial institutions because they can come here and they can use the courts. Jack will tell you all about that. Um, but that's an irony here. That the biggest investors are usually people from countries that are not democracies. Um, globally, when you add it up, global flight wealth, I call it, is greater than developing country debt. Uh, I mean, it's a huge hidden cost of this industry that uh, when you add up the offshore wealth by, from developing world uh, and debit out the official reserves and the, uh, you know, the gross external debt that they have, they are actually net creditors of the first world uh, to the tune, this is as of 2014, to the tune of $13 trillion, a substantial number. They're also a big source of our billionaires and our inequality problems. Uh, the U.S. now accounts for just 28% of billionaires. And uh, China and Russia are, are uh, closing in. So when we add up the totals um, as a share of the wealth, we're finding, as of 2020, on the order of $60 trillion as a plausible number. Our original estimates left out real estate, which was not important as of 2000, uh, 2010. It's become very important. In fact, much of the increase in wealth in the last uh, decade, dramatic increase in global wealth, has been in reevaluation due to Federal Reserve interest rate policy. So if you really wanted to have an impact on inequality, you would talk to the Fed. That would be another important component of this, because that's really dri driven up a lot of the investments that are going on uh, in real estate. Um, the, uh, the, the total, then, is, I think, reasonable, but we need to do the kind of analysis I did and spent, you know, years on uh, for the earlier estimates again. How does that affect inequality? Well, you know, it's not ordinary people who have these, uh, these enablers, and all of this offshore wealth is owned by a tiny fraction of the world economy, 0.001% in this 2010 estimate. Uh, less than 100,000 people accounted for a third of the offshore wealth. I think this is another kind of analysis that we can really refine and get much, uh, go much farther with. But my summary today is, uh, you know, the, we have all of these sectors of the, of the uh, uh, offshore uh, industry. Uh, it's not just about uh, private banking and offshore wealth. It's also about uh, kleptocracy, uh, tax dodging, human capital flight, which is another grotesque uh, phenomenon. Um, and uh, I think ultimately it is, as Raymond has said, uh, about who's going to run the show and whether we have a democracy to look forward to in the future. My biggest concern is that all of these wealth estimates are basically numerical. The real wealth that we have to worry about uh, are the expectations of young people, uh, of, the, of the, the next generation, of what kind of world they're living in. 
And I think if we poll them today, a lot of them have fairly grim outlooks uh, on the future, especially uh, uh, the, next, uh, the next decade. I think that's an important source of our wealth estimates, is to understand how people feel about their futures as opposed to just running the numbers. So thank you very much. Jim has a certain amount of credibility, it would seem. Always very impressive. So now we're going to hear from Jack. I hope you appreciate the continuity management because Jim has dropped what Jack should talk about at least. Uh, we'll see what he does talk about. And we're ahead of schedule, which is extraordinary. Maybe we'll, we'll keep it that way. Who knows? First, I promise not to go back to the history of the Bahamas and the Civil War. <laughs> Although I personally investigated it at the time, I don't think you're ready for that discussion this morning. <laughs> now, this, this stuff has been going on for a long time, and we've had one investigation after another. I want to say we've made enormous progress. For 150 years, bankers had no responsibility whatsoever under the law for what their clients did. Uh, if you were a banker, you were a public utility. So if somebody came in with a bag of cash that was stolen, you know, from wherever, you took it, put it in your coffers, and went on about your business. And it wasn't until the Patriot Act that we got to the point of saying, you bankers are responsible for what your customers are doing. And you better know who they are, and you better have some idea what they're doing with their money. We've had tremendous success in forcing information out of the bankers, uh, and a little less success in enforcing the law that that information would enable enforcement of, but it's a huge turn in banking law. We've also had disclosure of beneficial ownership, which is an enormous step forward. It, it'll come into effect. There are new regulations. We'll see how that works. And uh, I think that it's a great tribute to those of you who've worked on it. The Enablers Act was about to become law and the American Bar Association, which by the way fights all these reforms tooth and nail, the American Bar Association put out in a newsletter a couple of weeks ago that one of its major legislative achievements of the past session of Congress was blocking the Enablers Act which I think is a tribute to the people who were working to put it forward because many of us thought it really wouldn't have had much of a chance. Uh, it tells you that we are going in the right direction on some of this, but we're left with a real set of problems. And this is where I think I'd like to make you all focus in and figure out what do we do from here. When I say we have a major set of problems, you just look at the trail of disclosures that have gone on over the last now 30 years about money laundering, offshore, bad behavior, and you've heard the litany, and I want to say that Raymond's book has as devastating a list of all of the things that have been disclosed, as you'll find, uh, and the question then that you all have to ask is, why isn't disclosure by itself working? Uh, we have the idea, and certainly journalists do, that if people know the truth, it'll result in some action that in turn will solve the problem. And what we're confronting is a situation where we've had disclosure to the point of uh, almost exhaustion. Uh, you can hear these horror stories one at a time and you say to yourself, my God, were there that many? Well, uh, it isn't working and something is really wrong because a disclosure isn't bringing about change. 
And what I want to explore this morning is why that's going on and what possibly can be done, if anything, uh, to change it. I'm going to start with uh, what I call my short course in criminology. The short course in criminology is this. The criminal justice system works best if you're dealing with a world where everybody knows everybody else and everybody understands the subject matter of the crime. And really, this is a, a system, at least for us, that grows out of the common law. And we're talking about 17th century England. Uh, somebody stole my cow. Everybody in the village knows what a cow is. The cow was on the commons. A guy is arrested for having stolen the cow. Now there are 12 jurors who come along and uh, the evidence is presented and everybody can say unanimously he did it, send him to jail, do whatever. In those days he probably would have been hung, but whatever. The system works. That is especially true for crimes which are uh, crimes of violence. So every time that somebody uh, murders somebody else, there's a corpse with a knife sticking in it. There's a corpse with a gun. Somebody's got his head bashed in. We've all seen the police procedurals on TV. So it, it's clear the cops have to do something. There has to be an arrest. You have to clear the cases. If you then take things down a scale and start going into other kinds of crimes, you get crimes of fraud, you get crimes of uh, financial, the financial variety, and they're harder to prove, take a hell of a lot more work, and uh, you suddenly don't have a group of villagers who all understand what the underlying set of facts are that led to the crime. But still there's a, a will and a willingness, especially if the police have a victim, and if that victim is in the jurisdiction, and if the evidence is available, there'll be a prosecution, and there's a reasonable chance that somebody will go to jail. The problem with the system uh, that has evolved in the financial world that we've been talking about is that these are crimes of adhesion. All of the people involved in committing the crime, at least at the working level, are happy with the results. The guy who's hiding the money, the people who are managing the money, everybody thinks it's terrific stuff. The crime the victim in this crime is society. The victim in the crime is democracy. Uh, how do you sell that to a jury to send a specific person to jail beyond a reasonable doubt? And the answer is it's difficult. And if you take that up a notch and say, well, the evidence is scattered all over the world, the laws are who knows what in terms of getting evidence from those places. The ability to make a witness come and testify from some other jurisdiction is well nigh impossible. And uh, the upshot of that is that these crimes rarely get prosecuted. And if they are prosecuted, they're prosecuted uh, in a very narrow way so the case can be won by the prosecutors, but not in a way large enough to create the deterrent effect. And this is, this is where we have to do a little more understanding of criminology, because the ability to control crime is based on deterrence. That is to say, how can we scare enough people with the prospect of going to jail, so they stay honest. A uh, professor of mine, uh, Leon Radzinowicz, who ran the Cambridge Institute of Criminology, uh, 
who was, I think, one of the most brilliant of the criminologists of certainly the 20th century, uh, said as an example of the inability to control crime without policing, conviction, sentencing, was the case of Denmark after the Nazi invasion. The Danes arrested the entire Danish, uh, uh, the Nazis arrested the entire Danish police force. And they did it because they thought the Danish police would be disloyal to the Nazis. What happened was in quiet, peaceful uh, Scandinavian Denmark was an immediate crime wave. And that's because there was no fear of prosecution. Uh, and now let's just talk a little bit about fear of prosecution. About, I would say, 50% of the body politic behaves, obeys the law. Uh, I like to refer to an old FBI agent friend of mine who grew up in the Bronx and uh, he said he personally thought God would whack his hand if he ever stole an apple. Half the population is like that. Now there's another 40% of the population, and that chunk of the population includes a large number of my law school classmates, a large <laughs> number of bankers who take the attitude, well, I'll do it if I can get away with it. If I can get away with it, it's fine, but if I really run the risk of going off to the pokey, well, maybe not. And uh, here is where deterrence comes in, because they need to be reminded repeatedly that there's a real threat. They'll spend some time in what we refer to as the gray bar building. Uh, the, the problem here is the system then depends on the bottom 5 to 10% of the population, the sociopaths who the cops can focus in on, drag off to jail, and uses the examples to scare the 40%. But that system simply does not work when you get to international financial crime and the kinds of models that uh, we're looking at for attempts at prosecution. So now let me sort of take this another step, another step further. Some years ago, I was in Bavaria, and I had a meeting with the uh, Staatsrechtsanwalt, as they call him, the state prosecutor of Bavaria. And in the run-up to the meeting, two investigators for the state prosecutor were telling me about this wonderful global investigation they did of a ring that was stealing computer chips and making a fortune doing it. And they had tracked the ring, they located the guys, they focused in on where the money went, and it was one gem of an investigation. And uh, into the room, after they gave me this story, came the actual elected attorney general of the state of Bavaria. And he said, why did you guys waste all that time and money on this investigation? I get elected based on my ability to control street crime here in Bavaria. And you've taken all of these resources and you've gone out and become world travelers and great investigators, and what's that gonna do for my effort to get reelected? So now what we're focused on is who takes responsibility for doing some kind of global investigation? And now you're really up against the wall because a global investigation is one expensive undertaking. It requires traveling. It requires a lot of time. It requires translators, competent translators. It requires documents in multiple languages. 
and it runs up against all kinds of problems that people don't even think about. So, for example, if I'm a prosecutor in New York and I want to have a witness come testify from Portugal, the result will be good luck, can't do it. Why? Portuguese will not honor a subpoena from a grand jury in New York, period, end of story. What the prosecutor can do is request a letter rogatory with written questions that a Portuguese judge will then ask someone who is a prospective witness who then responds with written answers. Now anybody who's done a financial investigation knows that if you can't ask a follow-up question and somebody has the opportunity to fudge a written answer, it's a total waste of time. Not only that, the time involved is stunning because by the time this process of making the request and getting the reply goes on, uh, we probably are beginning to run the statute of limitations. Problems like that make the will to do cross-border prosecution very limited. And the number of prosecutors who have the resources to send the investigators around the world, uh, CBS's FBI International notwithstanding, is close to zero. Now, if you take that and then translate that to the tax arena, we're dealing with an internal revenue service that hasn't had the money to open the mail for two years much less send investigators around the world, much less try to get information from countries that don't want to provide that information because they're financial secrecy countries. Uh, even where there's a tax treaty, there's a reluctance to employ the tax treaty. And I've been on that on both sides, uh, both working as a consultant for IRS and I've worked with the tax authorities of a foreign government. And in both cases, getting anybody to use a tax treaty to actually do a big tax investigation is really next to impossible. Now, I'll take you to another scene. This time, it's the audit of a major American corporation. Now, a major American corporation will file a tax return that's a stack of paper, well actually it'll be done electronically, about yay I. And there'll be all kinds of things in that paper. And what happens is IRS assigns a team of four or five or six people to that corporation and they work in that corporation's offices. Usually they get some very uncomfortable folding chairs we're in a room with marginal air conditioning. Uh, and uh, they sit there going through the tax return and periodically picking up the phone and calling the uh, tax contact in the corporation. There always is a designated one. And they'll call up some documents and they'll review them. And then we get to the moment of truth. The bosses in Washington call the team and say, why the hell are you guys still working on a five-year-old tax return? We've got to clear it. We need the numbers. Okay. The head of the team says, all right, we'll get down to it. So now they do what you have to do in a tax case, which is reconstruct the taxes that IRS thinks the company owed and then present that to the company to say, do you dispute any of the things we've talked about. And at this point, tax counsel for the company comes in and says, yeah, we dispute all of it. Yeah, you're asking for 400 million. How about one and a half? Okay, we'll settle for two. Bang, <laughs> deal closed. Well, it, it's not anybody's fault that this isn't working. It's rather there's no money, no time, and the way these tax returns are constructed, there is a absolute impossibility of testing the truth 
of what's in that tax return. And it makes corporate taxes almost a voluntary matter. And all you have to do is look at the number of companies that haven't paid any tax, and you'll know how many have volunteered to actually pay their taxes. So what do we do about that one? Well, one idea that I've tossed out, and boy, it makes people go crazy, is to say all tax returns of corporations over a certain size should be public record. They're all secret now. Why isn't that public? There are several other possible ways of coming at this, but uh, it seems to me that the current system is a complete loss. It's, it's not working, it can't work, and there is no penalty for faking it. You know, if, if somebody put some bad numbers or something happened on that tax return, who knows how that'll ever be caught and who would ever be punished. And that takes me to another problem with this whole business of how do we enforce the law. And that's the question of management responsibility. There's a terrible tendency to push responsibility for any bad acts down to bad apples in some department or other. The boss didn't do it. Uh, I was involved uh, working with a cooperating witness in a case involving a large American accounting firm that had been selling tax shelters. The group that was putting together fake tax shelters, and they were ultimately judged criminal fraud on tax, and selling them to people so they could evade uh, millions and millions of dollars in tax. The firm had a collection of damn near three quarters of a million emails. And for reasons which I'd rather not explain, I had to review most of those emails, if not all of them. There was no communication, zero communication in the emails from the team that sold the tax shelters. Never mind that this team had generated $70 million worth of profit to the accounting firm. And never mind that on top of that, uh, they had gotten bonuses for their superb performance. No emails between the unit and the management. Huh? <laughs> right? So there were a couple of mid-level accounting partners who went off to jail, and the firm went merrily on. This is the problem. No arrests, no prosecution, no deterrence. And if there isn't senior management responsibility, it's a real loser. And we've been through that time and again. So now we get to one other problem, and that's the problem of the democratic institutions and what it says about democratic institutions. The working assumption is that if the people know the people will vote out the bums who support the bad stuff, vote in people who will do the right thing, and uh, that will solve the problem, although it'll take a bit of time. We'll get there. Well, the difficulty I have with that proposition is the voters here will be voting on who's governor of you name the place, Illinois, Mississippi, wherever. They'll be voting on a president who picks an attorney general, but what do they do about the legislature and the attorney general of Malta? What do they do about the president and the attorney general in Cyprus? What do they do about the president and whatever passes for law enforcement in Panama, uh, that democracy won't help what's going on in those countries. Our efforts to control what other countries are doing to facilitate criminal behavior in the U.S. is really seriously limited. 
we negotiate treaties, we negotiate conventions, but they're all compromised, and uh, they never do seem to produce the results they're supposed to uh, produce, and it's happened time and time again. And I, I've sat in the room with people who've done the negotiation, and their motivation is to seek a compromise so they can say, we have a convention that deals with that. But does the convention work? And how are we going to find out if it works or it doesn't work? And here there's a major uh, positive development, which is uh, there is a civic society, civil society group that's trying to make at least one of the conventions uh, work properly. But anyway, I'm going to wind up by simply saying these are the issues we have to pay attention to. And it seems to me that in the discussion, there hasn't been enough discussion of can we make law enforcement work? How do we pay for it across borders? How does a prosecutor get evidence? And how do we get some top-level people who are making all the money out of this system sent off to the pokey where many of them belong? Thank you. Well, we were slightly ahead of schedule, but interrupting Jack is a very, uh, very difficult thing. So uh, I think this morning has been uh, kind of interesting because we've had in the same place Raymond Baker, Jim Henry, and Jack Blum, who are really the three greats of their generation on this subject. And I think for, there are a lot of people in this room who would not disagree with that. Uh, so we're going to move on to, to uh, somewhat different formats uh, with the first panel after the coffee break. And sorry that we're three minutes behind, but we'll start right at 1040 with the first panel, maybe 1038, but certainly 10, 1040. Thank you. Think that the Russia-Ukraine war is due to finan the financial secrecy system. All right, we see just a few hands go up. All right, one more. All right. Well, uh, uh, another one. Okay. All right. Well, that's a little bit the premise of this panel. Uh, and actually, I'm going to grab my notes. So, uh, there we go. Uh, all right. So, uh, as you may have noticed, we're not introducing panelists and people because this is all up on the screens and everything, and it saves time and keeps things a little crisper that way. Uh, so um, we're going to look at this question from various perspectives. I mean, Nino uh, uh, runs a uh, very important think tank in Tbilisi, Georgia, and she's going to bring to us uh, the, the uh, perspective rather specific, specific perspective from her country. Uh, we have uh, with us David Kramer, whom a lot of you know, who I think could uh, uh, lead off uh, addressing this uh, very simple question that was posed a little bit. Um, and uh, then Jennifer Gould is a very eminent journalist from New York City. And you may think because she writes for the New York Post, you know, and she, she actually writes about uh, real estate a lot, just about glamorous transactions of rich people and used to do a lot of restaurants, but she's also written extraordinary and fearless investigative reporting on uh, kleptocrats and issues associated with uh, offshore wealth or the financial secrecy system, as uh, we are calling it. Uh, so uh, do you want to kick it off, David, with a... a what? Let them go. You don't want to kick it off now. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, then why, why don't we uh, uh, start, if, uh, Jennifer, with your uh, experiences, I mean, over the years, and also Jennifer was in Moscow in the 1990s, so she lived through that whole episode, and over the years, how have you seen this financial secrecy system in action in terms of the very specific reporting that you've done, which has been mostly on Russians, I guess, and Russians in New York City, for that matter? Uh, well, thank you, David. Thanks, everyone. Um, 
really happy to be here and loved hearing the talks earlier this morning. Um, you know, I started my career, I had one year at the Philadelphia Inquirer, and then I quit. I moved to Moscow to cover the collapse of communism. And at that time, the West thought it won the Cold War. Guess what? We all know now we didn't win. The West did not win. Russia changed strategy. And I kind of witnessed the beginning of that in the 90s and continued it, continued watching it, the same people in my reporting over the next three decades. Um, so Moscow, 1990s, financial secrecy actually went back to the late 1980s. I remembered one night uh, at the dacha of one of the last heads of the KGB who helped organize a coup against Gorbachev. Uh, that real estate had transferred to a young KGB colonel uh, who told me stories about Western front companies set up in the late 80s. The Russians knew their system was failing. They knew they'd have to change uh, and not in a friendly way to the West. Uh, as Raymond talks about this uh, separation between capitalism and democracy, we saw it in, in action, a sort of weaponization of capitalism, extracting the democracy, strengthening autocracy, weakening our democracies. Uh, I got so, you know, I, I saw these, young oligarchs at the time would go for dinner with them uh, the first millionaires club the first raves the first big parties a very exciting time in moscow uh, rigged privatization we've all heard of but it wasn't just rigged privatization it was partnering with westerners um, that initial money coming in raw materials going out of the country uh, come back to the to New York, late 1990s, and that Russian money is already coming in. Chelsea Market, uh, $10 million investment from uh, men who were uh, linked to criminal organizations in Russia, uh, you know, had created really the Chelsea Market, the redevelopment of the west side of New York. 2018, that property sold for $2.4 billion. So that was the first sort of wave in New York uh, of investment. And by the time of Putin, the 2000s, we had the tip of the iceberg coming out, which is these oligarchs coming in and they were buying properties and they were buying big properties. And my background kicked in. I could find out which oligarchs were buying what properties. It was a lot of fun to write. <laughs> um, but that was really just the tip of the iceberg. So, you know, they would buy in LLCs. We didn't have leaked documents. So it was really speaking to people, going out, doing the reporting, talking to the brokers and finding out who these people were who were buying the properties. And they still have them on, on that level. The same, you know, so we go from the real estate to Russian investment and everything. I would see oligarchs come in uh, with a purpose of what they're, buying. So somebody wouldn't just buy an apartment, it would be an apartment owned by a billionaire, and the oligarch would then buy that billionaire's business. Or a billionaire would buy a very politically connected person uh, and get access. So real estate laundered money. It also uh, gave access to Russians who wouldn't have had it otherwise. And from there, uh, we saw more investment. Then came the reputation laundering through think tanks, universities, you know, this is this is all things we've seen and we know. Political donations, we're still seeing the results of that. Enablers coming in, um, you know, helping these oligarchs now evade sanctions. But I can tell you that right now, uh, since the war, there has been no uh, high stakes Russian investment in New York as far as real estate goes but Russian money is in a lot of the big towers along with Chinese money and other money um, that have really grown since 2010 in New York and across the US. It wasn't just New York. New York isn't as fun as Miami for a lot of oligarchs. Um, but you know the political donations and the connections that these oligarchs made, made, this, you know, made it difficult when it came to sanctions some companies, a company is sanctioned, not the oligarch. Uh, 
uh, some oligarchs are sanctioned, but not their businesses. So Alpha Bank, for example, there's a lot of high profile real estate that's still there that people who are not sanctioned still own that they've rented out for a lot of money and that's okay. You know, so there's, there's a lot of issues, but really the, the real estate is just the tip of the iceberg. And without this financial secrecy system, we wouldn't be in this situation. It shouldn't be about people knocking on doors and really trying to figure out who owns what or you know, where the money comes from. There, there should be public registers for journalists or anybody else to, to look and, and get curious and find out who's investing, know who your neighbor is. We have situations now where the FBI is in buildings owned by criminal organizations. You know, that should not be happening. So um, we're in this situation because of financial secrecy and it's been going on for decades. And, you know, we're obviously nowhere near the end of this. So that's my Great. Thank you, point. Jennifer. <laughs> I see David has notes, so I'm not going to pose a question. <laughs> But I think the thing what we did, no, what we just discussed is the whole issue of uh, Western enablement of corruption and kleptocracy, and how this has been an issue for Russia and for Ukraine. Uh, and so, why don't why don't we get into that? But. Sure. Well, Charles, thanks. It's great to be here. Thanks for including me, and congratulations, Raymond, on the book. And it's also great to be with Jack and, and Jim here, whom I followed for, for a long time and with all of you. Um, I, I'd start by saying Putin, well, under Putin, Russia's greatest export is corruption. But in order to export it, we import it. And so we need to do a much better job of closing off the opportunities for Russians to stash their ill-gotten gains here. And to be clear, it's not to say that every Russian who comes here or puts money in the United States uh, comes with ill-gotten gains, but there, there are certainly those who are doing so. It, it's interesting, the timing of this event occurs the same week when Putin just signed legislation allowing uh, lawmakers not to disclose the uh, sources of, of their income, their expenses, their property, at the same time that Ukraine is moving ahead with anti-corruption investigations, dismissing some officials, uh, arresting others. We'll see how serious that is. But it does, I think, reflect the different trajectories that these two countries are on, where Ukraine, which has been plagued by corruption for sure for many years now, I think has a zero tolerance for this kind of activity. There are too many people who are losing their lives fighting in this war and the last thing they want to see is oligarchs, government officials, or anyone else siphon off funds that are intended to help Ukraine not only defend itself, but to win this war. And I think this is finally a, a, an epiphany for many Ukrainians who have had a high threshold for corruption in their country. And yet in Russia, we see just a kind of sinking in, a resignation among many Russians, even with Navalny's exposés. Uh, they don't seem to have that great an impact um, in generating uh, Russians to go out in the streets and to demand better from their own officials. Um, Ukraine, I think, has also recognized, or Ukrainians have, that the corruption that they have allowed in their system for many years left them vulnerable to Russian influence. And we see this in other countries in the region too. Nino, I know we'll talk about Georgia, um, but in allowing this kind of activity to occur, Russia takes full advantage of this. And that weakens these countries' sovereignty, their independence. And I think there is a growing recognition that in their own self-interest and their ability to maintain their independence and their sovereignty, there needs to be a, a crackdown on, on this kind of behavior. Corruption has been, in Russia, it's, it was part and parcel in the 90s. Jennifer was just describing some of this when she was there. It's been going on, obviously, in the Soviet time, although perhaps not as blatantly and not as ostentatiously as we, we have seen it. Um, Yeltsin years, of course, were, were no paradise for this. The loans for shears uh, deal was arguably one of the worst that occurred that uh, contributed to the corruption in Russia, and we looked the other way. Uh, and this is where I think we also do have some role in this, some complicity in this by 
winking and nodding and saying, well, the alternative could be worse if we spoke out or if we did something about this and look at where we are now. Uh, again, it's not to ship responsibility and blame to us, but we do have some share in this. And it's important to, I think, to recognize that. Um, I think what we have seen in Russia is the impoverishment of millions as a result of this kind of activity. There's certainly the standard of living is higher, but there's still tremendous impoverishment in Russia and the enrichment of a small few. And in some countries that leads to popular backlash. We'll see if that reaches such a point. Under Putin, of course, the oligarchs got the message after the arrest of Mikhail Khodorkovsky in 2003. Khodorkovsky, I'd rather Putin doesn't have to go after every oligarch uh, to, to send the message. You go after the richest guy and the rest will either learn their lesson or get defenestrated. Um, the uh, more corrupt Russia has become, uh, particularly under Putin, the more authoritarian it becomes. And it is this connection between corruption and authoritarianism, I think that brings us to the Russia-Ukraine war, where Ukraine's efforts to show that it was responsive to popular sentiment, whether in 2004 with the Orange Revolution or 2013 and 14 with the Revolution of Dignity, um, or more recently under Zelensky, where Ukraine's efforts to try to demonstrate uh, its independence, its determination to determine its own future, um, those kinds of things pose a threat to the corrupt authoritarian system that Putin oversees in, in Russia. And so I would argue it is on that basis that Putin invaded Ukraine. So it, financial secrecy, the way the Russian system has operated, certainly, um, but also the very idea that people in Ukraine could determine their own future and their leaders would actually follow popular sentiment, that's something that Putin can't stomach. Um, and so we've also seen one of the development that I would just flag and that is, I'm gonna make up a word, the mercenaryization of Russian policy um, with in particular the Wagner forces operating in various parts of the world. In particular, I, I, I would argue the damage they're doing in places in Africa. Uh, and this is in pursuit, not of Russian national interests, but in pursuit of corrupt interests, uh, trying to take over various assets in these countries. I think it explains Prigozhin's uh, pursuit of Bakhmut and the area around it for these salt mines. Not quite sure why Russia needs to control these, but Prigozhin has a clear interest in it for corrupt reasons. And so I think this is a, a particularly dangerous phenomenon that we're seeing um, in Russia. Um, the, there is one good part about corruption in Russia, which is that it actually weakened the Russian military. Um, the, the siphoning off of funds that were meant to go to modernize uh, the Russian military, its equipment, has actually left it in a much more innovated state than it would have been otherwise. And so Russia, as a result of this, is not the formidable military that uh, many people played it up to be. So um, there, there is uh, an irony that I'll end with, which is I do think the Russian oligarchs want to protect our capitalist system because they can take advantage of it. At the same time that they try to weaken our democracy, but not destroy it. Because if they destroy or help destroy our democracy, then the very reason why they use our system, which is they don't trust their own system, they're afraid of their own system, they're afraid of confiscation if they left their funds in Russia, um, they worry the same could happen to them here in the United States. So it is a little odd that they want to preserve some of what we have, but not necessarily the best parts of it. Right. Thank you, David. That's really, and that may not be the capitalism uh, that Raymond Baker was talking about. The, Rus the Russian desire for capitalism in the West is somewhat in conflict with what we're putting forward. Um, so uh, Nino Evgenidze has, a, uh, has to live with a horrible case study really of the financial secrecy system in action in her country. And she's going to address that, I think. Thank you so much, Charles. And um, I cannot say that I'm happy sitting in this chair today and talking about the very bad stories about my country because all my life I'm doing that I, I was promoting my countries because I was very proud of my country. 
uh, since we got the independence after 200 years of like you know the occupation and annexation from Russia we were the one of the like uh, front runners in this region to build the democracy and to build the institutions and to be a number one country to defend the like, to defeat the corruption in the world uh, and everything started like to make it short the last 30 years history of Georgia uh, you know because we were fighting for our freedom and democracy even Georgia was three times attacked by and invaded by Russia first in early like you know the 90s but no one was talking about this at that time you know and uh, there was like a democratic Russia and Eltsin's regime and uh, no one paid to this but it was a, like a really ethnic cleaning of the Georgian people because the 10,000 civilians died in this war and the 500,000 Georgians were to leave their own places and uh, be became the like you know the internally displaced people in their own country and uh, the second time you know when the Georgia started to making the reforms despite the fact that we were like you know the occupied by Russians and so and we lost our territories uh, and uh, we were promoting the reforms and we became again the number one country uh, they started the blocking us you know that there was an energy cat cut and uh, whenever like you know I was a few weeks ago in Kiev and David was telling me you know there is a, a energy cut there there is no water or nothing I've told David for 10 years, we do not have any energy or any heating or any water, but we survived because we were known that we are fighting for our freedom. And the next time, when in 2008, because the Vladimir Putin decided no one have to be performed in the region, uh, they, they started to attack the Georgia and they invaded the Georgia. And after the war started uh, with support of the US, uh, like uh, Georgia, do, do not lose like uh, the capital of the city and the government at that time was not cracked down uh, from from their power uh, and you know it's a sad story because uh, it took Georgians the 13 years because the Russian disinformation and the money and why the, this financial secrecy is like is so important the money they were laundering in the Western European countries was used to blame Georgia that the very tiny 3,500,000 people started the war against the Russians, you know, and the world by this, even the state like uh, heads from the different, even our partners, they were blaming for 13 years, the Georgians, that we provoked the Russians, we provoked the Vladimir Putin, otherwise he is a very rational guy, you know, and it took the European Court of Human Rights 13 years to recognize and to make the statement, no, it was not Georgians, it was the Russia who started the war. But at that time, and until that, we lost everything, you know, but we do not lost the faith that one day we're gonna, like, you know, the crack down the devil empire together with our Ukrainian friends. And what is going right now in Georgia? The Russian uh, like uh, after after this like you know this invasion and so and they realized that they cannot uh, concord the Georgians they they started the using the different like uh, instruments to uh, to make the mess they started to like uh, exporting the corruption as David mentioned and some other measures you know to to capture the state and if I can say now the 20% of Georgian territories is like, you know, occupied by Russians and the rest is uh, captured by the Russian oligarch Vizina Ivanishvili, uh, who right now is supporting the Russians to avoid the sanctions and uh, uh, avoid the sanctions and also help the Russians to win uh, against the Ukrainians. And uh, why I'm telling this? Because we have a, like a uh, proof of this. Uh, before the war started in Ukraine, the Georgian economy was like uh, connected with the Russians somewhere five or six percent. And now it's like, you know, uh, our trade turnover is a tripled. And unfortunately, we are a very small country and we don't have anything to sell in Russia, even the like, you know, the product.
products or whatever. We are not producing anything like this. And uh, I mean, all this international media is talking now about that the Georgian government is supporting the Russian uh, uh, Putin's regime uh, to avoid the sanctions and no one pays the attention. And we're talking about the victims of the kleptocrats and the victim of the kleptocrats is the Ukrainian people who are uh, fighting now, right now, not only for their own homeland, but for all of us all around the world and they're sacrificing their lives. And uh, um, just like a fi final, final message that uh, this this government do not represent the Georgian people. I, I want to underline this because the Georgian people, 85% uh, of the Georgian people, it's a recent polls, and it do not change few few months uh, later that they support the Ukraine and saying that the war in Ukraine in their war, it's their war. Because we strongly believe that then uh, I just want to bring the data, you know, and the poll is not going to make me to lie that the 3,000 Georgians are fighting against the Russians in Ukraine. And we, we have a 39 casualties. None of other countries after Ukraine has such amount of like, you know, the casualties. And again, this is a good indicator of statistical information, how the Georgian uh, people feel and think about this war, what is going right now there. And the victims after the Ukrainian people, this is a third president of Georgia. He looks like this. I, I'm pretty sure you met him several times and he was quite big guy. And he looks like now this. He, he weighs the same, same kilos like I myself right now and I'm very short. And <laughs> it's his like a photos, you know? And the first time in the Georgian history, the head of the independent media, Nika Guaramia, is sitting in a jail and there is no response. And yesterday, just the just mm -hmm. final one, there was a, like a Biden speech. And uh, he, I think that the, repeated 11 or 12 times that they finished the job. And we, as a, like, you know, freedom fighters all around the world, and especially the Ukrainians and Georgians are looking for this, to finish this job, you know, to finish this like imperialistic, like empire of the Russia and all these like uh, oligarchs and their money is, is gonna be disappear because Unfortunately, when we're talking about the West, West uh, created this um, system and especially the Western Europeans uh, to make this uh, economy theory of uh, interdependency of energy, infrastructure, and uh, some other economic projects. And the Germany, for example, for uh, many, many years and decades were putting this as a main foreign policy agenda and who was the victims of this agenda uh, and having this interdependency policy uh, with the Russia? It's Georgians and Ukrainians. And if we not stop the Russians right now, it's going to be come in other doors very soon. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nina. Jennifer, you, Jennifer wanted to add something yes. briefly um, to this. Yeah, very, very brief. It was really, really moving. And it reminded me of going back to the 90s. And there is this direct line. I mean, I always looked at it as like the first post-Cold War um, proxy war between the U.S. and Russia. And uh, America's first CIA officer post-Cold War was assassinated in Tbilisi in 1993. It kept going. And to your point, of going back to that time and not saying anything and winking and nodding, saying elections are free and fair when they weren't and watching this corruption happen, the provocations, the war, it's the same thread, the same playbook and yeah. it should yeah. end. And even well, the president Saakashvili, uh, Shevardnadze, uh, the uh, second president of Georgia was attacked three times by the Russians. Uh, uh, by terrorist attacks, you know, and the uh, killing this FBI guy in Georgia was one of the part of the Russian special operation because at that time we are making the decisions that the Georgia is going to get this Baku Tbilisi Jehan pipeline project, and it was not going into the Russia's interest having this kind of like a uh, politics Georgia and the rest of the region connected with the West and share the same values and the 
saying like you know the dedication for freedom and democracy right but what we see also in in georgia right now is that the political control uh, uh is completely obscured by the financial secrecy system so you've got this economic opacity with a guy who made his fortune in russia during a certain period of history where we know there's only one way to do that uh in terms of how you position yourself politically and uh david touched on uh the uh how we enable all of this and i mean uh, just setting setting up paul nobody raised their hand at the question i posed uh, trying to get people in from the coffee break but one no i'm sorry alina over here raised raised her hand about that but i think i think this enabling system which others touched on but especially david obviously has made uh the kleptocrats of that region extraordinarily arrogant and so what i was was sort of uh, tilting at is just the notion of what uh what attitude what this has done in terms of the attitude towards towards the west uh and thinking that they could get away with anything i mean as we're, we're servicing their yachts bending over backwards to help them hide their money in the system that was described so eloquently this morning by our three great experts uh so that is i think it is a much bigger factor than than people are giving credence to and paul who breezed in after that probably agrees uh, somewhat yeah, and, and and let me, you know, first things first, apologize for uh, arriving late to my own panel. Uh, a very palmasaro move, I suppose. Um, I was talking to Ukrainians this morning who are on the front. I talk to Ukrainians almost every single day these days. Um, and I guess I also want to point out that for all the reforms and, and everything that we need to do, the most effective anti-corruption tool on the planet right now is weapons for Ukraine. I mean, getting Ukraine Heimers, getting Ukraine Javelins, getting Ukraine tanks, whatever it is, that is by far the number one priority for all of us, and has to be. Um, and I guess I, 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 I take on board and agree with everything David said. I think it's a great analysis. I might go a step further and say that actually, yeah, they do want to destroy capitalism. <laughs> I might, I might say that you know when I when I look at the last year, I think we misunderstood something here. I, I think we were I think we were right that corruption is the mo of Russia, but I think we miss the deeper ideological imperial aspects of Russia. And I mean, I think that when one looks at this war, right, it's long since stopped making economic sense. I mean, if it was just an economic thing, if this was just corruption or anything like that, they would be gone. No, it's genocide. This is about wiping the Ukrainians off the face of the earth. And further than that, beyond just colonizing Ukraine, it's about wiping us off the face of the earth. This whole thing is about the destruction of the West. So when they pump their money into our systems, they're trying to destroy us. That's their goal. They're not trying to preserve capitalism. They're not trying to take advantage of it. They don't want crony capitalism. They want no capitalism at all. They want the end of the entire system. They want tyranny and totalitarianism. And that's Russia and that's China. But I mean, this is, this is a big, I guess, just the, the, the elephant we missed and I think we missed it in part because we didn't listen all that closely to Ukrainians. We didn't listen all that closely to the Poles. We didn't listen all that closely to the Baltic states and so on and so forth. Many people in this town uh, listened a lot to the Russians, listened a lot to, uh, to Moscow, talked almost exclusively with Moscow. And when one speaks to the Ukrainians, they say, this, they say this very clearly. They're like, yeah, of course, they want to destroy you. They want to destroy us. They want to destroy everything they have for you know, centuries. This is the same imperial state that was the Soviet Union that was the czarist regime, it's the same thing. It's just never reformed. Now, we did have an opportunity to reform it and we failed. I think that that's very true. Um, but at this point, we're in a much, much worse situation than that. They're, they're, their money's here, they wanna take us down, which makes, I think, the urgency around these reforms so much more important. I mean, this isn't, we're not just losing out on the reform of these countries. We are under siege. We are, this is, a, this is a threat for our entire system. And I think we see this every day in this town. I think we see this in our politics, in the way that foreign interference has become just a uh, extremely normal thing to see on the news. I mean, I, see, I think we see this in the way that all our former politicians work for foreign regimes. I mean, of course, you know, I mean, we could talk about Gerhard Schroeder or Francois Fillon or whatever in the, in, you know, the top dogs, but of course the level down from the top dogs, it's massive. Everybody does it, you know? I mean, it's, 
this, this, this town is filled with mercenary lobbying firms that are stocked full of former officials who lobby for the Chinese, who lobby for Russian oligarchs, who lobby, and they have pushed us into destroying ourselves, you know? So when it comes to this enabling environment, of course, I mean, they, they view us with absolute disdain. I mean, our adversaries have, have discovered that, yeah, you can't beat us on the battlefield, but all you have to do is offer half a million dollars a year and they'll do whatever you want. They'll do the whole jig. I mean, it's, it's crazy how cheaply we sell ourselves. It's, it's, it's truly unbelievable. So yeah, we are complicit in this. We caused it. And it's much, 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 much worse than we believed it to be. This is not just potentially you know, the, the, the very obvious failure of democracy in Russia or the possible now loss of democracy in Ukraine. This was very much Russia's idea of finally destroying the West. The invasion of Ukraine was the beginning. It was gonna be Ukraine. She was gonna go after Taiwan. There would be some kind of incursion in NATO and that would be it. I mean, we, we got saved by the skin of our teeth thanks to the bravery of Ukrainians. And I want us to really sort of recognize that. Now I can talk a little bit about the reforms if we, yes. Just one thing, I can't see the schedule from where I am. How, we have until when? 11.30, okay, great. So yeah, why don't you talk uh, uh, a little bit about that? I mean, I was, I was gonna ask, uh, is the situation you're talking about goosing enthusiasm for these reforms in any way? And then if you can keep that pretty short, we'll have time for uh, a few questions. It is, it is uh, boosting enthusiasm. Our... And I think that's demonstrated by the fact that last Congress, as many of you know, we got very, very, very close to the Enablers Act. Um, I mean, I describe what the Enablers Act is, of course, it would uh, finally mandate due diligence for lawyers, accountants, uh, you know, company formation agents, company and trust formation agents, so on and so forth. We're going to give that another shot. Uh, we were defeated ultimately by now retired Senator Pat Toomey, so he's no longer there. It's very nice uh, when you're defeated by a retired senator, new senator. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, we'll see, we'll see where that goes. Another big initiative is on this authoritarian revolving door stuff. Some of you have heard of the, the SHAME Act, the Stop Helping Adversaries Manipulate Everything Act, which would prevent uh, anybody, anybody from accepting compensation for lobbying for our sort of countries of concern, our adversaries, China, Russia, North Korea, Syria, Venezuela, and Iran. We'd like to extend it beyond that. Obviously, this should also be applied to frenemies <laughs> eventually. Of course, that's a tougher sell with the national security establishment. Um, there was in the last NDAA, I think it kind of went undercover. But for those that don't know, there was a provision that is now law that will ban former secretaries of state, former deputy secretaries from ever consulting or advising or, or working in any capacity for a foreign country. I mean, it was, it's, not an, it's not an amendment to FARA. It's not an amendment to the Lobbying Disclosure Act. It just bans it altogether. Uh, Senate confirmed officials now have a three year cooling off period for any country and are permanently banned from those six countries I named, the countries of concern. But we wanna you know, expand it from there. That is law now. So we wanna, we wanna get it to defense, obviously. Not a week goes by when we don't see a retired general who's working for you know, a foreign state. Uh, we wanna expand it to intelligence officials. We wanna expand it to treasury and so on and so forth. I mean, it's just, you know, the, the, it's an embarrassment of riches, right, Charles? I mean, it's like, it's unbelievable how much we, how much we left this corrupt enabling environment to fester. So we have to close both the professional enablers with the Enablers Act, the lawyers and in account, then we have to close the political enablers, that is all these former officials and also those that really never were former officials, they're just professional lobbyists. Wonderful, well, not wonderful. Uh, David, uh, Jennifer, Nino, any very quick comment before we go uh, to uh, questions or anything come um, to mind? Well, uh, two quick things. Uh, I couldn't agree more, Paul, about um, the way to deal with this is to help the Ukrainians win, not just defend themselves. That is far too insufficient. Um, it is to help them win. And win means driving every single Russian invading and occupying troop, troop from Ukrainian soil, including Crimea. It's a shame we have to add that since Crimea is part of Ukraine, but that's true. Um, we will take the, uh, I think we do have a slight disagreement about Putin's and, and the oligarchs aims. I actually don't think it's to destroy us, it's to exploit us and to use us. Um, and we may self-destruct in the process if we're not careful, um, but I think they actually want, they certainly want to weaken us, no question about it. But I actually think they almost need us uh, because they don't trust their own system, their own leadership and they need some safe place to stash their 
ill-gotten gains and and they like the freedom that we have um so they're beholden to their leaders um but they also like what we have to offer right well i would well, say that the, uh, that one. Yeah, <laughs> give, give, me, give me some time the only the only danger there is will the uh, oligarchs and kleptocrats of this world have the wisdom as they uh, infiltrate us, will, will they know where to stop in terms of where they've pushed the well, curse? Well, the only thing I would say, I don't know you want it, Jennifer, but um, look, it, it, it is insufficient to freeze assets. We have to seize the assets so that these ill-gotten gains never go back, whether it's to oligarchs or to the Russian state. We have three over $300 billion in foreign hard currency reserves, and those should never be returned to Russia. Well, and can I add that the, the authority we passed last Congress to yeah. allow those oh, assets okay. to be transferred, we got the first transfer, 5.4 yep. million from Malafeyev. And hopefully a lot mm -hmm. more is going to come down the line. I mean, 5.4 million, not a billion, but hopefully a lot That's more. A start. Okay, Jennifer, this, very quickly, and then we're going to take a question. You know, very quickly, this idea of whether oligarchs want to be part of our system or not, they definitely want to weaken it. What we have seen are oligarchs going back because they're forced to go back to Russia. They don't want to be there, but that's where their money is. Yeah. The other thing are the children. You know, you've got the yeah. foreign minister's daughter, people trained, Ivy League universities here, Oxford, Cambridge, and they're not participating as Westerners. They're back in Russia, and that's the biggest problem. Last thing in the 90s, everyone was talking about robber barons. The Russians were going to be the exact same as American robber barons, and it did not happen. And we've got to take that into account. Yeah, great. So uh, I think Herbst that can over there. Sorry? We can't see. I can't. John, I can't see everyone. Ah, John. John Herbst. Yes. Question, actually, for Paul, but for anyone. Uh, frozen Russian state assets. You referred to the Malafe of oligarch assets um, are a very important resource to help Ukraine sustain its economy now, as the Russians have crushed about 50% of it, and then to rebuild. I know there's interest in parts of uh, Congress to pass a law enabling us not just to, to freeze those assets, which has already happened, but then to transfer them to Ukraine. What's the status of that? Sure. So, so I mean, you're absolutely right. It's, it's, it's the treasure load, essentially, right? I mean, I, you know, I just said, 5.4 million from LFA. This is 350 billion. So I mean, this is this is this is some serious serious dough. Um, I, not, I would not all in the United States. Not all in the United about States. About 30. 60. About 60. 30. 60. Again, these these are all from like this Peterson Institute report, and then talking about just um, who is Malafeyev? He's an oligarch. Uh, okay, but just say two cents more about. Uh, a bad oligarch. He's a bad. He's a bad. Are there any other? He's a, he's a he's a bad. Very. He, no, this no, is no, no. this is different money. So get the two point four. Yeah. Okay. Yes, that's right. Um, so the, the, this money is different. So this money is state assets. Okay. So this is one of the issues we ran into with the oligarch assets from the beginning is it's 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 understood to be private money in our legal system. So it has to be forfeited under a due process procedure, which of course we thought was ridiculous because obviously oligarchs are holding state assets, but under our, this is part of the problem we face in kleptocracy, right? Is that they, they don't have a public private differentiation, we do. Um, but getting to this state assets, the nice thing about state assets is they are public assets very obviously under US law. So in fact, they don't enjoy due process. So a judge needs to be no part of this. There's no due process protections for state assets. Um, and under, my interpretation of this and some lawyers I've spoken with, I mean, there's, there's disagreement on this that the president could already do this. I mean, the only thing stopping them is foreign sovereign immunity, but that can be waived under reciprocity under the notion that like, look, I mean, Russia's broken every single aspect of international law, I'll just take it. But this administration is very, very, very hesitant to go down that course for essentially reasons that, that have to do with the supremacy of the US dollar and how this could make China feel to seize sovereign reserves, how it could make our allies feel who hold an enormous amount of dollars in the United States and so on and so forth. So we, we really wanna do this with allies. I think this could be sold to G7 also because as David pointed out, the majority of this is held in Europe, not in the United States. So, so a lot of it's held in European central banks. So it really should be done in a G7 fashion. Now, would there need to be new law? Again, I don't think there would need to be, but with this administration, it always helps to give them an explicit authority that they can do it so that they have sort of the political cover to do it. And, and yes, I, I, I think in the next month or so, there will be a bill uh, which will hopefully move that will allow this to 
proceed, we'll give an explicit authority to allow it to proceed. Again, the problem though is one of a political debate, not a legal debate. This is different than the private assets where you really needed legal authorities. Okay, okay we're gonna take- Charles, can I, yeah. I know you're gonna go to Ilya and others, but um, real quick, uh, when, when we talk about sanctions, there are two that people talk about. There are visa sanctions and there are asset sanctions. Visa sanctions are discretionary. No one can challenge that in a court of law. A, a State Department official can deny someone a visa. Um, when you seize someone's assets, you have to be able to have that stand up in a court of law. So it is a, a higher threshold, an evidentiary threshold that Treasury has to meet. Okay, we're, we're essentially out of time. So we're actually just gonna be able to take one question, I'm afraid. Over, uh, Elena, she raised her hand at the beginning of the session, so she gets uh, to... <laughs> Thank you so much. I will ask one question. What can we do? I think it's very convenient for us to keep on putting the door, the dirt at the, somebody else's doorstep. Yes, there are problems with Saudi Arabia, Egypt, mil, Egyptian military, Russians, you know, there are plenty of problems out there. But the issue is, as, as you pointed out, Russians changed tactics. They started learning from the best. And we have a part of our economy, finance, trade, which gives them a wonderful space in the basement or in the attic to have their field party. And I think it's extremely, as David and others have pointed out, it's extremely important to acknowledge the dirt is also in our house. So what can we do next? And it's very good that you asked the question about Russian reserves of 300 billion. The 100 billion number comes from the Russian authorities. We haven't seen confirmation from our banks as in, look, I'm holding this much of Russian reserves. I'm happy to put it forward. We haven't had the confirmation from our authorities about what, what is where. So what can we do? One uh, point from each pa panelist, if you may. All right, it's going to have to be one sentence. Okay, well, I mean, obviously, we got a bunch of federal reforms to do, but I also find it funny that, like, so many of these issues are at the state level, right? I mean, like, go become a resident of South Dakota and tell them to stop with their trust industry, you know? I mean, there's, there's a bajillion different reforms that we need in the United States. So I've already named a few, but, I mean, it goes so far beyond that, too. We need to close the revolving door. We need to limit professionals, force them to do due diligence, and uh, also stop the states from constantly engaging in this race to the bottom. David? Transparency, disclosure, and sourcing. Jennifer? I would say the same thing, Co uh, corporate transparency. Any journalist, any citizen should be able to go onto a database and find out who owns what and who's getting what government money, anything should all be open. You know? Um, I think the transparency and accountability is the most important part of this. And also the uh, showing the, like, you know, that the, uh, U.S. is uh, stands for their values and their, you know, because they were always a leader of the free world. And we all from the like countries, Georgia, small countries and very vulnerable countries, uh, always looking uh, for the our beacon of democracy, United States. And when you see in these times that the, this kind of crazy stuff is going and at the same time, the U.S. government is financing like Congos uh, uh, in Georgia. <laughs> it makes me very sad, and I don't understand why it's going. What kind of stuff is? What the hell is going here? Okay, great. So uh, we need to mic Dana Priest and the Fourth Estate now. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, I'm so happy to be here. Um, I have to say that Paul Mazzaro, whenever he speaks, I feel like I have to record it and then turn it, turn it down to very slow RPM because there's so much, that, I'm very stirred up right now, Paul, wherever you are. Uh, <laughs> this is the media panel. And since we're talking about transparency, we're an integral part of that. Uh, I'm taking Jack Blum's suggestion that we not just talk about our problems, that we also talk about uh, what is it that we've written about on corruption or other types of corruption that really actually promoted reform? What's the combination of reporting and political will, which we really don't have anything to do with, that has uh, prompted reforms of systems that have been in place for a long time? But I also want those up here who have dealt with uh, collaborative um, journalism to talk about the difficulties of that. I had my first foray into that recently with Forbidden Stories and spyware um, 
NSO group, working with uh, 12 different countries and, and a couple dozen journalists, and it was really fun, but frustrating and uh, difficult as well. So um, we have Fergus, especially up here, who represents probably the most experienced uh, group of journalists to have done this. Uh, before I start questions, I, I'm going to take the prerogative and just point out two things. One is I, I have done some stories in my life that have made a difference, and I think that one of the things that I've heard here uh, relates to one of them, which is I did a uh, series, then a book called Top Secret America after 9-11, in which really we, we just counted the number of organizations that had grown up after 9-11 to suck out the money that the Congress was throwing at the government to try to deal with counterterrorism. And in the physical world, it is possible to count things that in the real world we can't actually get behind the door because they were classified. So we literally counted the buildings in Washington, D.C. and discovered the clusters throughout the country of other, um, other clusters of buildings, mainly contractor buildings that, lo and behold, grew up around different huge intelligence agencies to serve them. And looking at Tom Cardamon's map, you know, and listening to other people talk about the system that exists, I think visualizing that system could be a very powerful, a, a very powerful tool. And then secondly, I did a series about Walter Reed Medical Center when it was not caring for its veterans who came back uh, to be rehabilitated from the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. And that, uh, I remember my colleagues and others saying, well, you know, the military has never really treated its veterans very well. Well, first of all, as a journalist, ignore that. <laughs> that doesn't mean it's good. But what made that story work is the human beings inside of that, the human beings who we could, whose lives we could talk about. So you can do scope but you have to do human beings, in my view, in order to make it relate to people who are reading it and maybe compel it you know, off the front page and into some other uh, forum. And Jennifer, we're gonna start with Jennifer because she's done, I was just reading your last um, real estate, uh, you know, buying and selling your columns and you just take a dozen of them and you say, you know, they're tens of millions of dollars. Who are these people? What's going on? What's right? going on? <laughs> so I'll give you one example that I wasn't going to give when you asked this question, but I thought about it a little bit more. So in 2009, I was the first journalist really to write about Joe Lowe. He was the so-called architect of the 1MDB scandal, you know, billions of dollars stolen from the Sovereign Wealth Fund in Malaysia. And um, the way it started was through real estate. You know, all of a sudden, a broker would call me, hey, this guy just bought, you know, not just one apartment, but 10 in a certain building for all his friends. And, you know, P. Diddy at that time was living in the building, <laughs> and he had a bunch of Escalades. But then this young kid had more Escalades, you know, clogging the front of this building. Bergdorf Goodman shopping bags coming in. So, you know, who is this guy? And um, in the first story, um, I, I did my columns where I wrote about some of the properties he was buying. But the first time we outed his name, I wrote it with uh, another reporter who was working the club scene. You know, who is this guy <laughs> sending $10,000 bottles to Paris Hilton? So we put the two together. We named this guy, but um, one of my favorite quotes came from this one. Uh, broker who off the record said, you know, nobody spends their own money like this. You just don't. You don't s spend this crazy way, um, charter planes and see two, two New Year's Eves in one night, hire the best of Western celebrities to come sing and, and models who are now married to billionaires give them apartments, give them Birkin bags, give them diamonds, you know, all, a lot of that they had, this guy had to give back at the end, thanks to the Justice Department. Um, but that line, you know, no one spends their own money like this, I was told later helped investigators start looking, you know, at this guy, who was he? Who was this guy spending all of this money? So that's why real estate, it really is like a tip of an iceberg. There's so much underneath, but 
you know, that can be a little, little way in. So did you find yourself um, taking advantage of some of the, re of, of the Justice Department folks who were investigating, or, or did you feel like you had to compete with them? And, and like, That's a good question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> my sources were fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> But they were, they, you know, like with every reporter, you know, the, the sources aren't who you would think they would be. You know, they would come, it could be someone who was an ex-employee who was terrified for their lives, you know, it, it, all over the place. Real estate, enablers working, it could run the gamut of, of who, who they were, but, you know, that, that ended up, there were investigations around the world, uh, several international investigations before something actually happened. Yeah, so. that's fantastic. And it reminds me of how important lawsuits are. Because even yes. lawsuits that seem obscure can give journalists the, the clue, more and more clues that might lead them somewhere. Um, so I'm a big proponent of lawsuits for that reason. Uh, Fergus, okay, if you don't know ICIJ, you're probably not in this room, <laughs> but um, uh, every, a dozen leaks. I wish there were a more um, elegant term for that. But they are important. And uh, your organization has really made a, such a name for itself and, and helped uh, uncover this. So how do you, can you explain a little bit of how that works and uh, what you need and how you, how you get people to, is it just randomly or? Sure, no problem. Um, so I went, um, Charles asked me to come to speak here today. I was thinking about what we do and what we do at ICIJ. ICIJ is a tiny organization. There's only about 35 of us. We're scattered across the world. We have been responsible in the last four years for the two biggest in journalism projects in history. Uh, the Pandora Papers had more than 600 journalists in more than 117 countries. <laughs> uh, FinCEN Files had, had more than 400 journalists in more than 100 countries. What ICIJ is about is the truth what we, um, our ambition is to uncover the truth. That's what we were about. Uncovering the truth is extremely difficult, but it's vitally important. It's more important than ever. There's a tsunami of fake news out there, and we are at the forefront of trying to resist it. We're at the forefront of trying to resist it because we believe, we believe in our hearts and our souls that democracy depends on the truth. Without the truth, there's no democracy, and without democracy, there's no journalism. So we're fighting for our existence. How we do this is we uh, bring journalists from around the world to focus on a particular topic, to uncover complex financial arrangements, or to uncover how the Chinese set up the Xinjiang camps. It, it depends on the topic. But I'll just name two characters in three projects, and then I'll try to explain. So two characters, one, Isabel de Santos, who many of you may know was heralded by the West as a champion of uh, female business leadership in Africa, and Suleiman Karamov, one of the richest men in uh, Russia, who made his money through gas, gold, oil, etc. So we go to Isabel. We did a project called Luanda Leaks. We were given 400,000, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, 700,000 documents uh, from a guy called Rui Pinto. We didn't know at the time. Rui Pinto is in the news at the minute. If, you're fo if you like soccer, you will know that Manchester City, the football club, is in big trouble. They're in big trouble because of uh, financial, uh, financial payments which were allegedly um, uh, corrupt. Anyway, Rui gave us a whole lot of documents and we were able to uncover by working with reporters in 20 countries, that Isabel de Santos had got billions of dollars because her father was the uh, autocrat in Angola. As a consequence of that, uh, Isabel has had her assets frozen, uh, companies have, ha have gone out of business, uh, Isabel has been sanctioned by the US, people that worked with her by have been sanctioned. So there's one character, Isabel de Santos, once Africa's richest woman. Second, Solomon Karamov. Solomon Karamov came up again with Isabel in the Pandora Papers and the FinCEN files. The FinCEN files was, um, at, were we, were a tiny number of documents, only about 2,000. And as a result of those 2,000 documents, suspicious activity reports, we were able to show more than $2 trillion, trillion dollars of dark money flowing through Western banks. And amongst the people that were sending the money through the Western banks were Isabel Dos Santos and Solomon Karamov. And now the last project, Pandora Papers, the biggest one in history, 
who should pop up again? Isabel Dos Santos, mm. Solomon Karama. And so what you can see here is this huge system. It's a system that will do anything for short-sighted commercial considerations. It is a system of Western banks, Western lawyers, Western accountants, Western governments who enable the destruction of democracy in other countries. And what happened to Karamov after this was? Yeah, so Karamov is now in trouble. He's been sanctioned. Uh, some of the people who were sanctioned, so Kar there's an amazing story about Karamov. This is one of my favorite stories. So Karamov moved 700 million bucks that we could see in the FinCEN files and the Pandora Papers. Karamov is worth 30 billion, so 700 million is not a lot to him. But what was very amusing, it disamused us greatly, was one of the ways he moved the money, was 300 million bucks, he moved through a tattoo artist in Switzerland. The tattoo artist was friends with a guy called Alexander Studholter, who is a accountant in Switzerland. He lived in the same village as him, and uh, you will see him, if you go looking for him, you'll see him on his mountain bike covered in tattoos, Move, and he moved 300 million bucks. <laughs> and as a result, partly of what we've done, uh, Studholter has been sanctioned, Karamov is sanctioned. Um, so, you know, it is a crazy world. Yeah, and, and if you're following corruption, you're going to run into these characters. <laughs> and so part of, I think, the, uh, the challenge is to find the ones that can tell, that can symbolize the story. They don't have to, you know, you can get into a story in so many different ways, and uh, through people is probably the most effective, even though it's the system that you're really pointing to. Yeah. Okay, uh, Diane Francis has been at this for an awfully long time. So uh, can you tell us what you've learned about, or how you see the trend in journalism right now, and how difficult or easy or uh, welcoming these kind of um, corruption, anti-corruption investigations are. Yeah, just briefly a bit about my career. I, I hate to admit it, but I've been nearly 50 years a journalist. And uh, I was the editor-in-chief of the equivalent of the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Post in Canada. And Canada, when I immigrated there many years ago, was a, it was a dirty little place. Uh, it has a clean reputation. It's still one of the biggest, most powerful secrecy haven places in the world. In fact, the entire skyline of Toronto and Vancouver are built with dirty money. Hmm. And nothing gets done about it. So that aside, everybody's got the problem. But I've also written 10 books, four about white collar crime, ran a newspaper doing financial stuff, and was an investigative journalist. So I'm just going to give you some of the horror stories that have occurred, not just to me, but just are out there. And I really fear that, off Jack's point, that not only are prosecutors and legal systems inc incapable of pre preventing or deterring crime, but the fourth estate is also, also in that situation. And it's for, there, there's five issues involved here. Uh, number one, uh, with the exception of the Washington Post, the New York Times, and a handful of others, the business model for traditional newspapers and networks is imploding. That's the internet, it's imploding. And that's where all the really, that's where enough money was, was, was secured by journalistic organizations that could in, in, go after and do extensive investigative work. Nobody can afford this anymore. Uh, as I say, the newspapers are, were burning our furniture to stay alive. The uh, networks, the major networks, have also done some very good investigative things. They're going to be in trouble in 10 years because 60% of the American networks, for instance, uh, their revenues are based on covering live sporting events and all the teams are going to have their own streaming channels. So no more, no more money there. And the eyeballs are now on social media and the internet. And they don't do investigative reportage. And far worse, they print anything, they publish anything that, that comes to their heads or that they've been fed by the Russians or whoever. So the business model is imploding in those uh, institutions, private sector or public sector, uh, journalistic institutions that we were relying on and did some really fabulous work over the years. Uh, the second problem is the uh, weaponization and globalization of legal liability. So it doesn't matter where you publish, but if it's on the internet, 
I can say it was published in my country and I can take you to court in my, my banana republic and I can sue you there. Uh, first case I came across was, oh my God, I don't, I don't know how many years ago, but I think it was NBC did a piece on the dirty money in the Bahamas and they sideswiped General Westmoreland. Don't know why, maybe he was a director on a bank or whatever. So he sued. He sued in a U.S. court. And, you know, he didn't, sorry, he didn't bother to sue in a U.S. court because he was a public official and they were fair game, but not in Canada. And because Canadian eyeballs watched U.S. TV, NBC TV, he jurisdiction shopped, found a judge where we have very strict libel laws like the British do. Mm -hmm. And public, public, uh, there, there's no exemption for public officials. So he sued NBC in Toronto and got a settlement out of court. And this is going on, of course, everywhere. I think that was the first one to innovate that way. But now, as we all know, many, many cases end up in the British courts where libel laws are very tough. And so the Russian oligarchs, that's their favorite place to drag you. And they can drag you there even if you're not a British newspaper publication or website, just because some eyeballs in Britain saw them. And there you go. So that's a huge problem for, for uncovering the truth and, and investigative journalism. Um, the third problem is all of this means that it, you know, liability insurance is exorbitant for newspapers. That's another problem. It's out of reach for individual investigative journalists. Uh, I have a friend who was an author, wrote a book in Canada, big publisher. They abandoned her and she lost everything because she wrote a very hard hitting book about some crooks in Canada. And so, you know, there's no insurance for this and it, it became, becomes ruinous personally. I'm talking about white collar crime now. You know, if you're writing about real criminals like the Russians, you can get killed. But I'm talking about white collar crime. And they, they use that, that power, that money to weaponize the legal system that's most friendly to their case, or they bought. Um, I think that uh, the other, the other, the fifth issue is that if you do, as Jack said, if you do investigative journalism, even the Times or whoever, my goodness, the cost, the cost of curation, the cost of curation period is, is exorbitant as well as the lawyering. There were a couple of years when I was attacking the Vancouver Stock Exchange, which was a sewer until we closed it. I was attacking that regularly as the editor of Financial Post, and our legal counsel got paid more to read my stuff than I got paid to write it. <laughs> it's, it's expensive. It's a big overhead. So, so these are the things. Now, solutions. That's what we need and that's what we want. First of all, I think the work you do is part of the answer. You have to be internationally placed. You have many nodes. You have to have financial backing. You have to put yourself in an offshore jurisdiction, make yourself judgment proof. And you have to rely on other newspapers to amplify it. And you need lots of bodies to do all the legwork and the reading, 700,000 documents, and it's horrible. So this is what we need. We need more of these. And this is, this is one of the answers. The other thing we need is, in the United States, get rid of Section 230. Mm -hmm. They have ruined not only political discourse, but allowed hate and libel and threats and disinformation from the Russians to proliferate and swamp eyeballs. Because Section 230, Bill Clinton, thank you, exempted them from having to curate. They were exempted from liability for the content. And their argument was then and still is now, we're not publishers, we're platforms. Well, they're platforms who publish. And so nobody, nobody has been policing this. There's no responsibility to police themselves and there's no liability. And that has to go immediately. And that has to go globally. And so the result is social media just takes up everybody's minutes and time and headspace uh, with garbage and no curation required. So those are, those are the two solutions. Um, I don't mean to sound, you know, uh, even more depressing than we were already hearing today, but I think that our days are numbered of having, having reliance that works 
on a fourth estate as we now know it. So we have to come up with other models. There are other, of course, sneaky ways to do it. I used to be frustrated. Sometimes my lawyers wouldn't let me do something uh, uh, in print because, you know, we had to chase down documents, we didn't have time and so on, but it was timely. And so what I would do, which you can do in the parliamentary system in Canada, is uh, like the internet uh, in the United States, parliamentarians have complete immunity if they say something in the House. So I would leak to a member of parliament the scurrilous allegation I couldn't write about, but everybody in the press could report on once. And they would do it because A, they thought it was right, or B, they got attention. So you have to find your other ways to get out the news, and that's, that's a pretty pathetic thing to have to do, and, uh, and there, there was no curation necessarily involved. So that's my sad tale. I think we have to come up with new not-for-profit models. I think that uh, a lot of good journalism is done by foundations, and some think tanks, is, depends on who they take their money from, and this sort of thing, and I think that's very important. Okay, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> so obviously she's just made a grand pitch for nonprofit news and for funding of that, so all of you who represent foundations here, I'm sure you paid attention to that. It is, it is the future. Uh, and the, in the legal issue, we found that um, in our investigation of, uh, of Pegasus spyware that it did help our partners in who were operating in shaky democracies and even a couple authoritarian states to have these same stories published in the US because we gave them somewhat of a shield. Um, and so far we've been lucky in terms of, of lawsuits. So I have a, um, another question is, uh, can, you, can you describe how you, how you pitch a story to an editor and what you need? And I'm asking you this because sometimes people who are not in the media really don't quite get why you have to ask certain questions and, and why you need certain details that may seem ridiculous to pull out. And I'm doing this because as sources, it's really good, it's very effective if you can understand what we need because you're often closer to the material and can think about where, who is this per, you know, how can I personalize this? How can I give you information? How can I give you names of the little people involved in this problem? But how, what do you need to convince an editor to let you go forward with the story? That's a great question. I mean, at, at this stage, you know, I've been dealing with the same editors for a long time, so it's not much. You know, I yeah. have this idea, great, go for it. Um, but another way of looking at that question is there will be people who will, you know, I'll get pitches. Oh, I have a great story for you. Right. A great story. I'm like, okay, send me three sentences on it. You know, and if I get a page and a half, I know there's no story there. You know, it, it's a mess. But um, if, if there's something that you can, you know, break down and it's so specific, then you kind of know that that's the story. That's very different from a source coming up, hey, you know, this is happening. You might want to look into this. And you look in, then you go back to the source. But um, you know, it's really trust. So if someone's mm -hmm. new at this and starting out, they better have, you know, everything down. I think before they go to an editor. And when you've been in business for a long time, then it's really fun. It can be a collaboration. If you're lucky enough to have a good editor, you'll you'll um, have someone get you to ask questions you didn't think of yeah. asking and make something better. Um, so there's all sorts yeah. of ways. And um, Fergus, you're pitching to about a dozen editors at the same time. So uh, what ingredients do you need to uh, win them over? Yeah, so what, what we do is, uh, first of all, we consider an idea, then we conceptualize it, and then we retail it. So that's, it's very simple. So we, we sell an idea to hundreds of news organizations around the world and try to engage them in that, that idea. If they buy into the idea, they will give us reporters and then our team of reporters and editors will build that story and that story we will give to everyone for free and they will use it to influence their, our, uh, their own reporting. So where our bar is really quite high. So the first thing we look at Hardly any reporters look at this. I don't know why, it's a trick. So if you're a reporter here, here's the trick. You, you look for a broken system. If there's a broken system, you almost always have a story. Okay, but almost 
no reporters look for the broken system. Right? It's a really, mm. it should be a simple thing, but they don't. They don't look for it. So you don't look for, if somebody has a, buys a, a broken car, you know, through one of the websites, the car's not working, they have an issue that's personal. But if, if that website is selling thousands of cars that aren't working, that are being refurbished after storms, then you have a story. If those cars are being stole, sold across the world, you have a better story. So this is how we work. So what we do is we look for a broken system, a broken system that crosses borders. If we have a broken system that crosses borders, we're almost there. It has to be in the public interest. That's a very difficult test. And the last thing uh, that's really vital is there has to be a victim. If there's no victim, there's no point in doing the story. Excellent. Diane? Well, I, I've pitched for you. It has to be an elevator pitch. It has to be three graphs. It has to grab them right away has to be something none of their staff are doing and they have to have space for it. If it's investigative, nobody's going to take it on because of all the things I mentioned. Uh, as far as my own journalism, I mean, I write a syndicated column across Canada. I have a Substack newsletter. It's a shameless promotion. Uh, and that allows me to write uh, about a lot of different things that I'm interested in and not have to deal with uh, uh, copy editors who are very often, even in the major papers now, people that you're dealing with the first time, copy editors who, who are under 30 and think history was the last website they visited, could not recognize Reagan in a lineup. So, you know, this is what you're dealing with. So it's, it's very tricky as it, as it shrinks and deteriorates. It, it's very gloomy, but, but there are, as I say, uh, a lot of us writing on Substack. It, I supplement it to uh, what else I do. And the book business is also hard. Book publishers are very loath to take on something about the mafia or Russian. It's, it's a problem. Hmm. Okay. Yes. Speaking from that, um, one, just as a uh, Canadian, as a Torontonian, I totally agree with the problems and the landscape, the real estate there. Um, but two things about it's stories. It's called snow washing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you really need to build trust as a journalist with an editor. And if you have that, um, you can really still run with the story. Uh, saying that there are issues with oligarchs, different people, threats. I'm very lucky to work for a newspaper where we have really uh, been disdainful of certain threats. That was literally harassment. I've had a uh, publicist at one point uh, working for an oligarch calling literally one day every hour until my furious editor said this was harassment and my communication stopped and everything was referred to an editor who then referred it to the top editor and you know it's really great to have that support and I'm sure you felt that and it's a great thing. The other thing I wanted to say is that you can be, you know, I was fortunate enough to be on this the first panel maybe that was a Zoom panel for DC Forum. When I think somebody asked a question, you know, if you're not part of a great network like ICIJ, you don't have access, you're not working with, you know, journalists around the country, what can you do? And one example that came to mind was a blogger who lived in Brooklyn and walked by a house and it was covered in garbage. There was, you know, construction everywhere. It was just a disaster. No respect for neighbors, no respect, like construction that started and stopped. So this young blogger did some digging. Well, the owner was Paul Manafort. And, you know, this was I right during that. 2015, you know, right before an election. He was very much in the public eye. Um, I wrote about it. I picked it up from the blogger. He called me on the phone. It's <laughs> very, very interesting <laughs> conversation. But, you know, you can be anywhere and right, see something that looks funny, and all you have to do is start asking questions. You know, even if there are LLCs and, you know, there's still ways, sometimes there aren't, but sometimes there are ways to find yeah. out what's really going on. So you're making me think of a, <clears throat> uh, a haven for LLCs and offshore money, which is the state of Delaware. And why is it, do you think, that given that we have a former senator from Delaware as our president now, that we haven't paid more attention to Delaware and what or what he hasn't done to stop that. 
if he cares about money laundering and, and good question. The superstar, of course, is South Dakota. Right, but Delaware has been at it for so law, long. And with tr no, about a few years ago, they passed this law for trusts, anonymous trusts, and tax-free. And they've gone from zero dollars to half a trillion dollars mm -hmm. under management there. Yeah. Half a billion, sorry. Fergus, has, have you ever looked at uh, South yeah, Dakota? We did, we did a whole project on it around it. So as part of Pandora, one of the stories we looked at was trusts. And we looked at trusts in Delaware and, and trusts in South Dakota and Alaska. And, um, yeah, trusts are a huge problem, a massive problem, because again, it goes to that question of short-term uh, commercial interest um, against the interests of the world. And so the, the promise of trusts for Place, states like South Dakota and Delaware and Alaska is that it will give you jobs. So that's the promise. They, 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 when, when it comes in, um, when, one lawyer conceptualized the South Dakota industry and, when, and the promise was we will, we will, we will create wealth in, beyond cattle in your, in your state and you will get a job and you will have a, a lawyers and accountants and they, they will make a lot of money and the state will get more prosperous. The reality is the state hasn't got more prosperous the reality is, is there's been a, a, a huge disappointment. And I think in part the answer to trust is, um, is a, a public relations campaign to say, look, the price you're paying here is just far too high. Mm -hmm. You've sold your souls for um, little return. Um, but it also goes to the Enablers Act, which in part flowed from some of the work we did. And really, um, you have to tackle lawyers and accountants. You just you know, I know the American Bar Association is fighting tooth and nail to stop um, any sort of um, uh, responsibility in this area. But unless you tackle lawyers and accountants, you cannot stop it. I mean, Isabel de Santos moved money mm -hmm. through 400 companies, through 49 offshore um, jurisdictions, uh, billions of dollars that were stolen from the Angolan people, some of the poorest people on the planet. And she did it because of lawyers and accountants. Solomon Karamov is able to move it. Um, I know there's been a lot of talk about Russia, but we should also talk about Ukrainian corruption. Ukraine is a very corrupt country, and one of the, one of the um, most corrupt figures there was sanctioned the other day, and he's moved money through steel mills in Ohio. And so one of the dangers of the war in Ukraine and the, 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 the push to get behind it to to resist the awfulness of the Russian system is that we will enable Ukrainian corruption, which is very substantial. And um, mm -hmm. um, anyway. Yep. So I'm going to tell my one Ukrainian corruption story. Oh, and then take questions. Sorry. I was uh, <clears throat> in Kiev for a um, PBS Frontline documentary, staying at a mid level hotel. And we were in the lobby, and a big car come, uh, Escalade pulls up. And five guys with Uzis jump out, and a little guy in basketball silks walk in, who he's protecting, who they're protecting. And he goes into the corner, and they surround him. And he sits down. And someone comes over, and so I went up to the the uh, desk and just very casually said, "Hmm, what's going on?" And he said, "Don't worry, he's Ukrainian." <laughs> I thought, okay, that makes me comfortable. Okay, a couple of questions. We've got two minutes left. Then. Two minutes left. Okay. Uh, Yes, Frank. My name is Frank Vogel. Uh, very quick, two, two, point, two questions, same, same issue. Protecting journalists. Uh, most of the anti-corruption investigative journalism is done actually in many foreign countries, not by American journalists. Many of those journalists are either getting harassed, killed, whatever. Your view on how can we do more to protect them. Second point, also protecting journalists. A couple of days ago, the Swiss justice authorities announced they're investigating the leaks behind the, uh, the Swiss leaks uh, story uh, that revealed massive dirty money accounts at Credit Suisse. The Swiss banking and justice authorities said they would not be investigating Credit Suisse. They're going after the journalists who published the story. How do we change that and protect journalists. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to take the first part of that and give you the example of Maria Ressa in the Philippines, who, who uh, unearthed the complex network of disinformation, um, 
people linked to Duterte, who then sued her um, dozens of lawsuits threatening years in prison, and she, with, she withstood this for almost a decade. Uh, and the, the reason why she never got, I think, killed or put in prison was the attention that the other media gave to her and the Nobel Peace Committee finally. But attention, attention is really the issue. And I wanna say that at least at the Post, we are finally paying attention to our colleagues around the world who are in trouble all the time and have no recourse and no protection other than to ask for exile in, in our various countries. Uh, this We're out of time, okay. actually. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, my name is Rachel Rizzo. I'm a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council's Europe Center. I am thrilled to have with us today for a fireside chat, the UK's Minister of State for Security, Mr. Tom Tugendhat. Uh, Minister, thank you so much for being with us today. Very nice to see you. Um, I will give you the microphone in just one second. I know you have to be in a car at 1 p.m., which is why we're starting a few minutes early. So. Um, Please continue to, to eat your lunch while at the same time focusing on what will be a fascinating conversation, I'm sure. So I wanted to hop right into it and sort of build off the conversations we've been having this morning. Um, so let's start by talking a little bit about the intersection of illicit finance and the disintegration of democracy. I think over the last decade, we've seen a degradation of trust uh, between the governments and institutions of democratic countries and the people and citizens uh, which those institutions are supposed to serve. And when the selling point for many leaders is democracy, uh, it becomes really difficult because a lot of people look at this as something that doesn't work for them. Um, there was an interesting Pew Research Center survey that was released in 2019 of 27 democracies around the world and it showed not only high and growing levels of dissatisfaction in most of the countries surveyed, but a weak, a weak rule of law as a prominent factor in this. Uh, I know this is something that you've thought a lot about, so I'd be curious as to your opinion on not only if but how corruption, illicit financial flows, and hidden money plays into the health of democracy today. Rachel, thank you very much indeed for the welcome. This is exactly why I got into politics. <clears throat> I, I remember very vividly my time uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan seeing two extraordinarily tragically failed states. They weren't alone. They were particularly dramatically failed, but they were really strong examples of what happens when the rule of law, when the ability of a society to talk to itself, when the ability of individuals to act cooperatively falls apart. Now, the challenge for all of us is how do we stop the erosion a long, long time before we get anywhere near that level? And we're lucky, we're blessed in the United States, in the United Kingdom, that we have such deep wells of traditional norms, the rule of law that allows people to predict the future in ways that other countries really struggle with. That means that we are, or at least we feel, isolated and insulated from those forces. But the truth is, of course, we aren't. That democracy in our own countries can feel under pressure and it can challenge the legitimacy of the states that we rely on for our future security. And we've seen in the US various pressures in recent years. We've seen in the UK various pressures in recent years. And these various different elements are what inspired the UK government under Prime Minister Sunak to set up the Defending Democracy Task Force, which I chair, and why we're taking illicit finance so seriously. Because exactly the reason that Raymond sets out in secret money and the reason that you set up this global financial initiative was to address exactly as you put it Rachel the deficit of trust that can arise when people see the reality of secrecy where there should only be privacy and where they see the unaccountability of different movements now we're at a very very early stage in this and we have 
absolutely the ability to respond and defend ourselves against it. But we shouldn't pretend that communities like ours can't have problems from this. We know that in some communities not dissimilar to ours, this perception between secret money, unaccountable power, has led to conspiracy theories and sadly to pogroms and mass murders, uh, as sadly the history of Europe spells out over the last century or two. So this is a very serious issue. It's one that I think all politicians need to take uh, rather more uh, seriously than many do. Uh, and this is an area where I think we have a lot to do together. Absolutely. So sort of building on those comments, obviously the UK is one of the largest economies in the world. It makes it an attractive place for legitimate business, but that also means it's an attractive place for illicit business. Um, obviously this issue has been in the headlines this year because of the war in Ukraine, because of Western sanctions and the crackdown, or at least attempted crackdown, on illicit funds and cash flows and kleptocrats and oligarchs. So in light of the war and the fact that Russian kleptocrats are in the news, um, what are the specific ways that the UK and you are, are addressing this? You mentioned the Dem Defending Democracy Task Force. What does that look like and what more are, are you gonna be focusing on and doing? Sure, so let's start off with a few things that we've already done. We've already sanctioned more than 100 individuals. We've already frozen quite literally billions of pounds worth of assets. We've worked with friends and partners uh, in the European Union, in the United States, and many other countries to make sure that these sanctions don't just apply in the UK, but actually apply uh, almost globally. They don't quite apply to countries like Russia, but they apply as widely as we can get them. And that's made already a huge difference. And there's a lot of work to do to transfer, to translate freezing into seizing. That's difficult. Um, nobody's yet found uh, the correct legal answer. Uh, and there's a lot more work to do, but that is something that a lot of us are talking about. And it's something that Prime Minister Sunak is, is committed to exploring as well. So you know, I, have a, I have very strong backing to, to try and get there in the UK system, though I admit it is difficult. That's the first stage. The second stage is what we're doing legislatively. If you look at the UK Parliament today, one of the acts that we're passing is the Economic Crime and Corporate Transparency Bill. Now, that is game-changing in the way that we're addressing uh, dirty money in our own system and hidden money that could be uh, moving through our system. Now, there's many things that we've already done, the Register of Overseas uh, equities that we've, uh, entities, sorry, that we've already uh, brought in. That should, I think it was the end of January was the deadline for registration. And now we're getting into the process of uh, looking at who needs to possibly be sanctioned in various different ways in order to uh, encourage them to act a little bit quicker. Um, but what the Economic Crime Bill is setting out is uh, taking this even further. But of course, you know, you're quite right to say that the UK is one of the largest economies, and it, you know, we're very proud to be so. But we're not the only one. There are many other economies uh, around the world, the United States being even larger than ours, uh, who uh, I know take many of their responsibilities extremely seriously, but with all of us, there's a bit further we can go. Absolutely. There was one interesting issue from last year was this uh, Tier 1 investor yeah. visa that the UK has cracked down on. This is basically a way for foreign investors who uh, spent, I think it was at least two million pounds in, in the UK, offered them fast track for, for residency. And obviously that was a program that was massively exploited by, by, by Russians. And so what sort of work are you doing on both this and other sort of citizen-based investment schemes? So citizenship by investment is a, is a principle that has uh, well, it became popular sort of over the last 20, 30 years, and many different jurisdictions have introduced them. I'm not quite sure whether, how it works in the United States, but certainly many jurisdictions have introduced them in various different ways. And we found that it was so open to abuse that we had to stop it. And so we've closed down tier one visas, uh, and we're uh, going through the process of making sure that none of those uh, loopholes are left within our existing uh, visa regime, because that is clearly an opening. Sadly, that means that we've got to look at some other jurisdictions because, as you know, there are some places that have visa waivers with the United Kingdom, probably with the United States as well, who are offering, effectively, this loophole. We simply cannot have visa waivers 
with backdoor economies. It just doesn't work. Now, I don't know about you, but whenever I fly in, I flew in here yesterday, you'll see in in-flight magazines uh, various different legal entities offering various different citizenship by investment offers. Uh, the island of Dominica was uh, one of the ones that appeared in uh, the in-flight magazine. Um, and all I can say is that's a visa regime that needs looking at. Interesting. You mentioned flying here to the, to the US yesterday. We're having this conversation in Washington. Uh, these are issues that we're trying to tackle here at home. We've had a lot of conversations earlier today about things like beneficial ownership and, and real estate investments. Um, but it also seems like maybe information sharing between allies it isn't the level that it should be. Um, so what are some of the hindrances you see to deeper cooperation, say, between the UK and the US on, on these issues? And what mechanisms um, are we working on or should we be working on together? So the, the first thing to say is we do share a lot of information already. So this is not starting from a position of zero. It's starting from a position of very high trust between our different jurisdictions. But there's always more that we can do. And the reality is if you look at uh, the way that our systems are structured, they're much more structured for domestic enforcement, for tax enforcement at home, quite understandably, than they are for global cooperation. Now, that's obviously uh, historically where you would start. Of course, of course, your uh, treasury, funnily enough, does want to raise taxes off the American people in order to pay for whatever it is that your government votes for. And funnily enough, His Majesty's Treasury wants to do rather the same thing uh, in the UK. But we do need to look at this in a different way, not just as a form of tax collection, but also a form of national security. Because the reality is what we could be seeing in the ways in which corporate structures are raised is not uh, what it should be, a legal vehicle for the sharing of risk and the future profit, which is a healthy corporate structure. But instead, in some cases, we're seeing it as a way of disguising illicit activity, the exploitation of some of the world's poorest and most vulnerable, and indeed the corruption and erosion of the rule of law in jurisdictions like our own. Absolutely. Um, one of the conversations that we've been having um, in the US and the UK and Europe about the ongoing war in Ukraine is how this translates into uh, the public sphere the role that citizens play and the role of, or how important it is, should I say, uh, to talk about this openly with uh, members of society, to talk about why it's so important that we uh, continue to support Ukraine. I would ask this question on these same issues when it comes to things like anti-money laundering and transparency. How important is it for the public to really understand how this works, and how do you focus on sort of translating these issues into, into citizens of, of the United Kingdom? So I think it's hugely important. I mean, let's not forget who I work for. Um, I, I don't work for the Prime Minister. I don't work for the Home Office. I work for the British people. They are my direct and immediate employers, and it is my responsibility not just to do what I can to advance their interests, but also to explain what I'm doing uh, in order to maintain the legitimacy of the actions we have. And I think that's just true of every democracy. Now, what we haven't always done as well as we should is explain why these things matter. It can sound somewhat esoteric to pass beneficial ownership laws or to require the registration of uh, overseas entities or whatever it happens to be. It's not. It's fundamentally about uh, the individual prosperity and liberty of British citizens and by association, Americans, French, Germans, and whatever else. Because if we get this right, what we're doing is we're ensuring that the tax base is legitimate, we're ensuring that the uh, structure of our societies is open and free, and that what people are able to do is to collect together, to share risk, to advance ideas and, 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 and pursue innovation in ways that actually does defend their future. If we get it wrong, and I'm afraid this is where Ukraine in the past demonstrated this failure, you end up with the erosion of the rule of law and the rise of the oligarchical societies that sadly threatens democracy. Now, one of the reasons I'm so impressed with President Zelensky's leadership, I mean, he's truly one of the world's great leaders, is not just the obvious war leadership that he's demonstrating, which is frankly heroic to a point that I don't think we uh, have seen in 70, 80 years. 
but it's also his leadership in peace. I don't know if you've been following the news recently, but he's been taking anti-corruption uh, principles very seriously in Ukraine. Now, this is a country, as we know, that is currently at war, that currently has large areas of its territory occupied, and yet he's not resting on that. He's realizing that in order to win the war, he needs to prepare to win the peace as well. And he cannot simply wait until the war is done to deal with corruption at home. And I have to say, what he's demonstrating as well is that if you want to have accountability, if you want to have a national effort that really works as a whole nation effort against an occupier like Russia, you need to make sure that you're standing up for the principles that unite a nation too. And that's why I think the anti-corruption work that he's done and that he's doing, the arrests that he's made, are so fundamentally important, not just to him, but actually to all of us. Absolutely. To, I know you have to be in the car in just about 10 minutes. So final question here. Um, it sort of seems, so I think it was David Kramer earlier that made a really good point where you said, the more corrupt Russia becomes, the, the, more, <laughs> the more authoritarian it, be, it becomes. Um, I think that was you that said that. And, and, and so I wanted to build on that comment a little bit. Um, it seems like this is a bit of a cat and mouse game where autocrats and kleptocrats seem to always find a way to game the system and exploit the weaknesses in how democracies are trying to tackle these issues. Now you've obviously laid out a whole host of ways that you're trying to sort of close the gaps here. Um, but why is it that we always seem to be one step behind? Do you think that we seem to be one step behind? And how do we get one step ahead? So I, I don't, to be fair, I don't think we are one step behind. I think the nature of, uh, the nature of human existence is that people who are trying to steal will always find gaps. But the reality is our democracies are extremely resilient. And that's why we're seeing, sadly, uh, these corrupt entities trying to um, exploit them by investing in them in an odd way. They're actually doing, they're not trying to spread corruption to the UK, they're trying to hide their money in the UK so that they can be corrupt at home. The effect of that is to spread corruption. But it's absolutely the nature of all dictatorial societies to go towards corruption because the moment you're in a dictatorship is because you've eroded the rule of law. You can't be a dictator. You can't be a tyrant in Beijing or in Moscow uh, unless you've eroded the rule of law. It doesn't work because the moment you have the rule of law, you have property rights, you erode the power of the state and so on. So any dictatorship, whether it's China or Russia or North Korea or Iran, is by definition a lawless state. What follows once you have a lawless state is absolutely automatic. It's absolutely inevitable. It's the rule of force. Because if you cannot predict the future in the basic algorithm of human existence, which is the rule of law, and the rule of law is, after all, you can dress it up as what you like, but it's a, it's a very, very simple concept. It's an ability to say, if this, then that, which is all that an algorithm is. It's all that it is. It's the most basic human algorithm. It's a way of predicting the future through a very basic concept. If you can't predict the future by agreement, the only other way to predict the future is by force. And all human beings want to have some ability to predict the future, to make sure that their children will inherit some of their wealth, to make sure that their ability to wake up tomorrow is not interrupted by some wandering Viking tribe, as it happens so far too often in Kent. Um, <laughs> And indeed, you know, to make sure that um, the investment they've made into whatever corporate entity they made re returns a return. Uh, and so that ability, that base ability to predict the future is what we're all trying to do. We have two ways of doing it. One, we agree the principles that we're going to share. We call that the rule of law. Or we don't. We call it the rule of force. And I'm afraid every dictatorship inherently ends up with the rule of force. And that's what we're seeing out of Russia today. That's why we're seeing, uh, an, uh, you know, if you look at the move from the 1990s where democracy tried and failed to where we are today, we've seen an exaggeration in the rule of force because at every step the rule of law has been eroded more and more and more and therefore force has been required. A, a good note to end on. <laughs> um, maybe not happy, but uh, a, a powerful message for, for everyone here. Well, there is a happy note, yes. which is that it inherently fails. That is the happy note. 
Good. <laughs> Minister Tugendhat, thank you so much for being with us today. Hi, everybody. This is Drew Sullivan from the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project. Sorry I could not be with you um, uh, this week in Washington. I'm out in California doing some work, um, but I thought I would uh, uh, call in and, and give you a quick talk on organized crime and um, their, their ability to do things beyond what people think they're willing to. You know, back in 1989, there was kind of this perfect storm where the Berlin Wall fell, the internet started to come around, and the, there was a rise of the offshore industry that started getting more active and the hedge fund industry. And that really led to this kind of perfect storm with globalized organized crime and corruption and built this giant kind of enabler industry worldwide. We're still living in that world. But what a lot of people don't know is the kind of people who came out of that, the, the types of organized crime figures that are out there. You know, these people are worth tens of billions of dollars, maybe even hundreds of billions of dollars. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about them and, and their audacity and how they do things. Um, so let's, let's play a little thought exercise here. Let's pretend I'm an organized crime figure and I've earned a couple billion dollars from drug trafficking, um, which is you know, a typical number of a, of a, a good regional drug trafficker. Um, and I've got a couple billion dollars and I'm an audacious thinker. You know, what do I do with that money? How, how might I uh, exploit that money to my advantage? Well, the first thing I'm going to have is lawyers. You got to have good lawyers. You have lawyers in London. You have lawyers in New York. And those people are really valuable to you because they not only protect you from lawsuits, but they also help you, enable you to do all these types of things that you're doing. They enable you in your crime. They, they set up things for money laundering. They set up all the offshore companies that you need to hide your assets. Um, they do all this kind of work. Um, that really keeps that crime thing going. You know, you, you're able to, to set up more and more firms so you can self-deal, you can innovate taxes, and you can embezzle funds, and you can bribe people with these offshores. So the lawyers are really important. Um, but, you know, if you're thinking big, you need to think beyond that. And so uh, you want to have some politicians in your pocket or maybe some law enforcement. Um, so where do you get those? Well, the nice thing about the United States is you have all these lobbyists that you can go to, Roger Stone, Tony Podesta, those kind of people, not very ethically oriented and willing to do what you need to for the right price. And so these people can help you make connections to all, all the types of, lawyer, of, of politicians that you need to, to know, the kind of politicians who are willing to do business with you. Um, and they'll also set up um, business with um, other types of people that you should know. You know, that guy doing the Russian money and that libertarian billionaire and those other people. And so, you know, they've really helped build this kind of, you know, mutual um, a team of billionaires and, and Russian money and, um, you know, plutocratic money and organized crime that has really kind of helped feed a lot of the political action that's been going on in many of these places, such as Brexit and UK and and other things in the United States. So I want to join that group and I want power and I want a couple of politicians in my pocket. And of course, you know, you can do that in America because you can put money into a super PAC. And so I might put three or $4 million in the super PAC of a politician that I particularly like. And I know I can get them to meet with me anytime. And I know that they will take everything I say seriously and try to do it. So I can get laws passed and I can get you know, potentially somebody coming in and asking about an SEC or an IRS investigation to kind of put pressure on people to say, you know, you really shouldn't be doing this. So that's what I really need. You need political protection or Krisha, as we say in Russia, for a roof um, to give you that kind of protection. You need more. You need media. You need some people saying great things about you. Well, media is pretty cheap. It's a poor industry. And you can find that you can hire individual journalists and pacing, place uh, ads or I'm sorry, stories in, in newspapers, especially some of the online ones. But, you know, there are whole organizations that are fairly corrupt and you can get them actually working for you during the course of the year. So you pay them a few million dollars in some fake advertising deal and you've got your own media organization. And a lot of these media parody each other, especially when they're in the right. And I will firmly be in the right hand side of the political base. So next, I need some pressure. I need some people that can get stuff done um, when I need something done. And that's often, um, you know, if I was in Europe, I'd be hiring hooligans. Um, in the United States, it's extremist parties. You get your supremacists, you get your white nationalists, you get your skinheads, and you can hire those people and they can come up and they can beat up people when you need them. You know, if there's a protest going outside your headquarters, some people come in and beat up people and you got that kind of muscle that you need. So you're discouraging other people from doing stuff to you. Um, then I'm going to lay out a large number of bribes. I'm going to lay out bribes to media, um, you know, other politicians, uh, people in the administration, law enforcement, 
you know, we know organized crime people who have heads of intelligent units, um, you know, uh, heads of police, all in their pocket. And you'd be surprised how cheap people are. $30,000 goes a long, long way in bribes. And that's the most effective way that, for instance, Russia gets what they want. You see all those people parroting Russian stuff. Many of them have been bribed. Um, so consequently, I'm going to bribe a lot of people, and that's not going to cost me a whole lot of money. Uh, the next thing I need is I need a troll army. I could get that. There's plenty of you know, Cambridge Analytica, Analytica lookalike firms that are out there that I can hire. You know, uh, I, I'm going to probably need a murder squad because I might want to really get rid of some people. Maybe, a, you know, a crusty prosecutor is causing me problems. Um, you know, murder squad is fairly easy to find. You talk to your, you know, you're in organized crime. You know, you know a lot of other organized crime people, but it's about a million dollars to, to kill somebody. Uh, not that much. In some cases, it's as low as 50000 to kill journalists. We're always cheaper. Um, and so consequently, you could use that. And that's a really powerful tool. Um, and the thing you have to think about, you know, you're saying, no, this is extreme, but this is not. This is the way these people think. You know, their word for you, you and me, the people who are just kind of regular citizens, is victim. Um, they use the term victim to refer to us. They may have $2 billion in the bank, or in some nice American hedge fund, you know, you know, fronted by some blue blood Harvard guy. Um, but the rules don't apply to them. They'll they'll have all that, but they'll still drive a stolen car. They'll be a eligible bachelor, but they'll still have trafficked women that they use. And so none of the rules apply. That's a sign of weakness. Um, they they're too strong. They've moved outside the system. The system applies to you, not them. You're the sheep in the system. But you have to think of them as. These are people like Elon Musk and that type of thinking, but they can kill. I'm Drew Sullivan. Uh, thanks for taking the time. Uh, we knew Drew would be would uh, uh, tell a story, pulling it all together. That was what he uh, said he was going to do. And Drew actually used to be a stand-up comic early in his career, which some of you may not know. And uh, so we're, we're sorry not to have him actually here because then he would have sort of really let loose, um, but hopefully he'll be at the next DC forum. Uh, so we are going to pick up uh, from uh, uh, Raymond Baker in a sense and the remarks about capitalism this morning, going more directly at that subject. And I'd like to mention again, something rather distressing, which is I see a lot of books still on the table that are not for sale. And uh, we hope that everyone walks out of here with at least one. Uh, so uh, uh, we'll, we'll keep an eye on that. Um, this is going to be a little bit of a, a untraditional panel. I don't know whether we should call it a panel because we do hope to take Q&A, but that depends how long they go. So they're each going to make a, a little speech um, approaching capitalism from different angles. It's sort of, this is gonna be a military operation, the left flank, the right flank, the frontal attack kind of. Uh, and then uh, we will see what questions you may have to tie it all together if they leave us time. Uh, so we'll see. And we're gonna start off uh, with Nils. Great, is my mic working? Great, uh, thank you so much for having us and thank you so much, so much for organizing this, Charles and everybody else who's been involved in this. Um, so my name is Nils Gilman. I'm currently working as a senior vice president of programs at uh, an institute in Los Angeles called the Bruin Institute. Uh, I think the reason I'm here though is not so much because of the work I do there, which I'd be happy to talk to any of you about later, um, but because of work I was doing about 10 years ago on uh, which eventually culminated in a book that was titled Deviant Globalization. And it was looking really at the ways in which the facilities of globalization that have emerged over the last 40 years are not used only by licit actors. We normally think of globalization as being about the free flow of goods, services, uh, money, people all over the world. And of course, all of those things have a dark side mirror image, right? So there's the global flow of bads, whether it's garbage or e-waste or what have you. There's all sorts of illicit services of the sorts we've been talking about today. Um, there's human trafficking, which is the flip side of, uh, of immigration um, and so on and so forth. Um, and as I was doing that work, um, I really started to be interested as a historian, which is my background, in where this system came from and why we allowed this globalization of crime to grow up over the last 40 years. Uh, and what I realized is that actually the things we're talking about in this room are one of the linchpins of it. Uh, we were talking this morning about um, uh, 
the money laundering and illicit use of finance. Um, but we're also talking this morning, I think it was, um, it was Jack Blum who was talking about this, about how these same services are used by uh, elites who don't think of themselves as criminals. Um, and in fact, the, the, the Venn diagram of firms and institutes doing illicit, illicit finance and ones doing illicit finance is actually almost a perfect circle. And there's some people maybe who are really good and don't do bad things or some organizations that do, that do that, but it's really almost a complete overlap. And I wanna suggest that that actually proposes or presents a challenge to us from a policy perspective. Um, as Raymond Baker suggested this morning, the US, and by the US I mean here, rich Americans, corporations, and I have to say intelligence agencies are the biggest users of this kind of system that we've been discussing today. Um, and until we recognize and look squarely in the eye, the fact that there are many beneficiaries, very powerful beneficiaries of this system in the United States, I don't think we can begin to develop a political strategy to really take this on. So I guess that's um, the first point I would make. Um, the second point, and this is something that both uh, James Henry and Jack Lum were also saying, is that we're in a system where there is a tremendous amount of elite impunity. I have to say I'm a little bit skeptical of some of the ideas that have been put forth today that like transparency is gonna solve these problems because there's lots of people out there who feel like what they're doing is perfectly fine and they don't, and they have, you know, they're fairly shameless about what, they, what they're engaged in. Um, and they're interested in protecting their interests on that rather than in apologizing or being shamed in anything. We live in a shameless age. Um, this town has been taken over by shamelessness over the last 10 years in particular. I think we need to confront that directly about what that means about a political strategy for effectively taking that on. Um, so a second point that might throw some sand in the ointment of what things we've been discussing here. When I wrote that book, Deviant Globalization, the basic methodology was to look at a whole bunch of different illicit industries. We looked at money laundering and illicit finance, but we also looked at human trafficking. We looked at drug dealing. We looked at gun running. We looked at antiquity smuggling, wildlife smuggling. Uh, and then we tried to basically do an assessment of the structure of these industries. And it turned out, and also which kinds of um, abatement efforts have been effective historically against and addressing these different things. And one of the major takeaways I came away from doing that study was that no illicit industry has ever been abated from the supply side alone. I'm all in favor of passing the enablers law um, and trying to stop uh, the various service providers to the illicit finance, uh, to, uh, to illicit actors and bad actors, but there's almost an endless supply of enablers in the same way that there's an almost endless supply of street level drug dealers. But it's not just that there's an endless supply of street level drug dealers. It's also that even at the top levels, um, if you were to start taking out the elites within these banks and within these law firms who were doing this, there's always more people who are willing to do that. Um, we could send um, Tijan uh, Tiam, who's the CEO of Credit Suisse, or Kristen Suing, who's the head of Deutsche Bank, or Jamie Dimon um, to jail, but this won't, I don't think, stop the things that we're seeing going on any more than taking out El Chapo stopped drug trafficking from the United States or put the narcotics industry out of business. I mean, there is almost an endless supply of people who are willing to do this given the stakes and the money that's involved. Um, historically, if you look at the systems that have been effective for cracking down on illicit activities, um, things that we morally disapprove of for one reason or another, you have to go after the end users. I'll give two examples, both of which are, you know, show you the draconian level of things that might take place. You know, China in 1949, something like 25% of all the men were opium addicted. And Mao decided he was gonna get rid of the opium problem. And he told everybody they had to take the cure and if they couldn't get the cure, he was gonna execute them. And estimates are that about, two, you know, most people took the cure and about 200,000 people were, ended up being executed in China. Now, I'm not at all proposing that that's the solution we should have to drug, to, to drug addiction, but it's, it is a solution. I mean, by the mid 1950s, there were hardly any drug addicts left in China. So that, that's actually an effective way. He also went after the triads that were supplying uh, the, the drugs to, uh, to China, but fundamentally you have to go after the demand side. Well, that could make for an interesting amendment to the Enablers Act, perhaps. Yeah. It could. Sorry, sorry to interrupt now. Um, another example, uh, much more proximate to us, is antiquity smuggling. There's been a huge amount of antiquity smuggling over the last you know, 20 years, particularly uh, in the wake of the Iraq war where there's so many, you know, the Iraqi National Museum was looted, but also so many of the archeological sites throughout the Middle East, it's been in this condition of chaos. Who's buying all those things? Well, it's art collectors all over the world. One of the most effective ways that shut to, to drive the shutdown of the antiquity smuggling business was the prosecution of Marion True, who was the head of acquisitions for the Getty. Getty is obviously the number one buyer for antiquities in the world and going after the number one buyer put a chill on the whole market because rich people who collect art 
They may really want these antiquities, but they don't really want to go to jail. When they saw one of their own go to jail on the demand side, that radically decreased the demand for these things. It didn't drive it to zero, but it was really effective in really reducing the demand for smuggled antiquities. Um, so I just think we should also think about the uh, about you know the demand side for these things, and this goes back to the point that Raymond Baker was making, which is the demand side for these things are often very rich and powerful people here in the United States. Um, all right, I'll make one third point, and I, I won't filibuster for too long because I know we want to have Q and A. Um, the, hist the history of this stuff, um, this system of capitalism that we're operating under. Somebody used the word neoliberalism this morning. I don't always love that label, but it basically emerges in the 1970s. There's a bunch of different things that happen at that point. A lot of it is about sort of states getting out of direct interventions into the economy. I think that that's changing right now. So for those of you who watched the State of the Union last night, you'll see that Biden is definitely pushing for industrial strategy in a way that hasn't been done since the 1970s. But the key thing for this group is that another thing that happened in the early 1970s is we moved from a system of the Bretton Woods system of fixed exchange rates and capital controls to a system of floating exchange rates um, and, and free flows of capital. Um, and once that started taking place, it, ma it massively increased the speed and volatility of financial flows all over the world and started to create the conditions for the money laundering and other kinds of illicit finance that we've been discussing here today. Um, I think as we're moving out of this world that we've been in since the 1970s towards some kind of a new system, and I really do believe that we're moving it towards that, we can debate, uh, have to take questions about what that new world would look like, we should be rethinking some of our assumptions about the way in which international finance necessarily has to work. We've been assuming it has to work the way it's been working since the 1970s, and it doesn't necessarily have to work that way. Last point on this. Illicit finance was at the heart of the transformation that led to the floating exchange rates of the, 19, of the 1970s. Um, it was in the 1960s that the euro dollar market began to emerge in, in, uh, in Europe, basically, first of all, in the UK. Basically, banks in London started creating, allowing clients to open dollar-based accounts. And this was explicitly a regulatory arbitrage move to get away from financial services regulations in the United States. The euro market, there was a lot of reasons that that grew up. There was a lot of demand for these kinds of services, but people wanted to be able to put their money away in dollars, but outside the scrutiny of the regulatory systems that were here in the United States in the 1960s. Illicit finance has been at the foundation of the motivation to build the financial system we have right now. It's not coincident to it. It's not just a bad actor thing. It is fundamental and core to the design of the system. And again, unless we confront the fact that this is a systemic problem and that it's got deep historical roots and huge powerful backers, I don't think we can have an effective political strategy for addressing it. I'll stop there. Wonderful. Diane? Yes, my turn. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I think uh, Raymond's book was, it was terrific. It's very important. And uh, obviously we, we now know better that you know, not only democracy and uh, capitalism is at risk as a result of secrecy and corruption, but so is global security. And exhibit A is Ukraine. And I wanna give you a little bit of background that people may not be aware of, but we're all, we're all finally able to spell it and find it on a map. And uh, I've been going there for 30 years, uh, since 1992, when it first became independent. And it was just a sleepy kind of agrarian with some industrialization, uh, large country, the size of France and Germany, bigger than Germany and France, with a lot of people and, and an educated group of people. And at the same time, of course, what Russia was doing was uh, becoming an oligarchy. And uh, so what Russia has done is create the world's most powerful oligarchy by, and they did it simply, by getting control over a country with the greatest resource endowment in history anywhere, and then stealing it, stealing title to it, and then skimming from the ongoing operating profit. And Ukraine was an intrinsic part of this scheme which is why I would say probably Putin, if you add up all the, the ill-gotten gains in the hands of his cronies, is a trillionaire. And it sounds crazy, but this is how they did it. Very simple scheme. They, um, and by the way, the, I described this in 2015 in an Atlantic Council piece I did, white paper I did called Stolen Future. It's still available online. 
So you had oil and gas in, in Russia and you had European customers and connecting them was a pipeline, pipelines, many pipelines through Ukraine. When Ukraine went independent, that was a bit of an issue. So they wanted to protect the fact they had the transportation, nobody getting uppity, no nonsense, no skimming. So they started to skim it themselves. And so what they did was they set up an offshore trading entity in Cyprus and the Gazprom executives and Putin and his guys would skim all of the money that they could, and it was sizable from the revenues that were going through the Ukrainian pipeline. And they didn't have to control Ukraine militarily. They did it through carrots by co-opting. So also in on this skim was every president Ukraine had, most of the politicians. And then they also had co-opted with this massive skim of all the oil and gas that went to Europe for 30 years, they co-opted Ukrainian oligarchs. Ukraines want their old, they wanted their own oligarchs. So that's fine, they got them, but they were mostly in partnership and still are with the Russian oligarchs. And this arrangement of oligarchs in Ukraine started in 1995. And basically the president of that day uh, carved up all of the national assets as they did in, in, in Moscow. And he handed it out to five guys. And then they handed it out to some others. So Ukraine, yes, it was had corruption, but it had it has spent 30 years trying to get out from under the, the Russian corruption through this scheme, which has paid off all the politicians inside their country to rig elections, not go after people, fix judicial decisions, and all of the rest of it. And so that's what you have. Ukraine has spent 30 years, I've been an anti-activist in Ukraine for 30 years, has tried for 30 years to get out from under it. And, and it's just, it's, it's insidious, it's difficult. And of course, Russians own the media or control that these oligarchs in Ukraine control the media, they control the elections. And finally, in 2019, you know, Zelensky was elected, first actually a free election as a reformer. And I think that's when they realized, well, they're going to get uppity. We were having such a good time. Yeah. Okay, we were getting so rich all the time. So that is when the real battle started. In 2004, the Orange Revolution were millions of Ukrainians on freezing cold streets trying to overturn a rigged election of a guy named Yanukovych who hired Paul Manafort to primp him up. And Paul Manafort made a fortune off Yanukovych. He was Putin's pup, puppet. And then they had to do it again and go on the streets in 2014 with that same crooked president who is estimated stole $60 billion from the country uh, was, was not going to let them join the European Union. And then we know how it spiraled down from there. So Ukraine is, is a victim 10 times over. And the, the corruption that, that pervaded Ukraine and still exists, and it, as it exists in Canada or whatever, but, but it was, was Russian created, Russian influenced, Russian uh, supported. And that's how they controlled that country until they didn't. So this is modern day capitalism in action. This is this this is this is state capture by using all of the secrecy and corruption tools, and the Russians did it bigger and better than anybody else, and they took an entire country out of out of commission. And so now, for all the reasons other people say, we have to help them. We have to help defeat the oligarch. This is this is a war against oligarchs, and 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 there is an element of genocide and all kinds of other crazy things in it. So I think it's really important to look at the situation from that point of view. This is the first example of global security threatened by this ongoing growing cancer, capitalistic cancer we have. And that's why we have to really hit it with everything we have. And as I say, they, they, they took over Ukraine because they perceived that the Europeans were gonna help them get out from under uh, Russia. They were getting uppity. So it was like they made an unfriendly takeover. The shareholders got upset and they, they're showing the shareholders a lesson. 
That's what we have. That's my metaphor. Well, Adam Smith is turning over in his grave, grave indeed. And uh, that's the title of this panel. And Don Griswold, I think, actually brought Adam Smith with him. Hi, I'm Don. And uh, I'm a tax avoidance enabler. <laughs> That's what I'd say if this was avoidance alcoholic synonymous, right? Um, I was for, for three decades. I switched sides a little over a year ago. Um, trace for you briefly how I was apparently the willing victim, not of state capture, but of, I think I'd call it ego capture. Uh, grew up in a conservative household, went to University of Chicago to study economics under Milton Friedman. The guy wins the Nobel Prize three months later and I never see him in a classroom. But they did make me buy. This is the Bicentennial University of Chicago issue of Wealth of Nations. They made us buy it. And of course, at Chicago, you got to read every single long book. And we had to read this thing just to happen upon book one, page 477, The Invisible Hand. You know, this is the foundation of neoliberalism. This is the foundation of Reaganomics. This is the foundation of trickle-down economics. If the, and what is it essentially? Selfishness is a moral act that does the good for everyone. If everyone just follows their own self-interest, then miraculously, as if by an invisible hand, Smith's most famous phrase, as if by an invisible hand, the benefit and good for all will be enhanced. Um, I learned also in Smith, um, besides really being, I mean, this, he's, he's the guy that the neoliberal Chicago school picked to build their, their framework on. Uh, we can talk later, but he also praises tax avoiders as uh, the fourth of his four tax maxims. And I brought it so I can quote it if anybody doesn't believe it. Uh, but I get out of school, and actually the main thing, I reject it, as you can see, most of, of Friedman's teaching, but one thing stuck with me, unfortunately. Somewhere in the late 70s, um, he wrote an op-ed for the New York Times titled, Business is an Ethics-Free Zone. Somehow, I didn't question that. And I'm... Uh, eight years into my career, I get a call from a big four firm, KPMG, that wants to uh, build what they called a state tax minimization, read avoidance practice. Me and 10 other guys, we built a handful of people in a decade to a 600 person corporate tax avoidance practice focusing on the 50 states. Uh, during that, I was the, I was the chief uh, avoidance innovator. Um, I will take issue, Nils, and maybe I should scoot over here because you quoted Shakespeare, John the Butcher. First thing, let's kill all the lawyers. Let's kill all the tax avoiders. I'm a little worried. How about converted ones? Not sure. But um, in that time, I was the, the chief innovator of corporate tax avoidance strategies on the state side. Uh, and unlike my colleagues, I discovered later on the international side. I considered myself a Boy Scout. I never would have considered that Venn diagram to be identical, as you said, Nils. Um, I believed very clearly, A, that business is an ethics-free zone. You're playing a chess game, and so long as you stay within the rules, anything is okay. I believe that nonsense. I genuinely believed that, and I believed that my search for tax loopholes, which is what tax avoidance is, it's lawful loopholes, although I didn't think about how it's also the creation by the avoiders of those loopholes, wasn't putting two and two together. That was quite distinct from what some of my colleagues were accused for, of on the international side, which was criminal tax evasion. So I and a fair number of folks believed that we were just, well, I used to call myself a, a highly paid toilet cleaner. Figure, you know, Without toilet cleaning, the world would be a much worse place. And without capital flows smoothing slowly, it would be a much worse place. But both were essentially amoral jobs, neither morally positive nor morally negative. I believe that for so long. I um, 
uh, was recruited into uh, big law where I then spent a decade and a half uh, defending all these tax avoidance plans, um, courts around the country. And then my, my best client hired me to go in house. And for a short time, I was executive tax counsel in Omaha at Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, the pandemic happened and um, changes in the industry happened. And I started listening to Tax Justice Network podcasts on my morning exercise, reverse chronological, chronological order, a hundred of them. And at the end, I had a conversion that, oh my God, what have I been doing with my brain all this time? I uh, announced publicly on LinkedIn sometime in late 01, um, giving up my corporate clients and uh, um, doing some tax justice work. And so I consult with some liberal um, progressive um, think tanks and uh, I have a column, uh, column now in Bloomberg on tax justice. And the cool thing that happened though that I think is most relevant here is that I was invited um, in June of last year to a symposium of 40 people at MIT, um, co-sponsored with the World Bank. Their goal was to found it on the work of Sandy Pentland, MIT's top data scientist, to find a way to um, improve the state of things financially and tax-wise around the world. I furiously started calling a handful of anti-corruption and tax justice leaders that I'd begun to meet in that time. And they all said one thing, Don, you got this seat at the table? Push beneficial ownership transparency. I had to look that up. But when I did, I realized this really is it. Um, that's the one issue that got traction at that symposium. And I went out later and assembled a group of extraordinary folks. The goal is to marry up, and I'll tell you the name of the initiative is Tech for Transparency. Um, we, uh, the goal is to marry up uh, transformative digital scientists with folks like you in this room. In fact, two members of my work group, Tom Cardamone and Gary Kalman, uh, are, are here. So we're marrying up the scientists with the activists to actually achieve what the goal of beneficial ownership is, to go after that number. I've been saying 50 trillion. Jim said now it's 60, 60 uh, so a number was $75 trillion of hidden wealth. The $480 billion a year of avoided and evaded taxes. But let's do that in a way that works. Um, and some of the ideas that we have are pretty straightforward with existing technology. Um, um, GFI uh, has as one of its goals, blockchain in every port solve the money laundering, et cetera, problem with global shipping by making sure you can't lie on the front end of what you did on the back end. That's pretty much existing technology. But then we've got a real problem, and this goes, I think, to Jack, I think, Jack and Nils, you both were saying, um, sunlight isn't doing it, is it? Well, I think it's, and I'll stop here with this one, Charles. Um, sunlight is only part of the way the rest needs to be enforcement. And it's especially not gonna work as the future kept, catches up with all of us in terms of technology. Think back to the days before we had high speed trading on the stock market with these algorithmic, just rapidly going through trade, 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 right? You think that's not gonna happen to the creation of shell corporations and the creation of financial transactions among them when we have what we need, which is digital, digitized government? We've got to have new transformative digital technology, or we are all toast. Leave it there. Wonderful. Well, wow. that was not only pretty good, but we have uh, time for dialogue at last. So uh, do we have microphones? Ah, I, there's, a, there's a pair of glasses that's been raised in the air, uh, and we'll see where that takes us. Great, thanks so much. I'm Alex Jacobs from the Jockey Trust. Thanks so much, Don. That's a wonderful story. Very much appreciate you telling us that. For years, we've been hearing um, the big four and others say, yeah, we used to do that stuff. <clears throat> we sold schemes. We did a lot of tax avoidance. It all stopped 10 years ago. And someone from, I'm from the UK, someone from a big law firm said that to me very recently. They said, look, yeah, we used to have a problem. 
It's okay, it's different now, it's a different world. Even five years ago, it was terrible, now it's okay. Should we give that any, any time of day at all? Absolutely none. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> Howdy, I'm Thomas Ward. Um, I'm an economist, but I've worked around the globe um, dealing with anti-money laundering and so forth. I've worked with Booz Allen, Deloitte, PwC, the World Bank for nine years, USAID. One of the biggest problems that I see here is today, and I know it might be focused just on Russia, but I think we're missing the big animal or the what I call the big bear in the room, which is China. To me, um, Russia is a little child. The money is small compared to what Russia, uh, China's got. China's got much more invested in here. It's That's where the real money is, and that's where the real concern is, because it's in the investments. And I think that's the big thing we're missing in this bigger picture of what's going on. Um, and with that, you know, you're going to see that I'm very active in communicating, sharing different things out there. So it'd be great to hear more from you guys. Hmm. Can I make a comment on that? Um, yeah, so, cool. Diane, you were talking about oligarchs. We've had a, the word oligarch has appeared many times here. I'm, I'm often amused, or bemused, I think is maybe the, the right word, about the way that, the way that people here in the West and the United States use the word oligarch, as opposed to billionaire, which might be the term that we would use here. But Matt Dust was in here earlier, and he would have some things to say about this. Um, what's the difference between a, a billionaire in the West and an oligarch in China or Russia? Um, I, it's not just a semantic difference, actually. I think there is an important difference. Um, and it's not one that's entirely flattering to us, I have to say. Um, the big difference, and it's actually worth going back to the history of what happened in the 1990s in, in, in Russia, the former Soviet Union. You had a first generation of oligarchs who, you know, to, to quote the title of a famous book on the subject, stole the state, stole a lot of these assets. Um, and then these people were actually almost all defenestrated uh, when Putin came into office. Kordakovsky was mentioned earlier, but lots of other people were effectively exiled, um, and some of them were even possibly murdered, and you're thinking of random people like uh, Guzinski or Berezovsky or um, Kordakovsky. Notably, almost all of this first generation of Russian oligarchs were Jews or half-Jews, and this new generation of oligarchs are not. What is it that happened in the early, in the early aughts when Putin came into power? Um, and similarly, what's happened since she took power in China, to your point? is that people who were previously somewhat independent from the regime were all either tossed out or curbed in their independence from the state. The big difference in the United States is that billionaires are not totally subordinate. We have the rule of law. Billionaires, therefore, can behave with impunity. Billionaires in Russia and China cannot behave with impunity with respect to their own state. Okay, They can be paid, behave with impunity with respect to ours, but they can't behave with impunity with respect to their own state. They are fundamentally subordinated to the interests of their own state. Um, that wasn't true in the 1990s in Russia, and it wasn't completely true in China prior to Xi coming in and changing the regimes. This too, I think, tells us something about the different kinds of strategies that we can have. Again, I want to advocate that we adopt the strategies of Russia or China with respect to our billionaires, but the point is, in those countries, their billionaires, we call them oligarchs, are in fact subordinated to the interests of the state fundamentally um, in ways that the billionaires here are not. And there's trade-offs to both sides of that. You have independent billionaires protected by the rule of law. They can behave with impunity. That's our system. Their system is the billionaires are subordinated to the interests of the state by the authoritarian leaders of those states. There's pros and cons to both of those, but it's worth thinking about the structural difference. Interesting. We have a, a corrosive capital that has a question. Hi, yeah, thanks. Uh, Eric Hans from the Center for National Private Enterprise. Um, so, Diane, the question is, is primarily for you. You know, I've, I've worked in Ukraine a lot, and you know, to my mind, in Ukraine, you had these two types of capitalism essentially coexisting: one oligarchic, captured, uh, building moats with that connection between the state, and the other, very entrepreneurial, very uh, 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 opportunity-seeking. Uh, you have what six, ten unicorn uh, IT companies in Ukraine prior to the invasion. You had companies like Nova Pochta, which you know single entrepreneur driving a truck back and forth between a few cities, developing that business out, Horizon Capital very active in the country, facilitating that constructive capital uh, investment. So how do we navigate this where it exists um, contemporaneously in a state, this, this good capitalism and this bad capitalism, and what can the West do, uh, for lack of a better term, 
to encourage more of this, this good capitalism and, and to push out or crowd out the, the, the cronyism. This is besides increasing the budget of site. Yes. Right. Okay. That, that, that. Yeah, I, indeed, uh, Ukrainians are very entrepreneurial and very talented people. And I was involved in the IT business. I was a software developer there too. I did that. And one of the one of the tenets we all had was is that the, do not seek government contracts. Work for the Fortune 500, do offshore work or work for a legitimate private entity inside Ukraine, but do not take a government contract because that's when it starts. Can you employ my you know stupid son? Can you give me a bribe? Can you do this? Can you do that? So they were able to kind of navigate around it. And there was a very um, talented uh, group of people, but make no mistake, uh, the Russians were really good at this stuff and they controlled Ukraine. They controlled the Ukrainian oligarchs, even though some of them now are going around doing philanthropy and pr pr pretending they're victims, they should all lose everything they owned in Ukraine when this is over. The real way to do this is, I think the European Union did a wonderful job as a midwife, and they took in the Soviet satellites, and they said, you will have this kind of judiciary, you will have that kind of police force, you will have these you know, guardrails. And so the European institutions, while maybe not perfect, uh, were very important because you know, they didn't have to reinvent the wheel. So that's really the solution. Once hopefully Putin is defeated, and I think he will be, they will join the European Union and they will have European institutionals and guardrails, and then you will see that country explode because it's very entrepreneurial. Back of the room. And this gentleman, I should say, is one, one of the authors. I don't know if he was the prime author of the famous piece in Foreign Affairs, Strategic Corruption. The prime nag. I, I would, um, Toffer Harrison, um, starting a NGO, hopefully you'll be hearing from us in a couple of weeks called the Decleptocracy Project. But my, my question, I see the way Russian corruption worked in Ukraine almost as a colonization. And you see this happening in Austria. There, Austria is effectively a Russian colony at this point. When is the, what will it take to wake the West up to enforce sanctions? It's, it's, just going from memory, but I don't think there's been a single Western company that's been um, prosecuted for enforcing sanctions, despite there being many, many transgressions put in the newspaper. What, what, what is that going, what's, what do we need to enforce the law here? Well, you need a, a, an uncorrupted uh, judicial system. You need police that aren't corrupted. You need a political system that's transparent and open and open to these ideas. And you need institutions with guardrails. I, I don't know what else you can do. So people will be people and they're pretty lousy. Look, for the most part, I agree with Jack. Um, I grew up in Chicago, okay? I, I, this is where I learned firsthand you know, how despicable a lot of people are and a lot of things are. And that got cleaned up through some very uh, wonderful uh, exposés in the local papers who took them on and then some very powerful and courageous attorneys general and, and ju judges who started to make, it was, it was mostly the, the mafia and, and started to make example and started to, to go after corrupt uh, politicians. And it took a long time, but it was, it was a real mess uh, when I grew up in the 50s and 60s. And, and it's, 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 it, can, it can get fixed. Any other questions? Oh. Um, my name is Karen Greenaway. I'm an FBI agent, retired. Um, I am an attorney, and I am also on the commission to select the next director of the National Anti-Corruption Bureau of Ukraine. Um, and um, my question is uh, actually not about, uh, about that. I would say, though, I would make one uh, kind of correction to what you said, um, uh, uh, um, Ms. Francis, about it's, I don't think it's operating prof profit, it's operating income that the oligarchs take from. Uh, because what I've seen through our investigations is that basically they use, you know, particularly the Russian, Russian Ukrainian oligarchs use the operating income of the state owned enterprises to just scoop out what they want and they want to spend on um, their yachts. And so what happens is, 
And um, I, I flag this for everyone, particularly the, the, the reporting done by the Pittsburgh Star Gazette on what uh, Mr. H uh, um, Kolomoisky did in the United States is what they take out of that operating income is what should have been spent on safety protections on what should have been spent on paying the utilities in, you know, in, in these places. And, and this isn't Ukraine, right? This is the United States of America. These are our workers and our citizens. So there is a victim here from all of this. But my question is, in the international financial system, one of the things that I and Deb Lopperbot, my colleague who's also here in FBI retired, looked at in, in trying to trying to find some of the Yanukovych money was, you know, this great mystery of um, Ukrainian government bonds. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, it came up again under, you know, Mr. Giuliani's investigations, you know, that there was all this money that had come into a financial services company in the United States that was selling Ukrainian government bonds that were part of a bond portfolio, um, you know, that had done very well over a number of years. Uh, and that, um, you know, there must be some sort of corruption in, in, in that. And so I did a number of interviews in trying to really understand this sovereign, uh, you know, sovereign wealth fund, sovereign issuance of government bonds. Um, uh, both Deb and I, of course, were in the FBI and part of the unit that did the 1MBD Malaysia case. Um, um, but that whole process and evaluation of investing in, in the sovereign. And what I was told is, is that corruption is not, was not an evaluator for whether or not a sovereign was a good investment. And so my question to the panel is, um, is there not something in part of what we're doing here that needs to really examine the evaluation of these countries as an investment? Because guess what? In addition to our citizens being victimized by these individuals, we are all invested in all of that. I will tell you, I was an investor until I realized that this was Ukrainian bonds. I was a small, you know, investor in, in that bond fund, having no idea that my money was going into float, you know, Viktor Yanukovych, that I then go to Ukraine on multiple occasions and see the, the you know, the horrible damage that was done to Ukrainian citizens, um, you know, from that investment. So I think one of the things that really needs to be presenced and I would like to hear the panel's voice on that is, how do we, you know, what, what are the potential solutions to this evaluating and investing in these countries, you know, um, you know, through sovereign wealth, you know, investment funds of some kind? Thank you. Thank you, Karen. I don't know if that's a question. It was absolutely fascinating. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of us know in this room know, know Karen and the incredible work she's done. Uh, and knowledge in particular in, in, in Ukraine. Do we want to respond to that or there's somebody in the audience who could respond? Off that yeah. quickly, uh, you know, yeah. why are Russian companies listed in London? Okay, really? I mean, the Americans are, are kicking off the Chinese ones unless they behave themselves. So really, again, we get back to the enablers, the investment bankers who don't do their due diligence and don't, you know, have red flags and the way they rank and rate these things is obviously sometimes accidentally wrong or would impossibly would have been impossible to get right but uh, i think that's a good point yeah i'll just build briefly on that i do think this is an area where transparency and reporting can help um i mean I, you know i'll admit my naivete as an investor i don't always read the fine details on the funds i buy into but if there was a big red section at the front that says these are the political uh commitments that you're taking on by investing in this particular fund or this particular company, and there was a kind of a political audit of those sorts of things, that might be an area where it would, it would drive decision, drive changes in the same way that, you know, divestment from South Africa was, in fact, a major push to end apartheid in the 1980s. So these things can work, but it has to be really sustained over time, and transparency, I do think, can help on this front a lot. Sean, do you want to say anything? All right, well, we are approaching the end. We need to mic up inequality. And uh, I pointed, pointed at him a, a minute ago, Frank Vogel would like to say something because in his book, The Enablers, there's a whole section on this issue of bonds and all of that. And he's pissed off at me that I'm not letting him speak, but we'd it's need, book, we'd need good, 10 minutes or something like that. But I can't recommend you to enough Frank's uh, uh, book, The Enablers in general, in particular, 
particularly for tackling this issue of bonds. And I'm not aware of any other book in our space, as marketers are wont to say, uh, that, ad that addresses this. And uh, Frank is someone who's been on the inside of the banks and all of that, and who knows finance, and uh, it's the, the real reference on this subject. So thank you very much. And uh, now for uh, inequality. Thank you very much. Um, welcome everybody to this uh, one of the, the afternoon sessions. Uh, so we'll be focusing on inequality. Uh, my name is Pascal Dubois. I have a background in um, anti-corruption, starting in uh, international development, and then I moved on uh, from there. Um, I'm always very happy to be in a in a different crowd, even though I know a lot of the people here, because one of the things, and, and I think it's pointed out in your book, Raymond, um, our worlds are all very siloed. You know, you have the world of uh, anti-corruption guys, you know, you've got the world of illicit financing, anti-money laundering, and within that group, uh, um, you hear more and more now also about, you know, the uh, the tax evasion guys. Uh, guys, when I say guys, guys and gals, right? Uh, and so um, it is uh, it is very good to see that more and more now, a push is being made for having a, a more of a merger between, you know, all these all these different uh, worlds. So um, I'm particularly um, uh, happy, given my 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 background originally in um, in um, in development. I remember when I first started in in international development, the world was relatively simple. You had poor people. We had rich people. And so many, many, many years later, what you started seeing, and so I, I remember reading the first time or hearing the first time about the term shared prosperity and having to look it up and saying, you know, what is this, right? And so when you see that uh, these days there are more billionaires uh, in the emerging markets, you know, all uh, taken all together than they are uh, in, for instance, America, uh, it shows you that if you want to do something about uh, eradicating poverty, you have to do something about um, uh, having increased share prosperity, which is, you know, uh, in another word of saying, you know, inequality. So uh, we have a very exciting uh, panel uh, today. Um, Damon Silvers, um, uh, who he pointed out to me as the um, senior, senior advisor, advisor um, uh, FAL uh, CIO, um, uh, Jim Henry, whom you heard of uh, before, and of course, uh, Raymond Baker, who, uh, you know, Raymond, your book is fantastic. I, I must admit, I haven't read every page of it, but I'm almost there. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I'll tell you the moment that I'm. I, I, I started reading the beginning and then sort of the end, and then, you know, I'm, uh, I'm back at the middle. Right. Um, so we're going to be starting. And could I have um, the slide that is? Yeah, there we go. Okay. So um, actually one back. Yeah, great. So um, we'll be reading together uh, these three sayings, um, and um, we'll have our speakers um, uh, discuss them. So uh, Paul uh, Krugman said, that political polarization has marched side by side with economic polarization um, as income inequality has soared. Darren Walker, president of the Ford Foundation said, make no mistake, the exploitation of a democratic capitalist system is intentional. And then Joe Stiglitz, economic inequality translates into political inequality. It is not just our economy that is at stake, we're risking our democracy. So are they right? Starting with Damon Silvers. Well, first, uh, let me just say what a pleasure it is to be here. I wanna particularly acknowledge my uh, new friend, Raymond, uh, for having both written on this subject, as I think everybody knows, and for having uh, been the sort of convi uh, convening spirit here today. Um, and, um, and I think that we've just, uh, seen in these quotes, the key, the key uh, thing to understand here about the relationship between the essentially the escape of large amounts of the world's uh, wealth uh, from both visibility and taxability uh, into uh, spaces of opacity, the consequences of that, um, which are larger than you think, right? Meaning that, 
uh, as Pascal said, there's a certain siloization that goes on in these conversations. And so we tend to have a conversation about this phenomenon from the perspective of anti-corruption or from the perspective of, of fiscal policy and revenue. But what we are really talking about is something that is a phenomenon that is um, a core driver uh, of the shape of the world's political economy and a fundamental threat to the survival uh, and sustainability and stability of democracy as a form of government. And if, if it's, can we bring those quotes back up on screen because I wanna drive home this point with those quotes, excellent. Um, uh, I wanna focus on what Paul Krugman and Joe Stiglitz uh, said because they are the two pieces of this puzzle. And they're, and they're saying something different, right? And it's important to understand why they fit together as one piece. So what, <clears throat> what Joe Stiglitz is essentially saying is that when you allow capital, when you allow wealth to accumulate in a profoundly unequal way, and then when you don't tax it, that the result is the people who have that wealth have disproportionate political power, and they will use that political power to entrench their wealth. Uh, that's not a particularly controversial thing. And it would appear to be a threat to the very, the very notion of how a democratic society is supposed to work, that fundamentally in a democratic society, people count not dollars, right? From, from the perspective of political decision-making. But the actual threat here is worse. And that's where you have to look at what Krugman says. Because when what Stiglitz says happens, when the political process is essentially corrupted by great wealth, which then uses their power to prevent themselves from being taxed and to hide their money, the public doesn't respond passively. The public is not inert in relation to that development. And what, what arises out of that, and in a way I can weave in what Darren Walker said, what arises out of that is a popular reaction. And if there isn't a political channel for that popular reaction to express itself effectively in, in a context that is within the democratic framework, if, for example, both political parties in, in a two-party system are captured by this dynamic, then what happens is that the political reaction to the inequality Joe Stiglitz is talking about expresses itself in authoritarian terms. And that is what Krugman means. What Krugman is saying is that it's not just that we then have an unequal system within our democracy. It's that large parts of the public give up on democracy itself. And political forces arise who in the French context are outside the Republic. Now this, in my view, having lived through the last 10 years in the developed world, this in my view is the inevitable consequence of what is described in this book. There is no, that, that it is not just that the rich dominate our democracy, it's that our democracy is at risk of becoming a battlefield between authoritarians and plutocrats. And the challenge that faces us right now, and President Biden spoke about this last night with some eloquence, the challenge that faces us right now in the United States and globally is the challenge of whether or not the democratic political process can reverse what is laid out in this book before there's no more space within democratic society other than the space occupied by, by authoritarians and plutocrats. And that is the true stakes, and that is the true stakes uh, when we allow a large portion of the world's private wealth to go dark and be untaxed. Thank you. Jim, am I, I right? Can I jump up? Sorry, you may, absolutely. Okay. Uh, well, I think uh, my problem as an economist uh, in the room is that um, I, this is abstract empiricism, C. Wright Mills called. So, I want some some data. Um, we've seen top one percent captured nearly twice as much new wealth as the rest of the world over the last two years. That's from 
Oxfam's recent report at Davos, and we see close to 40% of multinational profits being shifted to tax havens. Uh, is this good for democracy or not? Well, uh, I spent a lot of time in the country of South Africa, uh, working with a number of groups there. And what's happened in the last 10 years is that the ANC, which had uh, about 60% of the vote, has been slipping. And the reason is inequality has been rising. The performance of the ANC in governing society has uh, been lousy. And so there's probably more democratic activity now, more chance for new parties uh, and new voices to, go, uh, to come to the fore. So it's not a universal uh, claim that you, know, you increase political uh, polarization when you increase inequality, nor that you necessarily challenge democracy. But there is a kind of inequality that I think we need to address that we're not really talking about when we just talk, talk about infra-country inequality. If we levelized inequality in the, in the United States and other countries within, uh, we would uh, reduce the ratio of the, the most wealthy to the least wealthy by a factor of two to five. If we're talking about really astronomical uh, uh, ratios of inequality of wealth in the world, we have to address the fact uh, that a growing fraction of, of, the, of the world is simply sinking into dire poverty, becoming failed states, facing what they call climate migration on a scale that we have no idea about so far. And so I'm concerned that unless we address, address the inequality that is addressed in this uh, report, oddly enough, by Credit Suisse, uh, my favorite bank, um, you know, we, we really have to uh, worry about the consequences of that kind of inequality. For example, a lot of the in immigration that we're seeing uh, on the Mexican border right now is driven by the fact that Central American countries like Honduras and Guatemala are becoming unlivable. Um, we've just missed the climate targets for 2030 in order to keep the world at 1.5 to 2 degrees by 2100. Uh, we were supposed to cut greenhouse gas emissions uh, by 45%. They will actually increase by 11% uh, current course and speed. Uh, what's that going to do? We have 8 billion people on the planet now. We're going to have 12 billion people by 2100. When the average temperature level in the world is increasing by two degrees, the uh, sub-Saharan continent and the Central American areas uh, increase by four to five degrees, literally cannot live in those countries anymore. You think we have a border problem now? You know, that's going to be the fate that we're facing. So I'm concerned about the inequality definition that we're focusing. I'm also concerned about, um, you know, as Lucy Parsons, the I IWW organizer once said, never be deceived that the rich will permit you to vote away their wealth. And so far, with the exception of crises, periods like World War II, um, we are, uh, she, she has been right. We've seen a lot of uh, liberal Democrats opposing reforms. And in New York State, I tried hard to get a financial transactions tax that's already on the books, uh, being rebated to Wall Street a 0.1% tax on stock trades. It would generate $25 billion a year. Uh, the Democratic Assembly and, and uh, the Senate supported it. Uh, the governor, Cuomo, who is in the pocket of Wall Street, uh, vetoed it, and then the current governor is opposing it. Most of the tax would be paid by non-New Yorkers. They need the money. It's a 0.1% tax that no one would miss. So if I can't get that through the New York State Democratic Control Legislature, uh, what on earth are you guys going to do down in Washington? Raymond, thank you. Let me um, tell a short biographical story. I went to Nigeria in 1961, uh, managing a business. 
um, employed by somebody else. Um, and one of the early people that I talked to, I asked him, how do you do business uh, in Africa? And he looked at me like I was a complete uh, idiot and said to me, I'm not trying to make a profit. I had no idea what he was talking about, just having finished Harvard Business School. One of the early people I talked to says, I'm not trying to make a profit. What he was talking about was transfer pricing. Uh, he, his, his subsidiary of a parent company in the UK was not intended to earn a profit. It was only intended to ship the money back to the UK within the invoices, the transfer pricing, the misinvoicing of trade um, that I talked about. Um, set up on my own, got married, Pauline and I um, kept ourselves alive through the Nigerian Civil War. And finally, as it was ending, um, having taken huge risk, both business and personal, uh, we decided to reward ourselves with a house um, on a creek, a nice place with a beautiful patio and shade trees overhead. And I sat hours and hours and hours on that patio, looking across the water at the American embassy and the Soviet embassy and asking myself, why is neither system, neither America's capitalist system nor the Soviet Union socialist system working for the poor people of Africa? And I asked that question time and time and time again. Among other things, I was furious at economists, development economists, because they never, to this day, put on the, on the table both sides of the equation for economic development. How much money goes in, how much money comes out. They've never done that. Never, the, the development economist community has never looked at how much money comes out. Anyway, Pauline and I moved back to the States. Corruption was, uh, it was terrible uh, uh, in Nigeria. We moved back to the States. I did business all over the world until the mid 1990s and segued into the Brookings Institution in, <clears throat> in order to uh, study this uh, uh, further. I went into the Brookings Institution thinking that corruption, the cross-border flow of corrupt money was the biggest part of the problem. There are three components of the cross-border flow, corrupt, criminal, and commercial. I thought the corrupt component was the largest. I went to 23 countries and interviewed 335 people. And I came out of that realizing that the corrupt component, I'm talking about the cross-border flow, the corrupt component is the smallest, the criminal component is next, and the commercial component is by far the largest part of this problem of cross-border um, uh, financial flows. And that leads you, understanding that led me into um, the realization that I had to, I had to dig deeper into the motivations and the mechanisms by which the capitalist system was doing this. I have no idea, after thinking about this for many decades, how you strengthen democracy amidst rising inequality, rising economic inequality, whether that inequality is in perception or in fact, whether it is what people feel or what it is, or it is what they can uh, see in statistical data. I have no idea how you, how you strengthen democracy amidst rising inequality. What I'm saying is that addressing the problem of economic inequality is a necessary step in strengthening democracy. Thank you. Uh, we'll have some focused uh, uh, points, uh, starting with Damer. Damon. Um, uh, when looking at the uh, current political situation in uh, in the U.S., um, the, you know the political angst. Um, to and this is a leading question, but you know, does inequality impact the current political angst? I think the answer will be yes. But if you can explain some more, and then if we could also um, uh, jump into facing the future and what you see, one or two points that you think. Uh, may actually help. Okay. Um, let me let me say the the contributions of my fellow panelists uh, got my mind going, uh, and uh, I hope to come to something that both uh, 
Is that usual? Uh, sometimes. <laughs> I'll get to that. I have something that Professor Henry said, several things he said, which I think were, are worth going into further depth on. Um, speaking as a veteran of financial transaction tax battles here in Washington. Uh, and, uh, and I think there's something very, very profound about what Raymond said about corruption and, 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 and trying to understand the myths that we teach us, the myths we have about corruption and some of the realities of it, particularly when you're talking about between the developed and the developing world. But let's talk about the United States for a minute. You gotta first begin with understanding the nature of inequality in the United States. And there are two critical facts about inequality in the United States that are not well understood. Right? And perhaps that's because Lucy, some of what Lucy Parsons said, that they're not well understood. The first is, the first is that income inequality and wealth inequality are different. Income inequality drives sort of daily experience Wealth inequality drives power. Income inequality is, has been growing in this country quite rapidly uh, or since over the last 40 years after a 50 year, 60 year period of decline. The United States is from an income perspective is a radically more unequal society than it was in 1968. Radically more unequal, right? Uh, we are back to the levels of the mid-1920s, probably now surpass them. Particularly, I think, if you actually got the full measure of, of income, which is a, sort of what we're talking about today. And more importantly, because it drives politics, which is the question, effectively, all of the gains, all of the gains of productivity growth since 1980, it's important to remember, by the way, Productivity since 1980 grew more or less at the same rate as it did during the post-war era. During the post-war era from 1945 to 1980, that productivity growth was broadly distributed through American society in the form of rising incomes. Since 1980, it has all gone to the top 10% of the population. All of it, right? That is not a recipe for a stable republic. Secondly, as a result of that, plus the, the, the complete deterioration of the tax system, wealth inequality, is fund wealth inequality is now fundamentally different than it was in the post-war years. Now, I'll just tell you what it is, because again, it's not well understood, and I'm gonna do it in broad strokes, and you can go check the numbers, and they're more, what I'm telling you is more or less right, but I don't know what the exact numbers are today. Half of this country, Half of the households in this country effectively have nothing. Their wealth is zero. I mean, it's not literally zero. It tends to be about roughly the worth of a used car. Half the households. The 25, 30% of the households, and by the way, this is heavily racially defined, heavily, right? The next third of the, of the distribution from 50, from the, from the median to about 80, 85, has, a roughly, has roughly around $150,000 of net worth per household, roughly. What that means is they own a home and they have a tiny amount of money saved for retirement secure, for retirement. In relation to their needs for retirement, pretty much nothing. There's a break point somewhere in the mid, somewhere around 50, the top 15%. And after that, you see real financial assets, right? Multi-million dollar 401ks and beyond, and then up a, uh, you know, logarithmic curve, uh, uh, not a logarithmic curve, up a uh, uh, exponential, an exponential curve. I didn't get my second cup of coffee. <laughs> But here's the but here's the here's the punchline. You could fill one table in this room with people whose collective net worth, and I am not talking about people with, I, I, and you could leave Jeff Bezos and um, Elon Musk out of it. You didn't wouldn't have to include them. Each of them by themselves has enough for what I'm about to say. But you could fill any table in this room with eight people, eight billionaires from a couple of families, 
uh, I ran this number 10 years ago. It's, it's expanded since then. You could put Mike Bloomberg, the Koch brothers, and uh, the Walton family, a couple of the Walton uh, heirs, at one table. And they would their net worth would be greater than that of 50% of the American people. Right. Now, how does that play out in our politics? The people, the American public is not dumb. The American public has, has internalized what Professor Henry was saying about his effort to pass the financial transactions tax. They have internalized, to quote both politicians of the left and right, that the game is rigged. There are few items that you can poll on that will get a higher per per percentage support from the American public than the notion that the wealthy and corporations should pay a greater share of taxes. That proposition gets a, between 70 and 80% approval, and yet it doesn't happen. Right? That, that is the underlying driver of, how did you put it, the anxiety? That is the, un, the angst. That is the underlying driver of the angst that possesses our politics and the belief across the ideological spectrum that, that we are not participants in a republic Right? but subjects of some opaque regime of power that we are not included in and do not understand. Right? That concept is growing in our society everywhere and is, is open to be exploited by demagogues and turned in, frankly, horrifying directions. Right? But its root is inequality, and I will end by saying this, inside this is tax. Check out, check out Peter Thiel's or Mitt Romney's 401k and IRA. Mitt Romney, I believe in 2012, when he was running for president, had $80 million in his 401k. Now, if, you, if any of you have a 401k, you might ask, how does somebody get $80 million in a 401k? Well, the power of tax-free compound interest, if you're an insider in a private equity firm, is truly staggering. And the key word there is tax-free. And you have to analogize from these little, little, uh, these little spotlights, right? The little spotlights that we have courtesy of the tax laws, uh, courtesy of, I don't know, I don't know why we know what Peter Thiel has in his, in his tax-free account. Again, it's a just gigantic sum but they give you an idea of what is happening across the entire US financial system and where that wealth inequality is coming from and how it's being driven. Thank you very much. That's very, um, uh, so it, it, this, um, uh, the next questions we're gonna deal with uh, uh, data and what data is telling us about hidden money uh, and the impact on inequality um, and also are inequality and uh, poverty the same um, or different issues? Um, I think during the conversation, we've already touched upon you know, several, several of those items. So given that we have uh, 15 minutes left, um, I suggest that we focus on um, uh, solutions and what in your opinion uh, uh, could, be, uh, could be done. And we'll start with Raymond, given that you already gave one idea about you know, the taxation of, yep. of uh, the stock market. So uh, Raymond, uh, how can we reshape uh, capitalism, uh, which in your book says until further notice is still the best system, right, to uh, fight uh, inequality and inequality being something that can uh, very much undermine um, the current uh, democracy or the dream of, uh, of democracy. Over to you. Most people think that we have to um, uh, fight poverty. I think we have to fight inequality. Economists essentially do not have any theory of inequality. Economists have lots of theories about poverty, and this is part of the reason why they focus on that, uh, that part of the problem um, as being the solution. Besides economists, many wealthy people seem to believe that inequality doesn't matter. Only poverty matters. Therefore, if you just give alms to the poor, you are doing whatever uh, is appropriate and moral uh, in the circumstances. Um, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act um, was uh, the personification of this. 
giving $600 uh, on average to the poor people in tax relief and $50,000 to the rich. In other words, there is no limit to inequality so long as you let the poor increase, the poor and the middle class increase a little bit. Um, globally, uh, inequality has been um, um, decreasing between countries, but increasing within countries. Um, and this is part of what is driving authoritarianism in so many situations, even where there may be rising um, uh, uh, general uh, GDP levels, when it becomes so stratified, authoritarianism is the consequence of that. Do we have the first Credit Suisse uh, picture that I want to put up there? This is the picture of global wealth at the present time put together by Credit Suisse. Um, the top 10% of the world has 81.8% uh, share of uh, global wealth. Well, what's the solution to this? A lot of people think that if you just take some money out of the top and put it in the bottom, you will solve the problem. Um, you know, it, 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 we just, we, we take some money out of that uh, uh, top uh, decile, that top 10% group and put it in the hands of the poor people, uh, this will uh, solve the problem. Um, let's do that. Let's take enough money out of the top 10% and make everybody in the lower half of the uh, global um, uh, income uh, uh, spread uh, equal to the sixth decile. Take all five of the lower deciles and put the, and take money out of the top, put it in the lower five deciles to make them equal to the sixth decile. What does that look like? Got the picture? Is that much different? You got 76% now belonging to the top 10% uh, uh, of the world. My point is that the major problem with inequality rests at the top of the scale, much more so than at the bottom of the scale. It is the top of the scale that has to be addressed if we're gonna solve the inequality problem, much more so than the bottom of the scale. That is the opposite of what many people think, and certainly many of the rich think. Thank you very much. Um, over to you, Jim. And as, as a moderator, I would also like to, to um, uh, uh, ask all of you, um, uh, in, in your book, uh, Raymond, you uh, um, uh, cite uh, Heraclitus, learning many things does not teach understanding. And I, I think this is something that um, I, I often think about them, you know, through teaching over the years and, you know, looking at issues of, of anti-corruption, the data is out there these days, right? I mean, thanks to institutions like, you know, uh, I see here for the, the head of TI uh, USA, you know, thanks to increased transparency. I mean, over the years, there has been increased transparency, more and more people, you know, understand the issues. And, and more than that, I think younger generations really want to do something about it. Yet, often nothing happens. And so, understanding the issue is obviously not the same as you know just having access to the data so with all this incre incredibly uh, important and um, uh, you know catching uh, uh, data uh, how can this be used to try and um, open people's eyes because if you try and convince push people too much they may you know back back away but how can one uh, make sure that people not only have access to the data, which is more and more the case, but also understand and then do something about it. Uh, let me start with Jim and then we'll go with you. I think we need to organize. I mean, I think the, <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's not, <laughs> to, to use the word from your mind. <laughs> uh, I once ran for superintendent in Southampton town, which is a Republican district. Um, and I was one of uh, three candidates and I came within 15 votes of winning. Uh, and I discovered that if I got Christy Brinkley and uh, to go door to door with me uh, and campaign, I got a lot better reception uh, and a lot better communication, even with Republicans. Uh, one of the decisions I made was not to go just to Democratic doors. I decided to try to go to everybody and to have conversations to understand them. 
That's one of the problems I see with progressives in this country. We're not talking to our friends on the right enough about why inequality should be an issue. We put out the statistics, we put out the data, and we say, what is wrong with you people? You see the outrageous trends. You see the outrageous numbers. It's getting worse. And they're not buying it. They're concerned about identities. They're concerned about their daily lives. We need to figure out how to sell this damn product. If you want uh, to reduce inequality, you've got to come up, first of all. I mean, the left in the country for a long time would, you know, had ups and downs, but it was always in the business of producing positive proposals. And as, Ray, as uh, Richard Rorty said in his book, 1999, 1999 book uh, called Achieving Our Country, is that we, uh, we need to get away from spectatorial, academic, kind of cynical criticism and to get more engaged with the people that were trying to get to vote for us. And that's the, you know partly getting Christy Brinkley to come along with you, uh, but it's also partly, uh, I think, a matter of understanding why this really should be a bread and butter issue for ordinary Americans. How are they going to actually benefit? I spent a lot of time with the Biden uh, tax reformers in the last two years on the American for Tax Fairness Committee. We would meet every week. And uh, they were talking about billionaires' taxes and billionaires' income taxes. We went through a lot of iterations. Uh, what they didn't understand was that, as John Zogby's polls showed, Americans don't particularly dislike billionaires. Mm -hmm. They don't necessarily believe that they all deserve to pay great wads of money that they're not paying already. Uh, they don't understand what you're going to do with the money. They see headlines about uh, seven frigates that the Navy wanted to cancel that don't work, that cost $4 billion. And the lobbyists in Washington put it together and they, you know, they, they got that bill. They see waste uh, in all kinds of areas of government. So we need to be better, I say, at being making positive proposals to our, our consumers, our audience, and that's organizing. Thank you, Damon. And then last word to Raymond. I think, um, and here I'm going to follow my threat to comment on my fellow panelists' remarks. Uh, I, I think we're talking about three things here. The first is, and, and Jim said this, in your, you said this in your initial remarks, the first is crisis. Right? We are in a crisis. And I'll say the, what that is in a second. Two is policy. This was your challenge. What do we actually do? It's plenty to find to say that inequality is, 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 is running away from us. What do we do? Third is, third is power. How do we do it? Or, as Jim said, organize. First, crisis. We are, in, we are right now in an accelerating crisis that must be dealt with if we're going to have a future worth having. And the accelerating crisis is partly about climate change, and it's partly about the political and geopolitical consequences of climate change. Which are, this is not about something that's happened 30 years from now. It's happening now. And I, I just, Jim understated the threat that climate change poses, okay? The, the IPCC, the UN, says climate refugees will pass a billion by mid-century. A billion. That is the entirety of the refugee crisis that has aff afflicted various parts of the world over the last 10 years is less than 10 million. That includes Syria, Central America, uh, and the Sahel. A billion is unimaginable. Two meter sea level rise. There isn't a major coastal city in the world that can withstand that, and there are large parts of the world whose geology can't be defended. Starting, by the way, with the uh, area surrounding Mar-a-Lago. All right, check, out, ch check out what the bedrock is there. All right. And thirdly, thirdly, and I think Raymond probably knows something about this, uh, 
if, we're, if we stay where we are, three degrees means tropical food production. Food production in the tropics, geogra geographically defined, will drop by 50%. What those, just think about what that would mean. These things have to be stopped. And we need states and a global political order capable of stopping it, which means we need revenue. Right? And we need states that are capable of independent publicly, public oriented action, or we face true catastrophe of a scale that has not been seen in modern history. I could talk about some ancient examples, but that's the point. That's the crisis. Now, what, is, what are the policies? Obviously we need effective climate policies, but we need effective tax policy. We need effective tax policy to raise the money to do the investment to fight climate change on a global basis. And we need the tax policy to restore the essentially the integrity of, of, of democracy. What does that look like? It is not a mystery. Right? It involves essentially this. It involves very significant increases in the, in, in the, in the top, in, at least in the US. It involves very significant increases in the top income tax bracket. It involves restoring a, a globally normal level of corporate taxes uh, in, in the 20s, at least. It involves um, restoring a parity between capital gains and, and, and earned income, right? Between work and coupon clipping, right? And uh, it involves a financial transactions tax, as, as, uh, as Jim said. And globally, it means both transparency and a, and it means both transparency, a corporate minimum tax and an end to tax havens. In particular, it means that the global tax evasion strategy being run by the United Kingdom needs to end. Right, which is the center of the center of this game. All right. Now that that's the policy. Now, how do we get it? The reality is, right, that in order to get it, you have to have political power that is serious about it. And 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 the and what I mean by that is just think about the fact that the carried income tax, the carried interest tax exemption, which is the single most outrageous aspect of the US tax system. Ha Every president for the last 20 years, going back to George Bush in 2008, has said that they are intended to get rid of it. And it is, exists today. Now that tells you something about the real political, and it, Democrats have controlled Congress, Republicans have controlled Congress. Donald Trump said he was gonna get rid of it. Barack Obama said he was gonna get rid of it. Uh, Joe Biden said he's, he's gonna get rid of it. He, he still could maybe. Where do you get the political power? And I would suggest to you, and you won't be shocked when I say this, that the most effective thing you could do in the U.S. political system to, 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 turn the, to turn the level of political power would be to see to it that Howard Schultz, who's one of the beneficiaries of all this stuff, stops breaking the labor law and bargains with his union. I see uh, that uh, we are out of time. Uh, so, and I don't want to stand, we don't want to stand between you and the coffee break. Uh, so... Thank you very much. And for the solutions, by the way, I was going to ask Raymond what his solutions were. They're all in the book. Okay, so make sure that you read them. Thank you very much, everybody. Really, yeah, right. <clears throat> so, hello, everyone. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Global Financial Integrity. And thank you, Charles, for the opportunity to speak here at the Mayflower Hotel today. The Mayflower, what's in a name? We'll be nice and cosy, but let's just pause to think about it. The pitiless gales of that ocean crossing are an apt metaphor for the world we find ourselves in and the political journey we need to be on. For 15 years, it has felt like a storm has been blowing ceaselessly with our boats up against two hurricanes, financial volatility and authoritarian aggression. And oddly enough, these two storms are connected in a way that would have seemed, however far back they may be, intuitive to the pilgrims with their suspicion of riches. Now let's look at them in the face, those two storms, financial volatility and authoritarian aggression. These are both fueled by a system, one brilliantly exposed by Raymond Baker in his new book, Invisible Trillions, a system built by the super rich and our super-powered corporations, an entire parallel 
financial system, a secrecy system, in fact, made up of tax havens, secrecy jurisdictions, falsified trade and more, which conceals revenues, avoids taxes, hides wealth, abets crime and fuels corruption. And as we sit here and ever so slightly overheat, our two hurricanes, financial volatility and authoritarian aggression, are being worsened by this. This system making the weather increasingly hostile to democracy. Let's start with our first tempest, financial instability. From the 2008 market crash to the 2022 crypto crash, this is something being made worse by those invisible trillions. Balance sheets lose their reliability. Revenues can no longer be trusted in Excel. Partners can no longer be trusted face to face. Just this month, the Indian Adani Group could see 100 billion of its valuation wiped off following the accusation, which it denies, of brazen stock manipulation and accountancy fraud by a single short seller's report. Their ties into offshore vehicles in Mauritius could no longer be trusted. Near total wealth wipeouts. On this side of the Atlantic, this should be familiar territory. Only yesterday, Binance, the biggest cryptocurrency exchange in the world, halted US dollar bank transfers. And they're also familiar on my side of the Atlantic, where it was little over 18 months ago that Greensill Capital, which included a former prime minister, David Cameron, in fact, as an advisor, collapsed into insolvency when its secrecy cloaking accounting was exposed. Adani or Greensill, these are not isolated events. They're part of a pattern, a pattern that is fueled by the secrecy system that threatens to corrode what a functioning market needs most. Trust, reliability between partners, and the very ability to believe the figures put in front of you. Now, authoritarian aggression. Our second wind is also getting colder. Let's look at it stage by stage. How the kleptocrats began in fragile new democracies. It was the secrecy system that warped the politics of post-communist Eurasia. It ushered them into a golden age of money laundering. It shaped them. Our bankers and lawyers introducing them to our rules of the game, explaining to their first Russian clients, capitalism had another dimension, offshore, where secrets could be kept and treasures hidden. This system, our own, enabled the kleptocrats as a class. It's hard to imagine them as powerful without it. And help them in stage two, the kleptocrats' global surge from Mayfair to Saint-Tropez was not just a story of them as individuals, but a structure empowering them. Across Eurasia, it was the secrecy system that facilitated that takeover of these societies' politics by authoritarian strongmen, giving them offshore tools to play the politics of corruption as they consolidated power. And it was this secrecy system that enabled the biggest kleptocrat of them all, Vladimir Putin, to go on the offensive in the West. Let's take a moment to let this sink in. The United States believes that Russia has spent over 300 million trying to influence foreign elections since 2014. It was the sinews of the secrecy system, above all anonymous companies, that brought it to bear in the West threatening our national security, taking various forms from compromise campaigns to former front rank politicians on the payroll to lawmakers actively under the influence, all threatening the most fundamental thing about a democracy, the ability to govern ourselves. That's the kleptocrats final stage, the one we are battling. So what do the kleptocrats want? Well, Mayfair property it would seem, but not only that, they want the compact between capitalism and democracy to fail. They want to degrade this, the rules-based, electorally checked, popularly responsive system, which the Mayflower opened up. But we're helping them do it, not only because the secrecy system is making capitalism unstable 
And not only because it is putting us at risk of kleptocratic capture, but because it is corroding what ties us together at home. Liberal democracy relies on a series of compacts between the state and the people, between the old and the young, between the rich and the rest. One of those compacts is taxation. It's a bill, it's a check, I know, but it's also an ethic that everyone in a society will contribute. What the secrecy system does is undermine this. It enables the rich to opt in and opt out of taxation, pushing what they owe onto the shoulders of the poor, giving the super rich even greater resources and power, creating inequality, building resentment, fueling populism. As they learnt on the Mayflower, we can only survive the storms if we stick together. The pilgrims were many things, but in England, in Holland, they never took no for an answer. They looked for solutions, even ones as audacious as this. So what can be done about it? The financial secrecy system cracking our beams. The US government has over the years taken some modest steps in the right direction. But even a basic inspection of these reveals glaring holes. Take the 2020 Corporate Transparency Act, leaves out trusts, partnerships, hedge funds and private equity funds, money services, businesses, and more. And crucially, it doesn't stop foreign shell companies from doing business in the United States. So quite simply, and forgive the nautical theme here, it's not seaworthy. We don't have laws up to what they've been tasked with. Now, let's have a look at the administration's boost to FinCEN, which needs no introduction in this room as the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network just received an 18% budget increase, taking us to just over $190 million. Is that a lot of money? Well, let me tell you how many F-35s that would buy you. It would buy you precisely two and a half. And it has a staff of roughly 300 people, well below the 540 working in Germany, which I don't need to remind you either, is an economy a fifth of the size. We simply don't have enforcement tools up to the task. It's as pathetic as trying to catch a whale with fishing rod. Now take international cooperation. As I argue in my latest report, co-written with the wonderful Francis Shin from the Atlantic Council, we simply lack an international coordination platform. When it comes to catching the kleptocrats, transatlantic allies have the following problems. Their laws don't match, allowing kleptocrats to find their discrepancies. Their enforcement is patchy, allowing kleptocrats to pick locations. Their data sharing is a mess, allowing kleptocrats to buy valuable time. The administration should commit itself to fixing all of the above. We can no more navigate this alone than the Mayflower could without sales. America was once a dream, one the pilgrims were advised not to waste their time on. And the purpose of a conference like the DC Forum is to dream big to shift the Overton window, as the jargon goes. And this is where Raymond Baker's Invisible Trillions is full of ideas. We should together campaign for no US financial institution to receive money from an anonymous company and for no financial institution in the world to send money to the United States that it received from a shell company. Let's not get lost in the complexity of this fight. Let's look at the clearest shot at the secrecy system and popularize it. So this brings us back to the Mayflower. It's a name that resounds to me, not only with the difficulty of the journey, the ice cold winds, the waves as up and down as canyons. It's a name that carries this message that difficult things deemed impossible can be achieved. It's a name that carries with it to a strong moral sense that can, all too easily be forgotten in Washington, of what a good society should be like. Now, no matter of how much of what the pilgrims actually believe might seem medieval to us today, they had a healthy suspicion of mammon. Let no man seek his own, but every man's wealth was a line they were fond of quoting, as they were 
our riches shall not be in pomp, but in strength. You can tell they came from Britain saying that. From there, all of this came from their disdain of aristocratic privilege, which in our day, the secrecy system abets. It's also a scary journey. When a beam broke halfway across the Atlantic in the storms, they considered making about turn to, uh, to England, but they didn't. And I think that should inspire us. Might seem hard and daunting to dismantle the secret system today, but we should not forget it's hardly as difficult as crossing an ocean in a bunch of hammered together pieces of wood. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Okay, so uh, we've heard a lot of, about the problems over the last uh, several hours. So today we're going to talk about, or at this panel, we're gonna talk about the solutions, or at least ideas for solutions. Um, so I'm Mike Abramowitz, uh, the president of Freedom House. It's a delight to be here. Thank you to Charles and all the organizers for organizing this really fascinating discussion. Uh, we have a great set of panelists here to discuss the issue of what to do about the problems of corruption, financial secrecy, and so forth. The, the one thing that I would just offer as an introduction is that you know at Freedom House, we look at the state of uh, democracy, the state of freedom in the world every year, and we have our 50th uh, version of this report coming out uh, uh, in a few weeks. And uh, I think it's fair to say that during this period of democratic decline, rising authoritarianism over the last 16 years that we've chronicled, that the issue of corruption and transparency is just shot through that. And so that the countries that have done very poorly on our scores are, you know, tend to be the countries that also are highly corrupt, where there's been a huge plunder of state resources, and so I think we really see this issue as being very connected uh, together, democracy and uh, corruption, democracy and secrecy. So I'm just gonna sort of start by going uh, through this panel and asking people just very quickly uh, to kind of, uh, I'm gonna ask sort of the same question to each of you, which is uh, from your own perspective, uh, what would you uh, what would you think like the one or two things that you think ought to be done from a policy point of view to address this? I'm going to start to my uh, immediate left with Elise, and uh, Elise is a former staff director uh, and chief counsel for the U.S. Senate Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations, and was a longtime aide to Senator Carl Levin. Uh, we then have Ian Gary from the FACT Coalition. Uh, which is an incredible coalition that is fighting offshore tax abuses and promoting transparency. Then we'll go to Gary Coleman, who's the Executive Director of Transparency International here in the US, uh, which uh, does a, a yeoman's work on the issue of fighting global corruption. And then Jody Vittori from uh, Georgetown University's Wall School of Foreign uh, Service. Uh, so Elise, what should, we do, what should we be doing about this problem? Well, I would say the single most important thing to do right now are beneficial ownership registries. Uh, we've gotten underway in the last few years. The U.S. has started down that journey, and it is the single thing that we could do in the immediate future that would make a big difference. And can you just say more about that? Just explain what the concept is and what you and, and what these registries mean. So we've been talking about shell corporations and shell entities, trusts, partnerships, people where you don't know the human beings behind these legal entities. And they are, as some people have said, the getaway car for all of the people engaging in wrongdoing. So the Beneficial Ownership Registry is an attempt to find out who are the human beings behind the entities that are organized within a particular jurisdiction. So the UK led the way. Europe followed, and the U.S. has followed, and there are others, many others as well. Uh, but it's slow going, and there's a lot that we need to do. So we have the legislation, but it's the implementation that's well, the... Now that's the implementation the, stage. And it's going slow. Well, we have, actually, they've set an effective date of January 1, 2024. I think that's pretty remarkable. I think that's a fantastic date, and we need to get there by that date. They said they want three rules to implement the law. They've completed the first one. It was pretty good. There were some issues, all right. The second one has a lot more problems. That's the one that's going under comment now. 
uh, and they recently released some forms, the actual forms that people are going to have to fill out uh, for this beneficial ownership registry in the United States. And the forms, from my perspective, are the worst I have seen in my career in government. They say on the forms for each one out of about 14 questions, and these are very basic, basic questions. What's your name? What's your address? Who are your, and you have to give that about each one of your owners, an identifying number from a passport or a driver's license. And for four, I think it was 11 out of these 14 questions, it says, uh, you can also check this box, I'm unable to provide the information. Wow. I'm unable to provide the information they don't tell you why you're unable or any sort of standard. I would think the first thing you would say is, well, uh, this entity is formed in the Virg you know, British Virgin <coughs> Islands. They have secrecy laws. Therefore, I don't know who's behind this company. And of course, if you take that position, it guts the entire law. These were just remarkable forms. They actually gut the entire law. I've never seen a form. You know, when you, you fill out your F bar, you don't get to say, Oh, I'm unable to provide the information, my bank account number. So that's a major, major problem. It is one that can be fixed, but it just shows you the, the bumps along the, the way. So. First of all, that's a, very, uh, that's a very helpful set of answers, and I like the clarity of the recommendation. So let me just turn to uh, Ian. Uh, can you give us one? strong recommendation that you would have to address this problem? I know you have many, but let's- I know, it's like choosing among, it's your, choosing among your peers. But, but what do you think the single the thing that will be the single most effective thing? If there, is there a silver bullet to this from your well, point of view? Well, understanding what my other panelists might also okay, raise. Okay, sure. And something that hasn't really been um, highlighted as much today is the issue of tax secrecy and the need for public country by country reporting by multinational companies. That will reveal the kinds of profit shifting and tax avoidance strategies that multinationals are employing. And we're seeing massive movements toward public country by country reporting now, including in other jurisdictions. This is something that the Securities and Exchange Commission could do today. They don't need legislation and it's in their existing mandate. What kind of disclosure requirements are there, are there now? Just say let's in the United States. Um, well, if you, if you would look at a 10K, um, you go on the SEC website into their database you can look at a company like Exxon and they'll talk about the taxes they paid in the US and then there could be a column for the rest of the world. And that doesn't give you any actionable information. Whether you're a policymaker, a member of Congress, a civil society activist, or very importantly, an investor. And so now we're seeing that there are trillions of dollars of assets under management that are voting in favor and, and calling for uh, public country by country reporting. So as part of the political strategy discussion that I think is really essential for us to have, and I'm glad we're starting it today, um, we need to look at new constituencies. And I think investors are a powerful constituency. Um, investors need actionable information and financial secrecy prevents them from having it. I see, so it's really give, giving, getting the corporations more information out of the corporation. And what about individuals, wealthy individuals, is that I mean, also? That, that is also very important and goes to kind of the mutual benefits around the things that Elise was talking about um, are important to understand uh, tax evasion by rich individuals, but also um, the illicit financial flows and corruption that we've been talking about. Okay, and you're saying the SEC could do this with the stroke of a pen? Well, nothing is fast nothing in America. Is fast. How long would it take? Like a, like <laughs> we have the Administrative Procedures yeah, Act yeah, yeah, and yeah, things yeah. like that, but. I mean, they could issue a proposed. They don't need legislation. To they do don't this. need legislation. They could issue a proposed rule this year, and we could have a final rule. Do you think next that's year. on their agenda? It is very much on their agenda. In fact, in December, the SEC's Investor Advisory Committee organized an entire panel about public country by country reporting, and the SEC Chair Gary Gensler said that this is something that they're actively looking at. Okay, I like this because we're developing a good uh, uh, policy, set of policy asks for Freedom House and other organizations. So thank you for that. Um, uh, Gary, can you add to the, the policy list? Sure. Um, so in addition to understanding who's behind the company that we've least talked about through beneficial ownership transparency, there's also been a lot of talk today about the enablers and the gatekeepers to the U.S. financial system. Um, and on a number of um, the 
most important gatekeepers, some of this needs to be done through legislation, but some of it can be done by Treasury, also does not need legislation, do not have to deal with the congressional process. Um, and the two thing, two uh, industries I'll, I'll highlight here is one, our real estate sector. I can't remember who said it, but uh, one of our earlier speakers was talking about the $60 trillion um, real estate market in the United States. That is a very attractive target, right? If you want to hide a few hundred million dollars or a billion dollars, you can't go to a small jurisdiction. You can pass it through that jurisdiction, but um, uh, somebody mentioned the 1MDB scandal. The Prime Minister sold four and a half billion dollars. The entire GDP of the Cayman Islands is three billion dollars. Literally, he could have bought the entire Cayman Islands and still had a billion dollars he didn't know what to do with. So you have to move it into larger economies and larger jurisdictions. And so the United States is very attractive. We have no responsibility, no rules or uh, obligations for real estate professionals to monitor who's buying uh, real estate in our in our country. So if you have an offshore account, yep. the beneficial ownership bill won't get to you because we don't have information on who the comp the offshore company is. You can buy if you don't go through a U.S. bank, you just wire the money from a foreign bank. Then you can buy into the real estate market. The um, Financial Crimes Enforcement Network has announced that they want their intention to put out uh, a draft rule in April, and so we're eagerly awaiting that. The one other profession that I will say that they should start on would be investment advisors. It's an 11 trillion, the private uh, investment industry has no responsibilities, uh, and so it's an 11 trillion dollar market. By the way, if the private investment market were its own country, it would be the third largest economy in the world. Right. So again, a huge big target with no responsibilities. They have the authority to do that through existing law. They need to move forward. Hey, can you just sort of make this a little bit real for us? So like if you're an investment professional mm -hmm. and you, uh, what do you want that investment professional to be required to do? So right now, if I go around the world and recruit money mm -hmm. or an agent of someone comes to me and says, hey, we have a bunch of money and it's in an offshore bank account. My responsibility is to make sure that you can afford the risk, right? You are a qualified investor, that you can afford to lose the money. This is meant to protect uh, riskier investment professionals from recruiting grandma's pension funds, right? But it's nothing about whether or not that money is corrupt or whether, where that, the source of the money comes from. So they look in the bank account, they go, oh, there's $10 billion. They want to invest a billion. They can afford to lose it. I can take that money and invest it, and I have no responsibility to know where the source of that money is as long as the bank account and the company that it's coming from, that itself is not on a sanctions list. So I just set up an anonymous company. I'm not on the sanctions list, even though I may, the person behind it is sanctioned. I have no idea. I have no responsibility to ask. Don't ask, don't tell. I take the money and I invest it in the US markets. Okay. Jody, uh, do you have, a, do you have a, a favored policy prescription? I have another question for you if you don't, but I want to give you the opportunity to ask the same question that I asked the others. I would like to approach things from a hard power perspective today, kind of building on what Ben and Judah talked about. And it's less about a policy and more about everybody asking more questions. And so the next time you're watching television or reading the newspaper and you see whatever corrupt authoritarian firing on the anti-democracy protesters to ask some questions. Ask the question of where did those weapons come from? What was the supply chain that brought those weapons? Who trains on those weapons? Who maintains those weapons? And most importantly for this room, what does the financing for those weapons look like? And that's true whether we're talking about a large military like Russia attacking the democracy of Ukraine. That's true whether we're talking about Iran firing on brave women protesters in Iran, whether it's the Bahraini government firing on its Shia minority there, whether it's Libyan warlord General Heftar firing on the other Libyan people there to maintain his control of the country using mercenaries. And the reason I ask that is a multifold. One is the role that the arms trade plays and hard security plays in the illicit financial flows we're talking about today. In many countries, it is not uncommon to see the military budget be 10, 20, 30% of the budget, and by law, minimal to no oversight allowed. Often there is no auditing allowed. Parliament is not allowed to ask questions you have 20 to 30% of the budget. No one's allowed to look at it. It's completely secret. You can guess what's going to happen. We know well in this room what's going to happen. 
So one is that particular role, the specific illicit finance. And it's not surprising we talk about Nigeria with Sani Abacha. We talk about Jane Kazuma in South Africa, the role that the arms trade played in enabling their kleptocracy and their just incredible amount of illicit financial flows. But secondly is the role that weapons play in maintaining that authoritarian corrupt regime. As we see in Iran today, as we saw in Belarus a year ago, in the end state, when the protesters don't want the corrupt authoritarian leader there, it's about using violence against those protesters. Or if we look at it from a state perspective, when Putin doesn't want a democracy next door, he uses his weapons and his military forces. Thinking ahead on great power politics to Taiwan, when you have a successful democracy that gives Xi Jinping a model of what a democratic Chinese system looks like, just as a democratic Ukraine is very threatening to the Putin regime, a democratic, robust Taiwan is very threatening to the Xi Jinping regime. And think about where those weapons and where the financing and the training and so forth go for. And then if you're, particularly if it's Western weapons, ask how did they get there? What is missing in my legislation and regulations that got those there? Let me just follow up on that because I think you're touching on a point. So your answer suggests that people in Washington or London or other state or other international capitals, you know, they should be all over this agenda, uh, the fighting corruption agenda, the exposing financial secrecy agenda, because that's going to hopefully make the world a safer place and make sure there are less weapons in the hands of some of these bad guys. So what is your sense right now of how uh, receptive policymakers are to this kind of argument? We've seen some improvements. It feels a little bit like the larger financial issues in this room, which is there have been some marginal improvements, but not the larger systemic ones that will make the great difference. Uh, I'll speak specifically for the United States, of course. Um, the United States has probably the best legislation and regulation when it comes to the arms trade. And yet, as Transparency International Defense and Security, especially Colby Goodman, if you have not pulled Colby Goodman's reports by TIDS on how the arms trade works, both the service side, things like private military contractors and the loopholes there and in the arms trade, and see just how wide those loopholes are and realize it only gets worse from there for 194 other countries around the world, um, that will tell you a lot. But there's a strong, this is one of those situations where the state has to step in where business won't. As a good capitalist, you know, business job is to make a profit. And if you're in the arms trade, you can be the most ethical arms trade if you want. I know some people, it's an oxymoron, but anyway. You can be the most ethical you want, but the reality is in the end of the day, you want to make a profit. And making a profit is about selling weapons or selling services. And you're going to do that, just like the tax avoidance gentleman who talked earlier and so forth, same sort of same sort of uh, incentives. And so this is where states have to come in and say, yeah, I know that selling uh, AR-15s, which is the civilian version of the M16, is, is very profitable to you. But guess what? You're not going to make a profit on that because it gets people killed, including our own American citizens. Right. So you're just not going to be allowed to do it. Let me just put, press on one other issue concerning the United States and specifically the Biden administration. So, of all the issues involved with democracy writ large, I, I would think that in terms of actually on paper, they've sort of put forward a, a strategy around fighting corruption. Is that, a, is that strategy from what you've seen, a significant strategy? Is it, would it move the ball or is it, is it a good strategy but not being implemented? What's your sense of uh, the Biden administration's anti-corruption strategy? Uh, again, uh, I'm a retired Air Force officer, and, and one of the formative events in my military career was 9-11, of course. I was a captain at the time. And it was all a blur of trying to get you know, personnel and stuff like that overseas quickly, realizing that the Air Force had absolutely zero Pashtun and Dari linguist, for example, at the time, and so forth. Um, but I watched how quickly the regulations changed to meet the needs with the Patriot Act and so forth. And so while I've seen some changes on the margins, we have not seen the kinds of systemic change and the kinds of going up against the very strong vested interest that we saw in the few months after 9-11. The Enablers Act is an amazing piece of legislation and it is 
somewhat of a victory that it actually was put forward in Congress. But really, should that be considered? Is that our bar of victory? The Patriot Act passed by November 2001, and that was a much bigger systemic change that we're still relying on with Ukraine. And yet, the Enablers Act, a similar level of legislation in the United States, couldn't go forward. Um, the emergency, we talked about real estate, the emergency um, exemption that's been there for whatever, 20 whatever years, that came in after 9-11 didn't suddenly get lifted, even though we recognize the role that real estate has played in Russian oligarchs and their ability to maintain the war against Ukraine. Right. And so, yes and no. Ian, did you have a comment? Yeah, just on the strategy. I yeah. think it's groundbreaking that, and also sad that for the first time ever, the U.S. has an anti-corruption strategy. An anti right, right, strategy. Right. Um, a whole of government anti-corruption strategy that in theory elevates the fight against corruption as a national security priority. But when push comes to shove, anti-corruption loses every single time when it's up against another national security priority. And so when you're looking at things like geopolitical competition with China or trying to respond to the energy security pressures that the world has been facing uh, since Russia's invasion of Ukraine, anti-corruption always falls by the wayside uh, in favor of quote unquote more urgent and short term priorities. And I think we need, uh, in terms of, uh, say, competition with China, we really need a longer term and values driven approach. So if you're engaging with the government of Equatorial Guinea, which is you know, symbolic of dictatorship, kleptocracy, um, stealing energy resources from people, the US should not be sending political signals that all of that is OK just because the ruler of that country is enticing a Chinese military base. So we have to look at those kinds of trade-offs that are happening all the time. Right, well, sadly, that's probably true of the other pieces of the democracy agenda, too, including you know, human rights. Um, let me ask Elise a question, um, and I would love it to get everyone's take on this. Uh, in terms of advocating on the Hill right now in the current climate, do you have a thought about like what the best way to, to make the case for some of the kinds of initiatives that you are pushing, uh, you know, what, what, what resonates in the current uh, Congress? Because I think, you know, while like at Freedom House and a lot of people in this room, I suspect, you know, we have a more values, you know, oriented democracy, pro-democracy kind of strategy. That might fall in deaf ears sometimes on the Hill now, where the more realist uh, approach might, you know, be, be positive. I'm just kind of curious how you think sure. about talking, talking on the Hill right now. Well, the good news is that the people in this room and many other people have spent years building this as a bipartisan issue. Uh, there really are people on both sides of the aisle that are worried about illicit finance. Uh, one of the reasons is that Russia and China, which is a concern on both sides of the aisle, engage in a lot of illicit finance. Uh, and they are uh, making their money off the Western financial system. So I think the most important thing to do on the Hill right now is to keep it as a bipartisan issue. Sacrifice what you need to to keep it bipartisan. You can still get a lot done. And to spend the time with Republican offices uh, to convince them that this is something that's worth their, their time, worth their, the work. The fact that we get these things into the NDAA, these days there's only really two kinds of legislation get through the NDAA, appropriations, and then of course there's always something else, you know, infrastructure, whatever. But you have to think about these uh, issues in that context. And we have started this tradition over the last you know, few years of including an anti-money laundering part in the National Defense Authorization Act. So I think that that's something to think about, that it's not just the financial committees, not just foreign affairs, it's also national security concern. Gary, what, what are your thoughts about this in terms of the case to Congress? Yeah, so just building on what Elise says, I think uh, one of the things that this uh, coalition has done well that has had, I think, payoff um, has been, you know, most people try and start by getting bipartisan support and convincing individual legislators and getting a Republican and Democrat to sign a bill and introduce it. And while we've done that, the focus has actually been on constituency groups. That is, there's not a lot of groups. When we were passing, working on the Corporate Transparency Act, for, uh, for example, it was at 
part of the fight was at the height of the Black Lives Matter sort of controversies and you know uh, protests and all of that. We managed to get um, civil rights organizations to sign on to this, you know, essentially the same legislation um, as the Fraternal Order of Police. They weren't sitting in a lot of rooms together at the time. Uh, Dow Chemical and Friends of the Earth on the same letter. Uh, the banks, uh, some of the big banks uh, in support of this for various reasons to help them with their compliance, um, but also a number of the consumer groups like Public Citizen. And so looking at some of the constituency groups that then the legislators look at and go, oh, this is safe for me to go, to the, go into the water, or I have to be in there because I want the local sheriff to endorse me when I run for re-election. And so I think the focus on those constituency groups has helped us to ground this, not as a, oh, we, had, we found one legislator who might retire and then we're done because we don't have somebody else to replace him or her, but in fact have grounded it in a bipartisan set of constituency groups that hopefully will allow us to get some things passed in the future as well. Let me, uh, let me just throw another issue on the table, uh, picking up on the discussion about the Enablers Act. So, like, I've been a, before I was at Freedom House, I was a reporter for a long time, and like, when you're in Washington, you just realize the extent to which, you know, law firms and uh, public accounting firms and uh, PR firms and comms firms, uh, they're all kind of in bed, like, with the bad guys, right? And I wouldn't say all of them, but there's a healthy chunk that are. And uh, really a question for each of you, has there been any progress over the last 10 to 15 years in really making that not something that people should do? Or is there just too much money involved in representing the Emiratis or the Saudis or the other groups that's just a hopeless Sisyphean task? I'm really curious, anyone wanna tackle that issue? Well, I'm sorry to say I haven't seen much progress. Um, Back in 2016, I think it was, uh, Global Witness did this sting where they went to uh, over a dozen different law firms uh, and they had somebody who pretended they were representing a corrupt African dictator who wanted to invest in the United States. And 12 out of the 13 uh, law firms they talked to said, well, let's talk to you about that. Let's talk about uh, structuring and let's talk about uh, shell entities, et cetera. Only one lawyer said, I don't do that, get out of my office. Only one, and so one out of 13, are we still at that percentage today? I haven't seen a lot of evidence to the contrary. The ABA is still one of the main opponents uh, of a lot the, of this legislation. And what's, their, what's, their, uh, what's their case, what's the ABA's case? You'll have to ask them. Okay. <laughs> I, just, to, just to pick up on the ABA thing, and uh, so I agree with Elise that we, have a, we still have a long ways to go. I would say that um, there's a lot more awareness and there, there has been some progress, although it's slow, um, in that, for example, the National Association of Realtors, so the real estate industry is divided loosely into two. There's the commercial and the residential side. The residential folks, which is largely the National Association of Realtors and the larger of the two associations, has actually not knee-jerk opposed regulations on the real estate industry. They're protective of their members, so I don't want to give them too much credit, but it is, it is an opening that we have been able to work with them um, over the last seven or eight years. I will say... And I also have to say, within the ABA, there are lawyers that we have sorry. contacted that have opposed certain other lawyers. So the human rights lawyers, the anti-corruption lawyers, have a conversation going on with the real estate lawyers and the estate and trust lawyers. But... The let good me, guys have well, not Let won. me just, I, I just have to, if, if folks haven't seen this because it just happened either yesterday or Monday, um, that the American Bar Association had its February meetings and they passed a resolution, a new resolution that they adopted on beneficial ownership. Really? The law has been in place now, or had passed two, three years ago, and the Bar Association has suddenly decided that for the first time ever, they are going to say that collecting and reporting beneficial ownership information to a government agency is okay. That's about as far as they went. Lawyers should not be held accountable, and but there's a million a caveats. Forward, but yes, it is. So are we beginning to make progress? It is slow. But I do think that we are starting to see some incremental movement from certain corners that hopefully we can exploit into the future 
to make some additional progress. So just to, I, I, it just happened, so I thought I'd do it. Do you want to weigh in on this yeah. issue? Sure, I'll, I'll talk to it from the, the DOD perspective. Um, I remember when I signed my ethics forms when I retired from the military and realized that while there are some requirements on it, you could drive a Mack truck through it. And basically, it would have been Im impossible for me to violate those ethics rules because I wasn't what's called a COTAR contracting, uh, relevant contracting officer. I could do almost anything I wanted. Um, as Paul Massaro pointed out today, trying to get DOD senior leaders to no longer be able to work for foreign governments, particularly those against US interest or autocracies or corruption, um, will be tough. I do think, speaking of the constituencies, one area potentially to work with are those lower level officer or lower level soldiers and so forth who've left and their families. Um, the demographic that most of your soldiers come from, and your airmen, sailors, et cetera, is that same demographic that were talked about in the prior panels, the same demographics that um, come from mostly rural areas where incomes have staggered and so forth. Being able to go into the military is a big step up in life and the way ahead and the way to go to college, et cetera, et cetera. These are the individuals who have missed four, five, six Christmases away from home and who felt the fall of Kabul and the mission failure in Iraq very personally because they'd been there or were wounded or otherwise. Um, I also see it in comedy and humor. Um, there's a very politically incorrect blog called the Duffel Blog. Um, and it has excoriated senior officers every time they jump onto the board of directors of something or how much of the Taliban was funded by US gear that fell off the quote unquote back of a truck. Um, they are probably one of the best educational systems for how to understand the role that corruption plays in undermining our own military and our own missions and our own national security and democracy, I think, than anything as a professor I could ever do flat out. If I could also offer Please. just one note of hope. Uh, I, ha I helped Staff Center Levin on his first anti-money laundering hearing, which Raymond was uh, one of our witnesses, and that's when we met. That was in 1999. Back then, uh, banks were taking in duffel bags full of cash in the United States, in Washington, in our nation's capital. Uh, there were just a whole range of their bankers, private bankers, were actively helping their clients hide their money. That isn't true today. It's 23 years later, okay, it took a while, but the banks now have to hide that. If they want to do it, they have to hide it, and many banks don't do it anymore. Uh, there has been a significant change within the banking community in terms of acceptance of their anti-money laundering responsibilities and a willingness to actually take action and invest to do that work. Now, do we have miles to go? Of course. But I, I just want to let you know that in the 23 years, I've seen a, a significant change, and so I believe that we can continue to make progress. Right, I just want to give Ian a chance. Do you want to say something on this subject before we move on about enablers? Uh, no. That's okay. Fine. By the way, I think we're sort of running. Charles, how much more time do we have? Uh, does anyone have any questions? I'm right, I'm enjoying the show. What, let's see, how much, to, what time is it? We have seven minutes. Does anyone have a question that they want to ask? I have one more question, but uh, in the back of the room, and I know that Raymond wanted to make a comment. We have seven minutes. Go ahead, sir. Project. I had a question. Why is it that we instantly uh, grasp towards a, a congressional solution? Why don't we use IEPA or something like that? I mean, we do it for sanctions. Why don't we say that it's a national security threat for banks to take money from uh, from from anonymous corporations. And I say in the background, I, I spend more time than I'd like to admit on, in the company registry uh, uh, in Russia. And it's a thousand times more transparent than the best one in the US. But it's not an elixir for there are, our problems. The problems are the lack of regulations, which are, I mean, that is, after all, the draw of our economic system is the transparency. Right. And the lack of it is a security threat. I don't. So I don't really think anyone's ever argued against me on that. Yeah, so non-governmental responses, maybe. Is that what you're yeah. Any, anyone want to tackle that? Well, I'll mention the Global Magnitsky Act is one of the things that we've been using to go after corrupt people. There's been an increasing usage of you know, denying visas to people to come to the United States, which a lot of rich uh, corrupt people want to do. But you're right. I'm sure that there is more that we could think about. I'm not an expert in that area. 
But I think that's a great thought to try to look at those laws and see how we could use them in a more creative way. Right. And there's also an international network of those kinds of laws of imposing sanctions, and perhaps we could use that more as well. Go ahead, Gary. Just uh, two quick things. Um, I do think that uh, we are trying, or, and if this wasn't clear before, I, I do think we are trying to say what are existing authorities that we could use um, to get at this problem. And so some of the things that you've heard, we, we did have to pass the Corporate Transparency Act, but now it's about the regulations. And then we talk about the Enablers Act, but there are, as I said before, a number of enablers that are already covered under existing law, and so moving the administration to do this and I realized they didn't actually answer your question earlier, <laughs> which was, what is it exactly that we want them to do? Yeah. Um, and so this would be an example of something that the administration can do without having to go through Congress to get the lawyers and the investment bankers to, um, or the investment advisors, uh, to have what we call due diligence requirements. And by that, what we mean is there's, to basically, right, there's two aspects to uh, customer due diligence. One is, are you the person that you say you are? Like, do I run the company, right? But that's not the whole story, right? If Vladimir Putin walks in and with a passport and goes, hey, I, I'm Vladimir Putin, that's fine. You're, that's great. Well, it's also the second question is, are you somebody we should be doing business with? And that's what we want the investment advisors and the real estate folks to do is to look into, you know, who is this person? Are they on a sanctions list? Are they, you know, is their money coming from legitimate means? Um, those sorts of questions that they then document. It's very much what the banks do under their full uh, due diligence requirements. We want to extend those to the other gatekeepers um, in the financial system. Okay. Ian, you had a point. You well, to make. I was just going to mention that if you've done something useful that has an impact in the U.S., uh, a primary indication of that is that you will be sued. And um, so one of the things I think we need to discuss as a community is having um, a strategy around litigation and defense of our wins because we're often scrambling to do that. The uh, Corporate Transparency Act, there's already a lawsuit facing it. Um, Section who's 15. The, who's the lawsuit against? It is uh, National Small Business Association. Yeah. They, they filed it. Yeah, yeah, yeah they filed it. Um, but I think the bigger point is if whether it's a, con you know, we get something passed through Congress or an agency uses existing authority. Um, you know, there's a whole um, array of potential litigants and people with deep pockets who can pay for that litigation. So as a community, we need to think through not only winning, uh, getting a strong regulation out, but how we defend it in the courts, and that's just the reality in the U.S. Okay, we do, okay go ahead, quickly. I'm just going to mention one other thing that is a possibility for the future that we should think about. The U.K. has now started a real estate registry for offshore owners of property. Just went active January 31st, so it's brand new. Uh, they have 32,000 offshore entities that have uh, signed up. 13,000 of them haven't actually said who their beneficial owners are, but they are already scrubbing that thing. They've found criminals, they've found uh, all kinds of patterns, uh, and it's another thing we should think about. We ought to know who owns the ground under our feet, and a lot of times that is an offshore entity with not a U.S. entity, a foreign entity, and we don't know who's behind it. So real estate registries is another tool we could try to use. Okay, we're just about out of time. Raymond, you asked for uh, the floor. I'm going to give it to you for one minute. Thank you. I want to single out uh, the single greatest accomplishment of Elise Bean. Um, when the Patriot Act uh, was uh, being considered in uh, October and November 2001, um, the, uh, the, the money laundering provision, which was in the Patriot Act, succeeded in taking shell banks off the table. Shell banks were just like shell corporations, banks that could operate without anyone knowing uh, who owned them. The Patriot Act contains a provision that says no U.S. corporation can receive, no U.S. financial institution can receive money from a shell bank. It goes on to say, no U.S. financial institution, no foreign financial institution can send money to the United States that it has received from a shell bank. With this 
clear-cut provision, and it made it clear that this even refers to wire transfers that might touch a correspondent bank account in New York for a split second before fl flitting off somewhere else. With this very clear-cut prohibition, shell banks, which had existed in the thousands, were wiped out just like that, gone. You can do the same thing with shell corporations if you want to. Elise Bean is responsible for this. She will deflect responsibility to her boss, Carl Levin. Don't buy it for a minute. She put it in there. Join me, please, in a rousing hand of applause. The fingerprints of endemic corruption are not all over the crime scene. It would be a mistake to single out corruption as the main cause of democratic decline and breakdown everywhere, but it is usually a contributing factor and it is often the main factor. <clears throat> People lose faith in democracy when they see their parties and politicians serving their own interests rather than the country's. They get angry and rightfully so when the country's economic health is mortgaged in a kleptocratic frenzy to extract as much wealth as possible, as quickly as possible, for the governing elite. And when the country's sovereignty and long-term fiscal health are mortgaged in secret and highly unfavorable deals with Chinese companies or government officials. When there is no transparency, very bad things happen. Countries are sold out and ruined. Inequality intensifies to grotesque levels. Democracies wither and, and die. But it is not only the looted countries that suffer. This is one of the most important points that Raymond Baker makes in his brilliant new book, Invisible Trillions. The so-called advanced wealthy democracies, the ones that brag about having transparency, accountability, and a mature rule of law, are also damaged and distorted. The money looted in countries with weak governance does not stay in those benighted countries. It is laundered and recycled through the multi-layered washing machines of the kleptocracy industry in the US, UK, and other parts of Europe. It is, as it is ushered through our banking systems, real estate markets, corporate and philanthropic registries, and so on. This uh, illicit money corrupts our own democratic systems of governance while entrenching broader patterns of financial secrecy and illicit capital flows, which by now amount to literally, uh, in Baker's words, invisible trillions of dollars. In this vast conspiracy, to disguise, deflect, and defraud democracies of rightful tax revenues, the big losers are the ordinary people who are losing faith in both democracy and capitalism. It is, of course, an illusion to think that authoritarianism will provide a better answer. In the absence of democracy, the rule of law is even weaker and transparency shallower. Neither can we blame capitalism as such. After all, private enterprise is the greatest engine of wealth and job creation in human history. But where capitalism is untamed by regulation and monitoring, greed is likely to erode market competition, and too much of the spirit of innovation will be directed to searching for easy rents. Today, those rents are pursued by the complex global industry of lawyers, bankers, consultants, accountants, lobbyists, agents, brokers, and fixers that has arisen for one shared purpose, to help place trillions of dollars of wealth beyond the reach of public accountability, regulation, and taxation. In this process, this global industry is weakening both democracy and capitalism, severely exacerbating inequality, and robbing countries of the tax income they need 
to meet uh, public uh, interests. This ind industry of financial secrecy and greed must be exposed and held accountable with stronger laws and regulatory processes governing corporations, banks, and accounting firms. At the, at the kleptocratic source, we must commit more funding to support independent journalism and investigative reporting through innovative means such as the International Fund for Public Interest Media, as well as civic monitoring and anti-corruption groups. We have reached a critical juncture. Either we renew this precious system of democratic capitalism through fundamental reforms to improve regulation, fairness, justice, and transparency, or the spreading stench of corruption, greed, and insider privilege will gradually consume public faith in our institutions. And this is the final panel of the afternoon, and I must say, I'm amazed at the number of people who are still in the room. So thank you all. <laughs> it's uh, difficult to go through an entire day, even though we've been on schedule, uh, listening to these discussions. But I'd like to begin by asking uh, Damon Wilson, uh, we're going to talk about uh, democracy at risk, and he is uh, uh, the president and CEO of the National Endowment for Democracy. So I'm going to start with you and see what you have to say about it, and then we can pitch in and say all kinds of things. Terrific, then I'll dive in. Charles, thanks for getting all of us together. Thanks for running the show up here today. Um, this is really important, Charles, that you brought together so many people working this from so many angles, because what we've been faced with is a systemic challenge to democracy with piecemeal responses. And part of what I'm excited about coming out of this, this work is how are we thinking about systemic responses to the systemic challenge? So let me just start with a little bit of framing and then we can get into a, a bit of a conversation. We all know from the amazing work of Freedom House that we've been in nearly two, two decades of a democratic recession. But the truth is it's been a little bit different in the past decades, it's been sharper, more of the democratic resurgence as Larry has talked about and it's a resurgence that we've seen with a sharp authoritarian repression at home, producing extraordinary democratic diasporas. But it, it's become more difficult, more dangerous for democracy around the world, because it's also linked with the export, taking the show on the road, the export of the tools, technologies, and techniques of repression of these autocrats in an environment where technology is levered, information is used, and financial networks, kleptocracy, the financial networks allow for a glue to help bind together what Ann Applebaum and others have talked so eloquently about Autocracy Inc. And so you hear today President Biden talking about the big challenge between autocracy and democracy. Many people hear and actually see a competition because of a rise of a, of a PRC that has generated wealth, the idea of authoritarian capitalism versus democratic capitalism. And yet the reality is authoritarian capitalism becomes, it is kleptocracy. And so what we're dealing with is the web of deals that fuel what is behind the scenes of an autocracy inc of autocrats working together, of engaging in the world in which it undermines democracy, helping to cement and solidify and bolster autocratic power around the world while protecting ill-begotten wealth. And this is why this is such a fundamental defining challenge to democracy today in, in our area, in our era. Um, and it is the financial secrecy that is behind all this that enables the obscuring of, of these illicit funds. So this is probably why at the endowment, we're in the midst of a big process right now about how we continue to accelerate our learning from a real regional state-based analysis of problems, a real grounding and grassroots activity that are authentic to countries that are you know, investigative journalists doing remarkable work, but begin to think about what this means in a more systemic cross-cutting way across countries and across regions. Again, how do we harness our power 
for systemic responses to the challenge. Um, and so this is where we've got to marry what Larry was just talking about, some of the extraordinary grassroots organizing, individual investigative journalists that are doing work by embedding this in a broader response. And I think about it in a couple of ways. You know, we have amazing investigative journalists in Ecuador who do research behind what's led to big corrupt deals in their country. And yet each time they're doing it, they bump into China. But they don't actually know much about how China operates in, in the world and how, um, uh, how its engagement is really undermining democracy in their own area. So part of what we're trying to do is how do we foster defeating a network with a network, which is why conversations like this are so important to connect these dots. So maybe I'll stop with this with just a sense of beginning with getting democracies working together to close off kleptocratic access to our own financial system, something that I think the administration spotlight, the congressional action, this effort has been really important for. How we continue to adapt our own approach as we see the kleptocrats adapt, evading sanctions, moving financial centers to UAE or other places. How we invest in that exposure, the, the core hard work of investigative journalists, um, protection for whistleblowers, the legal defense funds to support people and enhance security measures for people doing this work, and then embed it in an intentional effort of collaboration across countries, across disciplines, across regions, so that we build the more sophisticated network to respond in a way that can defeat the sophistication of the network we're dealing with. So I'll, I'll stop with that as a, as a kickoff to framing. David, do you have some things to add, I'm sure? Well, Jack, I did speak earlier this morning on a panel, and I said to Charles, I don't think I have enough interesting things to say once, let alone twice. But, um, and I should warn you, I'm sitting in a comfortable chair. It's warm in here. It's the end of the day. So if I bore not just all of you, but myself and fall asleep, just make sure I catch my flight. Um, <laughs> I, I, maybe I'll just pick up on a few things that came up during the, the day in the conversation. Um, one is uh, someone said that the oligarchs in Russia have been subordinated to the, to the state. Um, I think that's right, but I actually would frame it differently. I would argue they have been subordinated to an individual. Um, and that individual, I don't think, is necessarily the same as at least what we would consider a normal state. In Russia, that may be the case, which is the state and Putin are more or less the same. But I would argue, actually, there is a difference between these kind of corrupt authoritarian leaders and what is ordinarily in a country's national interest. It's not in Russia's national interest to invade a neighboring state and alienate the population in those countries, but it's in Putin's interest to do so. So I actually do think it is important to differentiate between the oligarchs being uh, subordinated to state. Some of the oligarchs that were mentioned, Berezovsky and Businski, were in very good standing with Boris Yeltsin. But after Yeltsin left and Putin came in, one of the first things Putin did was to take their TV stations away from them and then throw Businski in jail. Um, Berezovsky, of course, left and, and, as was said earlier, died under mysterious circumstances. Um, so, so I do think it is important to underscore the role played by these leaders who are running this kleptocratic system. Um, and that isn't necessarily in the interest of, of the country or of a normally functioning state. Um, uh, Rachel was kind enough to actually listen to something I said earlier uh, when I said the more corrupt uh, Russia becomes, the more authoritarian it becomes. And let me just elaborate on that for a second. Um, the more corrupt it comes, the richer it becomes, and the less it can afford to lose power. And so uh, the more corrupt it becomes, the more it will crack down on any perceived threats to that grip on power. And once it runs out of uh, domestic enemies or perceived enemies, it's likely to project on, onto others. And it's the old expression that the way uh, regime treats its own people is often indicative of how it will behave in foreign policy and how it will treat others. And if Putin doesn't respect the human rights of Russian citizens, he certainly isn't going to protect, uh, care about the human rights of Ukrainians or Belarusians or anyone else for that matter. 
Um, so th this is why I think that, that this point is important to understand that this corruption does, as you were just saying, David, the, the connection between the two is, is vital and it is threatening, not just from a corruption perspective, but from a forced projection perspective as well. It doesn't happen with every corrupt authoritarian regime, but for those who can't, I'll give you one quick example that you wouldn't necessarily think of Belarus, which is run by a thoroughly corrupt authoritarian leader, Alexander Lukashenko, um, who when I was, we actually were in the government together, we sanctioned the regime of Lukashenko um, and forced at least the release of political prisoners. Um, Lukashenko's problems don't stay inside Belarus. We saw this with the hijacking of the Ryanair flight going from Athens to Vilnius that, that could have killed 130, I think, some odd people on board if the pilots didn't uh, land it. Uh, we saw it with the weaponization of migrants by Lukashenko from Asia and the Middle East. So if you think that these problems are over there, none of our business don't affect us, think again. Um, the, the debate Paul Massaro and I had well, it wasn't a debate, but uh, the disagreement we had over um, destruction uh, versus exploitation. I, here again, I, I would differentiate. I think Putin sure would love to destroy us uh, because he feels he doesn't have to uh, necessarily use our system for safekeeping since he's the one in charge and can decide whether to confiscate or not. He's less interested in it. But I think the oligarchs don't want to destroy our system. They want to enjoy it. They want to exploit it. Uh, as someone else said, they want to send their family here, they want to send their kids here to study. Um, and so I, I think there is a, a, a difference. The last thing is um, sanctuaries. What do I mean by this? I think we have to be, we, we really need to be more careful in not telling our enemies, let's say Russia, for example, what we won't do. Um, and that's true whether in a military sense where we publicly say the Ukrainians are not allowed to attack Russian forces if those Russian forces are on Russian soil, even if they attack Ukraine. Self-defense, in my view, Ukraine should have the right to attack those Russian forces if those forces are attacking Ukraine. Similarly, we shouldn't let the Russians or oligarchs or anyone else know that there are exceptions in real estate or in other kinds of business activity. We are giving them sanctuary, which means we are letting them off the hook and we're telegraphing to them what we won't do. And generally, that's not a smart way to pursue policy. No, I'm sure that. Finish to end, perhaps. Sure. Well, I'll start with good news, which is since you made it to the end of the day, David and Damon promised me they would lead us in an interactive jig. So if anyone <laughs> wants to get up and move around. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I think. All three of us and our organizations do so much work with civil so society and human rights defenders on democracy issues. You could probably shuffle our note cards and hear a lot of the same things, but there are a few things I'd really emphasize. I think one, the name of this panel, you know, I know we, we all love a, a good title, Democracy at Risk. I, I don't think that's actually an overstatement in this case. The linkages that we see, the correlations that we see between a decline in democracy and corruption and financial issues. Uh, there's, uh, as, as you see, low political rights and civil liberties, Transparency International tracks high perceptions of corruption. I would direct you to page 73 of this excellent book. Thank you, Raymond Baker, for uh, doing a little show and tell for me, where there's decline in democracy, you see rising income inequality, we know the linkages between human rights abuses and corruption. Um, so there's just so much overlap. And I know that I am in a room of researchers and I have a lot of research colleagues who get nervous when I start using anecdotes, but I come from the Hill where all you need is a single anecdote and you're off to the races with a new piece of legislation. So I would just say uh, I've been at Freedom House for almost a decade now and the human rights defenders and civil society folks I meet with I would say a good two thirds, if not more, have interacted in their efforts to strengthen democracy in their own countries. They're encountering corruption in one way or another, whether they are journalists who are reporting on corruption, whether they are environmental activists who are seeing companies come in and you know just really pillage the earth. Uh, many of those companies are 
uh, semi-state companies with authoritarian regimes or are you know doing business with authoritarian regimes. Uh, and so I think the policy panel we heard previously was great. This is a key moment where we really have to get to work tackling some of this and in the US really address the enabling role that we play. One of the things that I would ask you all about is the effort to recover money that these characters who are kleptocrats have stolen after they leave office. And uh, the track record on this has not been terrific. Uh, we hear of things like Sonny Abacha, $6 billion stolen, a billion recovered. And everybody cheers saying, wow, look at what we did. Uh, there are provisions written into various international agreements that now say we should focus on asset recovery. But it seems to be a very specialized field that have some very specialized, very high price lawyers and not getting the results that we'd like to see. And what do you have any thoughts about what we can do to enhance the effort to recover uh, some of those monies so that you know you can't steal a country blind and then ride off into the sunset and live well examples uh, marcos mobutu uh you know just to name a few how about luanda uh the luanda papers and the family you know santa de santos uh you know almost incomprehensible amounts of money stolen and yes, some has been recovered, some has been frozen, but in the main, it's a pretty clean getaway. I'd like to have their 401k. Well, I'll, I'll try. Actually, let me, um, if I can, Jack, also just mention at the Bush Institute, um, Jessica Ludwig and Albert Torres, who are here, um, are leading a new initiative for us and, and really please, and, and Jessica produced this new policy brief uh, that we have on our website about countering corruption and kleptocracy, which doesn't fully answer your question. But let me put it in context, um, because part of that challenge is complicated when we have a leader whom we want out of power. Yes. And so there are policy considerations that are weighed. How quickly can we get X leader out of power and, and inducing, usually it's a him, uh, to leave, we allow them to take what they've stolen. Um, should... David go Duvalier got us to fly his toys and C-130s from Haiti to France. Exactly. Uh, kind of embarrassing. Uh, I mean, Marcos is another one yeah. that, that you mentioned. A uh, lot of shoes in there. It, that exactly. Was... Shah, I mean, <laughs> I mean, Shah, we weren't inducing. He, yeah. He had to... And on it goes. Yes, it does. So, so I think, I think it is do we stop making those trade-offs? That's hard to do in the policy world uh, when, when you're trying to stop other problems. So it's a matter of, of weighing which one. But if it is somebody who is voted out or is removed from a popular movement, it seems to me those are assets we should go after. Uh, okay. Jack, I might just add to it and maybe even turn the question back to you because you've got something to offer on this. and. Um, I'm not an expert enough on the on the details, but maybe just three quick points. One, um, we're in a paradigm shift of thinking about what's possible, particularly in this field. In fact, after the invasion of Ukraine, we had a, a town hall at the endowment to talk about everything we've been working on that's been hard, where you didn't think progress was possible. Let's reconsider, take a look at it, because we saw how the impact of the Russia of Putin's invasion of Ukraine changed the parameters in which politicians, the public, legislators are willing to think about issues. And so use the recovery of Russian assets to fund Ukrainian reconstruction. We've only frozen, we haven't followed this through. So we're in a paradigm changing moment. And if we can follow through on that, it can help set the scene further for what you're talking about. Let's see it through in Ukraine is a paradigm changing moment on how we recover assets from Russia that can be used to rebuild Ukraine. Second, over time, if democracies start to think about democracy as strategy, rather than democracy as the thing they put over here in DRL or something, but as a, as a North Star to how to develop 
strategy among democracies that it's fundamental to the national security of democracies that they have strategy that is about the bolstering support for democracy around the world, which is giving life to real national security backup and teeth behind what kleptocracy, countering the kleptocracy strat policy should look like. It can open the door to more serious efforts to take this forward on asset recovery in specific instances going forward. And third, let's not rely on governments. It is the ingenuity of extraordinary digital forensics researchers that have revealed so much. And so how can we continue to empower independent actors, journalists, civil society with new tools of learning from, um, uh, with new tools of learning in a way that we can force this issue. They can force this issue by being able to actually more systematically track those resources in a way that is accessible to the public and not subject to the decision or a whim of a policy decision about how to paper over something else. How can we empower independent actors to force some of this? So those are some thoughts to put on the table, but I'd turn it back to you where you have some expertise in this. Uh, I don't have full answers to these questions. I'd love to have more. I've been through a few, a few rounds of trying to set up uh, independent asset recovery operations, uh, trying to get an international group to work on the problem because it requires expertise, real expertise, and it requires a lot of money. And of course, uh, we quickly discovered the World Bank wouldn't finance those efforts. Uh, and that governments once in power, the succeeding government once in power for a while, begins to like the idea that the assets haven't been recovered. Because a new guy says, ah, my chance to steal. And that's why the recovery and, and putting in motion something that recovers the money is so important, I think. Now, if I may, I'd like to shift the subject. Sorry, can I just yeah. add one quick thing? I apologize. Um, in picking up on bo what both of you are saying, th there is, you hear these arguments, particularly when it comes to the hard currency reserves of Russia, the argument against moving from freezing to seizing, that if we do that, the Chinese will pull their money out. My response is the Chinese invade Taiwan, I'd seize their assets too. Yeah. Otherwise, we essentially are telling the Russians, the Chinese or any other government, you are free to invade country X or do Y human rights abuses. Um, as long as you've got billions or more in, your, in, in the United States. Um, so we're basically saying we'd rather keep this kind of money that could become bloodstained um, and instead of doing the right thing. You hear this much less on individual assets, um, but you got to remember that these assets, uh, particularly on the individual scale, but even on the other, are, are polluting our system, uh, are corrupting our markets and are driving up prices in real estate. I mean, I used to live in Miami. Um, Sunny Isles is a perfect example of this. Good luck um, exactly, yes. exactly. That's where the I think price it, goes up and up. Yep. And that's where I think it really does go back to your earlier point about political will. Some of this is a political will issue. You know, we understand the legal constraints in the U.S. with seizing the assets, but where we do have the interest and desire and will to do so, we should. And there's so much overlap also with sanctions. And the big debate, those of you who work on sanctions will know, do we also impose sanctions on family members if we know that these folks are hiding money in the accounts of family members? And so I think we have to, you know, they're serious about what they're doing. We have to get serious about what we're doing. So now I'd like to turn the discussion to a different threat to democracy, which is dark money in political campaigns. We've been through a, a situation where the U.S. Supreme Court as an effect said, a corporation as a citizen can contribute what it wants to, uh, and on we go. And uh, this business of dark money has now taken over an awful lot of the American political system. Uh, what do we do? Is this the kind of threat that I personally think it is? Uh, my own experience on Capitol Hill tells me that when congressmen are elected, they're sent off to uh, the National Committee headquarters on both sides of the aisle, uh, given a list of donors to call and have to dial for dollars three hours every day. Uh, we also know that uh, 
there are certain cherished committee assignments. So there's a big scramble. Who gets to be on the Ways and Means Committee? Why? Because it's the best committee to raise money on. And uh, then the question we had earlier today is to why, for example, we can't repeal simple things like carried interest. And the answer, of course, is that uh, people have bid to get on the Ways and Means Committee. And in the process of doing that, they pledge to give some of the money they can raise with their seats back to the party. Uh, and a lot of the money that winds up going to them is absolute dark money. Nobody knows where it came from. Uh, it, it might as well be coming out of the great void. So what do we do about all this? And how do we solve that campaign finance problem? And I worked on it for a long time. And I'll just add one thing about the, the problem, which is that we look to the people who are at the root of the problem to be the ones to solve the problem. So Congress gets to decide what the uh, transparency of their funding is uh, based on their needs, as opposed to us stepping in and doing something to say, we better damn well find out who's giving you money. Well, listen, I sat on the Hill for eight years and I think campaign finance is a big issue, but I would say, it's not so much that you have members of Congress, for the most part, knowingly taking funding from uh, a nefarious foreign government, right? The real risk and threat, I think, comes in these groups that have one or two or three layers of cover lobbying on behalf of a foreign government, but without the a very clear linkage if you're a busy 23-year-old staffer and you're supposed to tell your boss what to do and you don't know any better. Some of you will remember a few years ago, there was a bipartisan delegation that went to Azerbaijan, and it turned out that the organization that had financed that did have links to the government. Staff and members had tried to do due diligence uh, and get ethics clearance. There was also some funny business going on where folks accepted beautiful oriental rugs and the gift limit is $50, so we'll just set that aside. But I think this is the issue we see over and over again with education associations and linkages to the CCP or um, you know many of these Middle Eastern countries. And so it's probably directly you know in, to your question about campaign finance, I'd imagine it's the small dollar bundling that's much more of a concern than knowingly taking foreign finance. Thoughts, further thoughts? Well, I, I guess the only thing I would add is um, there is now a matter before the House Ethics Committee that is about as big a softball as one could throw. And were it not for a narrow majority in the House, I would like to think that this case would be handled expeditiously. Um, the member is entitled to due process, of course, but uh, um, it isn't just where did that 700,000 come from? Um, there appear to be some links to a Russian oligarch um, through a cousin, I think it is. So um, if they can't deal with that, then your point about the fox, what's the expression, fox in the hen house or whatever it is, um, is really borne out. You know, um, Jack, I'll, first of all, I'll caveat it with saying, we're the National Endowment for Democracy supporting democracy around the world, not working right. in the United States. But the concept of democracy is that it's hard work. It's not self-executing. It requires civic engagement. And this is kind of what makes it beautiful to be having this debate in our country rather than in an autocracy. And so how does democracy work? You've got to identify problems. You've got to be able to document it. You've got to be able to build coalitions. You've got to be able to have an open debate about it. You've got to be able to push responsive institutions to reform. You've got to build movement behind it. Like it, it doesn't, it's not supposed to just happen. <laughs> And so that's partly how to think about what are the muscle movements of a self-correcting mechanism, which is the essence of the health of a health of a democracy that it doesn't require outsiders to say, this is your problem. It requires us to figure it out. So let me talk about this a little bit more. Uh, one of the things that's happened is the cost of running a congressional campaign has so soared that it reaches numbers that are literally unobtainable 
in the constituency where the congressman is running. The second, the second part of this is that the only way that somebody running can communicate, really, is using advertising means because the constituencies keep growing. And we've had uh, the House is, is set in size by law. So the House could actually increase its membership. And the last time it did that, I think, was 1912. Uh, what would you think of the idea of doubling the size of the House and maybe cutting the staff in half and forcing the members, forcing the members to deal directly with their own constituents? All right, <laughs> former Hill staffer, so I know everybody's looking at me. Um, so, so I worked on the Senate side and the House. I will say the thought of doubling the members in the House um, gives me pause for a variety of reasons. Um, I do think that. There, the current expectation, you know, there are not enough staff uh, for each congressional district. That's just a fact. And understandably, salaries are low. But what that means is you get some of the best folks you'll ever find on the Hill and some of the worst folks you'll ever find on the Hill. And so there needs to be, I think, some sort of right sizing. Um, how do you equip members to have more direct contact with their constituents and um, fund experts? Jury's out, personal opinion on whether I would double the size of the house. Well, it, it uh, was years of trying to figure out how to deal with some of these problems that has led me to propose what are pretty radical ideas, I guess, in the current environment. But uh, we really have to rethink about how does democracy work when the representative gets further and further removed from the constituent simply because the size of his constituency goes up and up and up. And, uh, you know, I, I look at some of uh, the foreign legislatures, which are not terribly democratic, but which proportionately to ours have so many more people. And I wonder, you know, is that a direction to go in? But if not, what other ideas can we have to uh, make the reaction and interaction with constituents uh, more direct, where people can get the feel of what their constituents are going through very directly instead of this kind of uh, performative uh, way of uh, approaching constituents. Um, I, I don't really have a view, Jack, on whether to expand the house or not. I take the point that as districts get larger and larger, um, they become more distant from the voters. Um, I guess what, what I would say is we just have to be mindful that how we conduct ourselves and what we do does not just stay inside this country, let alone mm -hmm. the city. Um, it has global repercussions. And so when we have candidates question the integrity of our elections, we shouldn't be shocked that in Brazil, yeah. they the follow thing, yeah. that example um, or elsewhere. I mean, we, we, in the past, when we were in the government, we would go after leaders who would steal elections and we still will and we still should, but let's not give other countries and other leaders some ammunition in their what aboutism counter arguments when they say, yeah, well, what about what just happened January 6, 2021 in the United States? What about calling the media the enemy of the people? Um, I wish we would be a little more mindful that how we behave and conduct ourselves has serious implications around the world um, and making sure that our leaders are accountable, are subject to election, and are in touch with their constituents is an important part of that. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree with you more on that one. And uh... We certainly have been through a period where we've been setting a rather rude example uh, for the rest of the world, and I hope we're coming back from that uh, and uh, we'll be showing people that we can recover. Uh, I think we, we've uh, taken the conversation up here uh, along the way, but uh, I'm sure there are some questions and, and uh, room for some discussion. So why don't we open it up? Yeah. Uh, 
had um, real interest in the, in the uh, firm Cambridge Analytica, which uh, owned a UK company called SCL. And uh, uh, a, a colleague of mine in Kenya uh, described in great detail how in the 2013 election in Kenya for president and 2017 election, uh, Cambridge Analytica exploited Facebook data profiling uh, to manipulate the elections there. And this is a company that's funded by, you know, a well-known uh, US uh, investor and a, a big contributor to uh, politics here. And I'm wondering what are the sanctions that we should impose uh, to be consistent, to have a, uh, you know, to live up to our democratic values on U.S. Uh, entities that, that do this kind of um, grotesque profiling. It was really quite, uh, quite powerful intervention in Kenya. Also, fir same firm went on to uh, intervene in uh, Trinidad, uh, in, uh, in several other countries in, in Africa. And the intellectual property for uh, Cambridge Analytica has been sold to Eric Prince, um, so it's still uh, an issue. There's a pretty grand tradition of American political consultants uh, after successfully managing a, an American political campaign, uh, going off around the world, uh, consulting for other, other characters who are running for office, good, bad, and indifferent, and for that matter, people who are pro, anti, or otherwise the United States. Is that a business that ought to be regulated? Should we be saying that if you've run a political campaign here uh, for reasons of national interest and security, you should keep your politics inside the United States? I think there's a lot to unpack with that one. So I would say Cambridge Analytica was, um, I think, eye-opening and um, extremely upsetting to anyone who was paying attention. But I think these issues of privacy, you know, there are a number of companies that have access to this information and a number of ways that users continue to be exposed. So one of the things we've talked about at Freedom House is the need for comprehensive privacy legislation. And we are aware of the uphill battle that that would be, but that we think is one of the most effective ways to actually protect American consumers. I think you touch on two more issues that um, I wanted to talk about. One in relation to the, the last point where so much of this problem is about the discourse which re relates to the manipulation of elections, right? Um, in politics, there's a saying, if you're explaining, you're losing. That's a problem. We need to get folks to the point where we can have intelligent conversations. And you know, when you do polling on congressional districts, people generally give high marks to their own congressperson, but very low marks to Congress as a whole. Well, each congressperson arrives in Washington thinking they're helping. And in fact, both sides really skew talking points. And then you add in the manipulation of elections, which you know we've seen around the world. It's not just a US issue. Um, and so I think we have to get serious about addressing some of that. And to your point of um, foreign lobbying and um, the business of, of political campaigns, I do think it's something that we need to seriously look at. Okay. Oh, um, David? I, I, what you added to, to Jim Swank, Jack, I would just say it's important to differentiate between Americans getting involved advising other countries political campaigns electoral campaigns and organizations like the NED NDIIRI Freedom House others who are not going in uninvited but are responding to indigenous interests and having the support and training and knowledge that these organizations can offer um, and so what these organizations do is to try to help interested parties operate in a more democratic fashion. Well, you're you're building the democratic infrastructure. Exactly. You're teaching them how to run a democracy. How to run a, a, a proper campaign, which right. isn't necessarily a victorious campaign, but how to run right. a good campaign, a of decent course. campaign that you can at least look back on and be proud of, how to conduct good elections. For all of the controversy and uh, uh, claims of, of stolen elections, we actually know how to conduct elections really well. Not we, perfect. We do pretty well. We do a sure. damn good job overall. And uh, 
So, so it, they look to us for that kind of expertise and training and advice, which I think is absolutely in, uh, indispensable. For uh, us to point provide. agree, but I'm I'm talking about the guys who, uh, um, like James Carville, who after Jimmy Carter, uh, after uh, uh, we we had Carville no, 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 no. running one or two campaigns, went off around the world selling his services. And uh, you wondered about some of the people who were his customers. Well, he's not the only one, obviously. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm just pulling really him out of the air as, yeah. as one example, yeah. but there, God knows, were plenty of others. And uh, some of them, uh, you know, I'll, I'll just talk personally about my own feelings, but Bannon has been around the world promoting a kind of uh, form of authoritarianism. And uh, boy, oh boy, I don't think that's in our national interest particularly. Uh, so my, my point is, should that kind of activity be in some shape or manner be regulated? Uh, uh, well, look, I, I would just say <laughs> contributions to campaigns here are from foreign sources are illegal. Right. And some countries they're not. And that may be at least one way to start to tackle the issue that you're talking about. I mean, remember in the French uh, presidential campaign a while back, Marine Le Pen openly took, uh, what was it, a $10 million loan um, from Russia right. and was bragging about it. So um, seems untoward to us, but it was legal in France. Sure. Okay, other questions, other points for discussion? Um, hello. Um, thank you, panelists, for a great uh, discussion. My name is Ilya Zaslavsky. I work on Ukraine and other Eastern uh, Europe programs at the Center for International Private Enterprise. My question is on quantifying risks uh, for democracy. Um, so today, a number of uh, numbers were floating around, so about $50, $60 trillion in offshore accounts taken out of democratic capitalism. Uh, but at the same time, say, Russian oligarchic money, it's maybe tens at most hundreds of billions of dollars going into uh, US, UK, making maybe less than even 1% of New York Stock Exchange and GDP. So really a drop in the ocean. Um, at the same time, kleptocrats are very good at keeping silent uh, when necessary and then amplifying them, their message about numbers. Today, someone said that they say, we bring jobs to Dakota uh, with this uh, uh, investment. Uh, and last number which sticks in my mind uh, is that recently it's been said a lot that um, with a 3 to 5% uh, budget of Pentagon, U.S. is now managing to deal with one of the key adversaries through Ukraine, meaning giving money and help to Ukraine. A small fraction works great for democracy in, in, in the war. So my question is... Um, would it make sense, do you think, to quantify risks to say, at the current stage, say $10 billion of more Russian money allowed into this country will result in $20 more billion to, to have to be spent on democracy and, I don't know, $50 more billion to be spent on uh, national security? Would that connect the dots and help the risks or that's not enough? Anybody want to take a crack at that or...? No, <laughs> yeah, to be honest, I don't quite see the through line. So um, interested in how Sype develops the concepts of, the, uh, of this so I, I can see it better. Um, because there's a, there's a generalization there that I'm, does, does this hold? So partly what I've been so bullish about is where we can make sort of positive interventions. This is the constructive capitalism work of Sype or, or the, the corrosive capitalism work of site that's been so crucial in getting private businesses invested in these outcomes. It's the infrastructure of what we can support, what uh, David was saying. Part of this is how, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not here to bleed and to, to, to talk about the domestic side of it. We have to figure out how capitalism and services work. Right. I mean, that's, that's, that's part of generating wealth. That's part of a global economy. That should be a strength that we contribute. We've got to figure out those parameters. But the way that we do it is, as David was saying, the ability for, first of all, what the party institutes and DIRI, 
nonpartisan, open to all, allowing, and I would say more democratic learning. We're actually mm -hmm. not that. We don't really run election. I mean, I wouldn't say we're there to teach people how to run elections. That's not the point, really. It's democratic learning together where increasingly it's actually bringing experts from around the world from democratic partners on right. shared experiences of best practices. It is with a heaping and healthy dose of humility that we're going to be effective in this work. And so that's why, you know, yeah, we, we can talk about the problems we have in the United States. In some respects, I own that because that's the story of what you've got to do the hard work to make democracies work. And it makes us humble in our work with our partners overseas. And without that, we're going to make dumb mistakes. We're going to be, you know, get, mm -hmm. go down difficult paths. So I don't quite see, I just don't quite get it. I don't quite see it yet. So I'm interested in seeing how Sipes work plays this out. I do think is, is as you referred to Annie, backing up the correlation between freedom and prosperity, helping to draw the connection between rule of law being through research demonstrating that rule of law is objectively the factor that leads the most rapid growth and prosperity in open societies. I think backing this up with those case studies does help inform the right sort of policy decisions, does help uh, underpin sort of what is a, a values-based with a, a, uh, the data to, to support it. So interested to see more on that front from you. Yeah, the democratic peace theory. And, uh, yeah, how that helps us. So among other things, what I do is volunteer doing campaign finance reform in Virginia. Uh, for those of you who live in Virginia, please raise your hands. Um, do you realize that we have no campaign finance laws in Virginia? We have no personal use prohibition on campaign finance donations in Virginia. So I can run as a candidate and raise a bunch of money and use that to pay my kids tuition at an expensive school or take a vacation. Virginia is one of only two states that does not have that prohibition. Wow. And um, uh, I was, uh, as a part of this volunteer organization, I've sat and listened to our legislators, you know, um, uh, you know, the bills that we have supported other legislators to bring forward to reform, you know, this system. Um, go before the legislators, uh, and and I've heard uh, delegates from one of, for example, a far we uh, western part of Virginia say things like, "Well, well, you know, citizens shouldn't do donate to campaigns to uh, elect somebody they don't trust." But in Virginia, we just had the most expensive election in the United States ever. And I, my question to all of you particularly those of you who live in Virginia, but to my panelist is, um, and as part of doing this work, we are connected to other, you know, um, states that are trying to bring, you know, um, campaign finance reform in their states in a variety of levels, like public financing of elections, for example, ranked choice voting, for example, um, and, um, and, in, and um, an inordinate amount of time is spent trying to, A, legislate our legislators, but they are just as guilty of being addicted to this money, even more so, I would say, than the federal. So my question to the panelists, you know, as you sit up there and we're having these discussions, these international discussions where we're giving our expertise, one of the things that happened last year was that a bill was passed and the legislator you know, is, a, is a really thoughtful, good guy. But the bill that got passed was to prohibit local organizations to assist with, for example, signing up people for voting. That bill cut out anybody that was like a local NGO that was like just doing voter registration help to to for those who who you know inequality, you know or you know are economically challenged um, or or disability challenged. And so you tried to, of course, regulate this year, and of course couldn't even get past the committee. So my question to the panel is this, is, is we're having these discussions about the international scene, don't we need to start with helping our NGOs and civil activists at home and citizens and ensuring that we really are having fair elections and that we really are addressing the dark money because the dark money is coming into our elections, it's coming into our state elections Everybody I've talked to, which is hundreds of activists and legislators, can see it. And I think we are missing that as a part of this discussion. And if we are going to go and talk to other people how to do their work, 
you know, and how to make their democracy better, shouldn't we start with our own? Well, I'm afraid we're out of time. So let's keep the uh, uh, responses very, very quick and then we'll be wrapped up. Yes. Uh, I mean, like 15 second response. I think that the quick way of uh, solving the Virginia problem is to really focus in on the state legislature and, and really kick them hard. Uh, in uh, Maryland, uh, it's pretty easy to go directly to your state legislate, legislator and have the conversation and really be insistent. And they listen because state legislators are usually pretty close to the constituency and to the ground. So uh, that's a state lobbying question, really. Right. Well, thank, thank you, everyone. So I'm, I'm afraid we're out of time. We said we'd stay on schedule. It's been a it's uh, it's been a long day, and uh, 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 Raymond and I and Jack and Tom, the executive committee, thank you for for joining us. Uh, and this is the first DC forum. Uh, this project will continue, and uh, we'll be, we'll be in touch with a lot of you uh, regarding feedback and stuff. So email us if there are any comments or suggestions you have. And we'll be in touch with uh, many, many of you in the next two months, I'm sure. So thanks so much and uh, onwards. They've turned off my mic, but there's a lot of copies of the book there still. I'm going to grab copies on the way out. <laughs>